Section 13 of The Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 7 Health, Disease, and Sanitation. Part 3 The Plague. The greatest scourge among the epidemics which have devastated the world is the Eastern Bubonic Plague, which entered Europe for the first time in the fourteenth century. All epidemics, when they find a new field, appear to be specially virulent, and this was the case with the first appearance of the plague, which so terrified the inhabitants of Europe that they applied to it this ominous name. But the epidemic of 1349 has of late years received the new name of the Black Death, which distinguishes it in the popular mind from the later visitations. The name, which came from Germany, will not be found in the old descriptions of the plague in England. A writer in the Quarterly Review says, quote, The term de Schwarze Todd may have been used in Germany in the 14th century, but it does not seem to have been current in England before Hecker's work on epidemics was translated into English in 1833. End quote. The Black Death entered Dorsetshire in August 1348, moving on to Bristol, Gloucester, and Oxford. From Oxford, the infection marched to London, which city it reached at Michaelmas or November. It soon swept over the whole country. Dr. Creighton writes, quote, The Black Death may be said to have extended over three seasons in the British islands. A partial season in the south of England in 1348, a great season all over England, in Ireland, and in the south of Scotland in 1349, and a late extension in Scotland generally in 1350. The experience of all Europe was similar the Mediterranean provinces receiving the infection as early as 1347, and the northern countries on the Baltic and North Seas as late as 1350. End quote. This plague had the most momentous effect upon the history of England, on account of the fearful mortality that it caused. It paralysed industry, and permanently altered the position of the labourer. Ineffectual attempts were made to neutralize these effects by the statute of laborers and by enactments quote, that every workman and laborer shall do his work just as he used before the pestilence, that the servants of substantial people shall take no more than they used to take, and that laborers and workmen who will not work shall be arrested and imprisoned. End quote. The effects of the pestilence on the church and on morals is seen in the writings of Wycliffe and Langland. Wycliffe, who was an Oxford student, in 1348 predicted in his book The Last Age of the Church, the end of the world in 1400 at latest. The effect upon architecture has been dwelt upon by the antiquaries, upon the growth of the country by political economists, and upon the general health of the country by doctors so that it is not necessary here to enter into further explanations. The statistics of the writers of the Middle Ages are of little value, and the estimates of those who died are very various. But the statement that half the population of England died from the plague is probably not far from the truth. In East Anglia, which suffered most severely, upwards of 800 parishes lost their parsons, 83 of them twice, and ten of them three times in a few months. In Norfolk and Suffolk, nineteen religious houses were left without abbot or prior. The details of the Black Death in London are not numerous, but Riley gives some particulars of mortality among the city companies at this time. In the Articles of the Cutlers, 1344, the names of eight wardens are given, and below it is stated that in the twenty-third year of Edward III's reign, five years after, they were all dead, and others chosen in their place. In the Articles of the Hatters, 1347, 
Six wardens are named as being chosen on Tuesday after the Feast of St. Lucy, 13th of December, 21 Edward III, and a note is added that by the Saturday after the translation of St. Thomas the Martyr, 7th of July, 24 Edward III, they had all died. Four wardens of the Goldsmiths' Company are recorded to have fallen victims to the Black Death, and doubtless the other companies suffered in a like manner. The most striking fact in respect to the mortality in London is that recorded by Stowe in his Chronicle, of 50,000 persons buried in Sir Walter de Manny's burial place in Spitalcroft, now the Charter House. Although doubtless the number is grossly exaggerated, it is certain that it was very great. One of the victims in high places was Dr. Bradwardine, Archbishop of Canterbury, who died at Lambeth on the 26th of August, 1349, just one week after he had landed at Dover from Avignon. In January 1349, the meeting of Parliament was prorogued because, quote, a sudden visitation of deadly pestilence had broken out at Westminster and the neighbourhood. End quote. Dr. Creighton writes, quote, For three hundred years, plague was the grand zymotic disease of England. The same type of plague that came from the East in 1347 to 1349 continuously reproduced in a succession of epidemics at one place or another. End quote. He goes on to quote Peinlich's Pest in Steiermark, i.e. Styria, 1877-1878, to show that similar cases occurred over Europe. From 1349 to 1716, 70 years are marked in the annals of Styria as plague years. The second great pestilence occurred in 1361, when the number of deaths was about a third of those from the plague of 1349. The mortality was greater among men than women. The third pestilence, of 1368 to 1369, is referred to by Langland in Piers Plowman. The fourth was in 1375 to 1376, and the fifth in 1390 to 1391. Dr. Crichton describes several other plagues, and writes that, quote, In the decade from 1430 to 1440, there were no fewer than four distinct outbreaks of plague, three of them confined to London, and one of them, that of 1439, general throughout the realm. End quote. The constant recurrence of the plague must have taught the authorities some mode of treatment, but although certain sanitary regulations were made, which will be referred to later on, it is only incidentally that we learn what was done during the earlier visitations. Probably panic reigned generally in the time of the Black Death. Such writings as are left us give this impression, and there is little reason for surprise that it should have been so. Dr. Creighton has entered very fully into the history of the various plagues and the different expedients which were adopted to mitigate their severity. His valuable work is so thorough in its treatment of the subject that to a great extent I have drawn the following particulars from his luminous pages. The first plague order, of which the full text is extant, was issued in 1543. The following transcript is taken from an abstract of several orders relating to the plague, British Museum, Additional Manuscript Number 4376. Quote, 35 Henry VIII, a precept issued to the aldermen, that they should cause their beadles to set the sign of the cross on every house which should be afflicted with the plague, and there continue for forty days, that no person who was able to live by himself and should be afflicted with the plague, should go abroad or into any company for one month after his sickness, and that all others who could not live without their daily labour should, as much as in them lay, refrain from going abroad, and should for forty days after, illegible word, and continually carry a white rod in their hand, two foot long. That every person whose house had been infected should, after a visitation, carry all the straw and, illegible word, in the night privately in the fields and burn, 
they shall also carry clothes of the infected in the fields to be cured. That no housekeeper should put any person diseased out of his house into the street or other place unless they provided housing for them in some other house. That all persons having any dogs in their house, other than hounds, spaniels, or mastiffs, necessary for the custody or safe keeping of their houses, should forthwith convey them out of the city, or cause them to be killed and carried out of the city and buried at the common laystall. That such as kept hounds, spaniels, or mastiffs, should not suffer them to go abroad, but closely confine them. That the church wardens of every parish should employ somebody to keep out all common beggars out of churches on holy days, and cause them to remain without doors. That all the streets, lanes, etc., within the wards should be cleansed. That the alderman should cause this precept to be read in the churches. End quote. Dr. Creighton says that this order was a development of the measures devised by the king or his minister before 1518, and probably in the plague of 1513. The wisps put out on the infected houses are replaced by crosses, which above are described simply as the sign of the cross. On the 15th of November 1547, it was ordered by the mayor, recorder and alderman, vice commites, that, quote, every householder of their several wards, which sith the feast of all saints last past, hath been visited with the plague, shall cause to be fixed upon the uttermost post of their street door a certain cross of St. Anthony devised for that purpose, there to remain forty days after the setting up thereof. End quote. The cross of St. Anthony was a crutch, such as was used by the crutched friars. It was painted in blue on canvas or board, and the legend under or over the cross was, Lord, have mercy upon us. In the plague of 1563 it was ordered, on the 3rd of July, that two hundred blue headless crosses be made with all convenient speed by the chamberlain, and again, on the 6th of the same month, two hundred more were ordered. On the 8th of July, blue crosses were delivered to the bailiff of Finsbury to be used there. Dr. Creighton says that before the plague of 1603, the colour of the crosses had been changed to red. The white rod or wand was used in France as well as in England, as we learn from a letter of the Venetian ambassador to France, the 20th of November, 1580. Quote, this city, Paris, I hear is in a very fair sanitary condition. Notwithstanding that, as I entered a city gate, which is close to where I resided, I met a man and a woman bearing the white plague wands in their hands and asking alms. But some believe that this was merely an artifice on their part to gain money. End quote. The white wand was afterwards retained as the peculiar badge of the searchers of infected houses and of the bearers of the dead. In 1603, it had become a red wand, just as the blue cross had become a red one. The regulation about dogs is of great interest, as it incidentally shows that dogs were commonly kept in London houses for the purpose of protection. It was believed that dogs carried infection in their hair. Brassbridge, in his Poor Man's Jewel, 1578, relates how, quote, not many years since, I knew a glover in Oxford who, with his family, to the number of ten or eleven persons, died of the plague, which was said to be brought into the house by a dogskin that his wife bought when the disease was in the city. End quote. The plague orders contained the claws against dogs to the last, and thousands of them were killed. A proclamation during the London Plague of 1563 was directed against cats as well as dogs. The early literature of the plague is very unsatisfactory, and we have to come to a time much later than the medieval period for information as to treatment. The main points of the various regulations were isolation of the infected and special attention to sanitation. These, in principle, are in accord with the best opinion of today 
but the way in which they were carried out left much to be desired. Those who were imprisoned in their houses must have felt that they were given over to death. Yet some of these patients did recover, and we naturally ask, what was the treatment which caused these cures? Was the cure due to the doctor or to nature alone? The answer is not easy to find. Dr. Payne, in his inaugural address as president of the Epidemiological Society in 1893, specially alludes to the literature of the plague, of which he says, quote, The number of publications relating to the plague in Europe during the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries is very large, those in Germany being probably the most numerous, while those published in England are comparatively few. We might expect, however, that those works published at the time of great epidemics would furnish us with valuable material for epidemic history. It is very disappointing, therefore, to find how very seldom these writings, whether of continental or English origin, have any historical value. What generally happened was this. When an epidemic broke out, or was expected in any particular place, some local physician thought it his business to furnish the public with a tract on the subject, and he accordingly compiled from the best authorities a pamphlet, good or bad, as the case might be. Such a physician, if he survived, would no doubt have been able to acquire some experience of the disease during its continuous and if he had chosen to put this down in plain words when the epidemic was over, he might have done some service to medical history. But unfortunately, when the disease had once disappeared, the physicians seemed to have lost all interest in the subject, and it is only in rare instances that the medical literature of the plague contains any account of contemporary epidemics. One exception is Guy de Choliac's well-known account of the Black Death at Avignon but we have nothing in English literature to compare at all with this till much later. The only medical work on the plague in the Elizabethan times which has much value is that of Thomas Edge, and this cannot be called original. It is not till after the Great Plague of 1665 that we have, in the well-known work of Nathaniel Hodges, Loimologia Sive Pestis Narratio, 1672, some attempt at a scientific description of the epidemic. End quote. Dr. Furnival has printed in his edition of Vicary some extracts from the Guildhall repertories relating to the appointment and payment of surgeons and physicians to attend the plague-stricken folk. William King, surgeon to the pest house, petitioned for a pension in 1611. He affirms that he had shown, quote, great care and diligence in curing of such persons as have been sent thither and by reason of his attendance and employment there, his friends and former acquaintances do utterly refuse to use him in his profession. End quote. On September 10th, the city authorities agreed to give King a stipend of three pounds a year, which does not seem very liberal pay for his onerous services. In the British Museum there is a manuscript of some importance, Sloan Manuscript 349, entitled Loimographia, an account of the Great Plague of London in the year 1665, by William Boghurst, Apothecary. This was first referred to by Mr. E. W. Braley in his edition of Defoe's Plague Year, and it was analysed by Dr. Creighton in his work on epidemics. Dr. Payne printed an edition of the tract in 1894. Mr. Braley reprinted from the Intelligencer, July the 31st, 1665, the following curious advertisement. Quote, Whereas William Boghurst, apothecary at the White Hart in St. Giles in the Fields, hath administered a long time to such as have been afflicted with the plague, to the number of forty, fifty, or sixty patients a day, with wonderful success, by God's blessing upon certain excellent medicines which he hath, as a water, a lozenge, etc., also an electuary antidote of but eight pence the ounce price. This is to notify that the said Boghurst is willing to attend any person infected and desiring his attendance, either in the city, suburbs, or country, upon reasonable terms, and that the remedies above mentioned are to be had at his house or shop at the White Hart aforesaid. End quote. 
Boghurst gives a good deal of information in his book regarding the signs of disease and its treatment, and he describes the spread of the disease in London as follows. Quote, the winds blowing westward so long together, from before Christmas until July, about seven months, was the cause the plague began first at the west end of the city, as at St. Giles, St. Martin's, Westminster. Afterwards, it gradually insinuated and crept down Holborn and the Strand, and then into the city, and at last to the east of the suburbs, so that it was half a year at the west end of the city before the east end and Stepney was infected, which was about the middle of July. Southwark, being the south suburb, was infected almost as soon as the west end. The disease spread not altogether by contagion at first, nor began at only one place, and spread further and further as an eating spreading sore doth all over the body, but fell upon several places of the city and suburbs like rain, even at the first at St. Giles, St. Martin's, Chancery Lane, Southwark, and some places within the city as at Proctor's house. End quote. Dr. Payne writes, quote, it has always been a question whether the repeated recurrences of plague in Europe were to be attributed to reintroduction of the virus from the East, or to a fresh awakening of a virus already endemic. End quote. And then alludes to Boghurst's local explanation of the origin of the 1665 plague. He concludes his introductory by saying, quote, It seems probable that London still contains sufficient plague virus to start a fresh epidemic when the local and temporary conditions were favourable. The only temporary conditions of this kind that we know of are, first, the rapid growth of population in London, which caused terrible overcrowding, and must have overtasked the ordinary measures of sanitation, and, secondly, the long drought in the spring of 1665, which is referred to by Boghurst. The importance of this latter fact has been explained by Dr. Creighton, in accordance with Pettenkoffer's laws, but, on the other hand, the great plague year of 1625 was remarkably wet. The question is still one for discussion, and it may be left to the judgment of the reader, guided by the valuable materials which Boghurst contributes. End quote. From 1348 to 1665, plague was continually occurring in London, but it has not appeared since the last date on anything but a small scale. It has been supposed that in the Great Fire the seeds of disease were destroyed, but this is not a conclusive reason, and fears were expressed as to its possible reappearance in London after the Plague of Bombay in 1896-1897, and the Plague of Marseille in the summer of 1720 created a panic throughout Western Europe. Renewed attention was paid to the London Plague of 1665, and in 1722 Defoe wrote his renowned Journal of the Plague Year. We have no thoroughly trustworthy statistics of the earlier plagues, but Dr. Creighton gives particulars of the visitations in London in 1603, 1625, and 1665 in one table. Year, 1603. Estimated population, 250,000. Total deaths, 42,940. Plague deaths, 33,347. Highest mortality in a week, 3,385. Worst week, 25th of August to the 1st of September. Year, 1625. Estimated population, 320,000. Total deaths, 63,001. Plague deaths, 41,313. Highest mortality in a week, 5,205. Worst week, 11th to the 18th of August. Year, 1665. Estimated population, 460,000. Total deaths, 97,306. Plague deaths, 68,000. 596. Highest mortality in a week, 8,297. Worst week, 
12th to the 19th of September. To these figures may be added that, in 1593, 11,503 persons died of the plague. The figures of 1603 and 1625 in some reports differ from the above. Footnote. In a broadside referring to the Plague of London, printed by Peter Cole at the printing office in Cornhill, near the Royal Exchange, 1665, the number of deaths from plague in 1603, 1625, and 1636 are given as follows. 1603, 30,561 persons. 1625, 35,403. And 1636, 10,400. The numbers in 1593 are given as above. End of footnote. Some of the plagues devastated the whole country, so that there was no place for the Londoners to fly to for safety. But in others, the danger was more generally confined to London. In 1665, there were many places that the Londoner could visit with considerable chance of safety. But Queen Elizabeth, in her reign, would have none of this moving about. Stowe says that in the time of the plague of 1563, quote, a gallows was set up in the marketplace of Windsor to hang all such as should come there from London. Nowhere to be brought to, or through, or by Windsor, nor any one on the river by Windsor to carry wood or other stuff to or from London, upon pain of hanging without any judgment. And such people as received any wares out of London into Windsor were turned out of their houses, and their houses shut up. End quote. Monk, Duke of Albemarle, and Samuel Pepys were two of the most prominent public servants who remained in London during the plague of 1665. The clergy and the doctors fled, with very few exceptions, and several of those who stayed in town, doing the duty of others, as well as their own, fell victims to the disease. Dr. Hodges, author of Loimologia, enumerates among those who assisted in the dangerous work of restraining the progress of the infection, the learned Dr. Gibson, Regius Professor at Cambridge, Dr. Francis Glisson, Dr. Nathaniel Paget, Dr. Peter Barwick, Dr. Humphrey Brooks, etc. Of those he mentions, eight or nine fell in their work, among whom was Dr. William Conyers, to whose goodness and humanity he bears the most honourable testimony. Dr. Alexander Burnett, of Fenchurch Street, one of Pepys's friends, was another of the victims. Footnote. Mr. Pierce gives some interesting facts in his Annals of Christ's Hospital respecting the effects of the plague in 1603 and 1665 on the condition of the Blue Coat School. During 1665, no more than 32 children of the total number of 260 in the house died of all diseases, although the neighbourhood was severely visited. End of footnote. Sweating Sickness the sweating sickness did not appear until the end of the Middle Ages, viz. the year 1485 when the Battle of Bosworth was fought, and there were five outbreaks of the epidemic up to 1551, after which date it did not appear again in England. Dr. Creighton has taken some pains to trace the origin of the disease. He writes, quote, The history of the English sweat presents to the student of epidemics much that is paradoxical, although not without parallel, and much that his research can never rescue from uncertainty. Where did this hitherto unheard-of disease come from? Where was it in the intervals from 1485 to 1508, from 1508 to 1517, from 1517 to 1528, and from 1528 to 1551? What became of it after 1551? Why did it fall mostly on the great houses, on the king's court, on the luxurious establishments of prelates and nobles, on the richer citizens, on the lusty and well-fed, for the most part sparing the poor? Why did it avoid France when it overran the continent in 1529? No theory of the sweat can be held sufficient which does not afford some kind of answer to each of these questions, and some harmonising of them all. End quote. Those who wish to follow these inquiries must consult Dr. Creighton's book, 
Suffice it to say here that the author is of opinion that suspicion falls justly on the foreign mercenaries who landed with Henry Tudor at Milford Haven on the 6th of August, 1485, as the carriers of the disease. Dr. Creighton found among the British Museum manuscripts, additional manuscripts numbers 27 and 582, a treatise on the Sudor Anglicus, or English Sweat, dedicated to Henry VII by the author, Thomas Forestier, M.D., a native of Normandy who lived for a time in London. Stowe says that the sickness began in London on the 21st of September and continued till the end of October. Quote, of the which a wonderful number died. End quote. But Forestier gives the date as the 19th. The second sweat was in 1508, when many died in the city. In August, public prayers were made at St. Paul's on account of the plague of sweat. The third epidemic was in 1517, and the fourth in 1528. On the 5th of June of the latter year, Sir Brian Tuke wrote to Bishop Tunstall that he had fled to Stepney, quote, for fear of the infection, end quote a servant having died in his house. Anne Boleyn, her brother George and her father, caught the infection and recovered. Her brother-in-law, William Carey, died at Hunsdon. A large number of persons caught the disease, but a very considerable proportion recovered. The fifth and last outbreak was in 1551, and it is interesting to note that Dr. John Caius, the famous physician, wrote a treatise on it. Dr. Norman Moore describes this as, quote, the first original treatise published in England, by which I mean the first treatise in which the modern idea of observing the disease and writing a complete account of what was actually seen was carried out. End quote. In Mackin's diary, it is said that, quote, there died in London many merchants and great rich men and women and young men and old of the new sweat. End quote. And Sir Thomas Speak and Sir John Wallop are instanced among others. Hancock, a minister of Poole, Dorset, refers to quote, the posting sweat that posted from town to town through England and was named Stop Gallant, for it spared none. For there were some dancing in the court at nine o'clock that were dead at eleven. End quote. In taking stock of diseases and epidemics in London, we may note that many of the pestilences previous to the Black Death were due to famine. Dr. Creighton says of the year 1258 that, quote, So great was the pinch in London from the failure of the crops and the want of money, that 15,000 are said to have died of famine and of a grievous and widespread pestilence that broke out about the Feast of the Trinity, 19th of May. End quote. The number is given by Matthew Paris, and Dr. Creighton adds, quote, It suggests a larger population in the capital than we might have been disposed to credit. The same writer says that London was so full of people when the Parliament was sitting in the year before, 1257, that the city could hardly hold them all in her ample bosom. The annals of Tewkesbury put the whole mortality from famine and fever in London in 1258 at 20,000 but the whole population did not probably exceed 40,000. End quote. Smallpox and measles were not known to the ancients, and the latter seems to have been the first noted in the 14th century. Of later diseases, the name of influenza is Italian of the 18th century, but Dr. Creighton refers to several epidemics which may have been the same disease as those of 1173, 1427, 1510, and 1557. The new disease of 1643 was either typhus or influenza. End of chapter 7, part 3. End of section 13. Section 14 of the Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. 
Chapter 7 Health, Disease and Sanitation Part 4 Sanitation Having considered the condition of medical practice at the hospitals and among private patients, and having also reviewed the particulars of some of the chief epidemics, we shall now be better able to understand the sanitary condition of medieval London and the means to keep it clean. There can be little doubt that strenuous attempts were made at different periods to improve its condition. We may allow at once that Old London was not a clean or healthy town, as we understand these words now, but there can be little doubt that it was in advance of most other towns. Dr. Poor is rather severe in his estimate of the health of medieval London. He considers the situation of the city fairly good from a sanitary point of view. It was not healthy, however, because of its marshy surroundings. Org and dysentery were always present and very fatal. Scurvy was very prevalent before the introduction of the potato by Hawkins. William Clowes, the well-known Elizabethan surgeon of St. Bartholomew's, was also surgeon to Christ's Hospital, and in his day twenty or thirty children had the scurvy at a time in the latter house, a fact due to a diet largely composed of fish and other salted provisions with a scanty allowance of vegetables. Quote, there can be no doubt that down to the commencement of the present century, London was a veritable fever bed, the causes of death being largely malarial fever, spotted or typhus fever, plague, smallpox, measles, scarlet fever, and whooping cough, the two latter being comparatively recent introductions. End quote. Another source of the unhealthiness of London is supposed by Dr. Poor to be due to a soil soaked with the filth of centuries, by which means the wells were probably infected. Dr. Creighton takes a much more favourable view of the condition of London, and he writes, quote, Nuisances certainly existed in medieval London, but it is equally certain that they were not tolerated without limit. End quote. It is also probable that the polluted condition of the soil inside and outside the houses has been greatly exaggerated. There was overcrowding in some quarters of London, but in most parts there were gardens and plenty of fresh air. Many of the streets were used as markets, and they were mostly left in a very untidy state, but attempts were made to cleanse them. The worst parts of the town were the lanes leading down to the river. The bad state of these places was constantly complained of, but we must always remember that complaints and legal actions are evidence to some extent that in the end the evils were abated. Very little is recorded when affairs go straight, as all are contented to let them remain as they are, but when things go wrong we are all anxious to raise complaints, and too much weight must not be given to the supposed universality of these evils. We do not judge of the general manners and morals of the country by the cases in the law courts and the police courts. Some of the evils, of which a description has come down to us, were doubtless the cause of remedial measures being adopted. The streets, soon after the conquest, must have been in a very rotten condition, if we are to judge from some accounts that have come down to us. Stowe relates in his chronicle that in the great tempest of November 17th, 1090, when 606 houses were beaten down by the wind in London, the roof of St. Mary Le Beau in Cheapside, quote, being raised with the beams thereof, were carried in the air a great while, and at the last, six of the said beams were driven with their fall so fast in the ground, that there appeared, some of them, the seventh, and of some, the eighth part, to wit, but four foot above the ground which beams or rafters were seven and twenty or eight and twenty foot long, which was a wonderful to see them so pierce the ground, not paved then with stone, and there to stand in such order as the workmen had placed them on the church. End quote. There these beams remained as obstructions until they were cut even with the ground. Little appears to have been done in general sanitation until the reign of Henry III but it has been said 
that the sanitary reforms of the reign of Edward I were as great as the reforms effected in the law and constitution. It is satisfactory to learn that it was the example of this great king which made the use of the bath popular among his subjects. In Riley's memorials, there are several references to sanitary ordinances at this time. In 1281, regulations were made that no swine and no stand or timber were from henceforth to be found in the streets. The swine were to be killed, and the stands and timber forfeited. Melters of tallow and lard were turned out of their warehouses in Cheapside in 1283. The watercourse of Walbrook was to be made free from dung and other nuisances in 1288. Swine still wandered about the streets, and in 1292 four men whose names are given in letter book C were elected and sworn, quote, to take and kill such swine as should be found wandering in the king's highway, to whomsoever they might belong, within the walls of the city and the suburbs thereof. End quote. The Earl of Lincoln complained to Parliament in 1307 as to the state of the river fleet, and the gist of his complaint is reported by Stowe. Quote, Whereas, in times past, the course of water running at London under Holborn Bridge and Fleet Bridge into the Thames had been of such large breadth and depth that ten or twelve ships at once with merchandises were wont to come to the foresaid Bridge of Fleet and some of them to Holborn Bridge. Now the same course, by filth of the tanners and such other, was sore decayed. Also by raising up of wharfs, but especially by turning of the water, which they of the new temple made to their mills without Barnard Castle, and diverse other perturbations, the said ships now could not enter as they were wont, and as they ought. Wherefore he desired that the mayor of London, with the sheriffs and certain discreet aldermen, might be appointed to see the course of the said water, and that by oath of honest men all the foresaid hindrances might be removed, and to be made as it was wont of old time. End quote. In the second year of Edward II's reign, 1309, a proclamation was issued for cleansing the streets, which were more encumbered with filth than they used to be, and penalties were enforced against those who neglected their duty in this matter. Between forty and fifty years after this, we have evidence that one of the main thoroughfares of the city was in a very bad state. On August the 22nd, 1358, Isabella, the widowed queen of Edward II, died at Hartford Castle, and in the following November she was buried in the church of the Greyfriars. In order that the passage of the body through the city should be carried out with any decency, it was necessary to enact that Bishopsgate Street and Aldgate Street should be cleansed of ordure and other filth. Dr. Creighton criticizes the public regulations and writes, quote, There are several orders of Edward III relating to the removal of lay stalls and to keeping the town ditch clean, which show, of course, that there was neglect, but at the same time disposition to correct it. It is farther obvious that the connection between nuisances and the public health was clearly apprehended. The sanitary conditions of modern times were undreamt of, nor did the circumstances altogether call for them. The sewers of those days were banked up watercourses, or shores, as the word was pronounced, which ran uncovered down the various declivities of the city to the town ditch and to the Thames. They would have sufficed to carry off the refuse of a population of some forty or sixty thousand. They were, at all events, freely opened the greatest of all purifying agents, the oxygen of the air, and they poisoned neither the water of the town ditch, which abounds in excellent fish within John Stowe's memory, nor the waters of the Thames. End quote. This seems exactly to explain the sanitary condition of the city, and we must never forget that the streets were cleared by means of surface drainage, which carried the refuse of the city to the river, to find its way to the sea at last. The streets were evidently fairly well attended to in ordinary times, and it is not for those who have polluted the Thames and made the streams into covered sewers to point the finger of scorn at the evils allowed by their ancestors, who, at all events, kept the Thames pure. 
The proclamations and ordinances issued for the proper cleansing of the streets of London were very numerous, but the first sanitary act that appears in the statutes of the realm was passed in the seventeenth year of Richard II, 1388, the preamble of which Dr. Creighton prints. From this and other sources, it appears that one of the chief evils complained of was due to the blood and offal in the shambles of Newgate Street. It is impossible to mention here all the information that has come down to us as to what was done to secure a satisfactory sanitation, but special reference may be made to the useful abstract in Riley's introduction to the Liber Albus. Quote, Canals were pretty generally made about a century after the date of Fitz Aylwin's assize, on either side of the street, leaving a space for the footpath, for the purpose of carrying off the sewage and rainwater. There were two canals in Cheapside, at a period even when nearly the whole of the north side was a vacant space. The canals, too, of Cornhill are frequently mentioned. By reiterated enactments, it was ordered that the highways should be kept clean from rubbish, hay, straw, sawdust, dung, and other refuse. Each householder was to clear away all dirt from his door, and to be equally careful not to place it before that of his neighbours. No one was to throw water or anything out of the windows, but was to bring the water down and pour it into the street. An exception, however, to this last provision seems to have been made in the case of fishmongers, for we find injunctions frequently issued, that they shall on no account throw their dirty water into the streets, but shall have the same carried to the river. End quote. It was the duty of each alderman to cause to be elected in Wardmott four respectable men to keep the roads clean and free from obstructions. The same duties were carried out at another time by a court of scavengers, who apparently were originally custom house officers. The scavengers had to see that the work was done, and the labourers who actually cleansed the streets were called rakiers. In an ordinance of the time of Edward III, we learn that twelve carts, each with two horses, were kept at the expense of the city for the removal of sewage and refuse. End of chapter 7. End of section 14. Section 15 of the Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lowley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 8 The Governors of the City, Part 1. Quote, London claims the first place, as the greatest municipality, as the model on which, by their charters of liberties, the other large towns of the country were allowed, or charged, to adjust their usages, and as the most active, the most political, and the most ambitious. London has also a preeminence in municipal history, owing to the strength of the conflicting elements which so much affected her constitutional progress. End quote. Stubbs, Constitutional History of England the history of the early government of the city is full of pitfalls for the historian. For years, an account of what occurred before the establishment of the mayoralty was generally accepted, which later research has proved to be entirely erroneous. Careful students of early documents have lately given us information of the greatest value, but we still wait for more facts. In the following pages, an attempt will now be made to place before the reader a short statement of what is known, with some indication of what we still have to learn. Fortunately, there is no lack of students who are constantly adding to our knowledge. And, as in the last few years, considerable discoveries have been published, there is every reason to hope that in the future other discoveries will be made, equal at least in importance to those which have been made in the past. We know remarkably little as to how the government of London was carried on before the conquest, 
but probably the course of procedure was not very different from what was the practice immediately after that great event. When William the Conqueror granted the first charter to London, he addressed the bishop and the portreeve, the former as ecclesiastical governor and the latter as the civil governor. It has been a generally received opinion that there was a succession of portreeves until the first appointment of a mayor, but Mr. Round believes that the title of portreeve disappears after the conqueror's charter. In this opinion, he is opposed to the view of both Bishop Stubbs and Mr. Lofty. It is necessary to bear in mind that a reeve was an officer appointed by the king, just as the sheriffs, or shire reeves, of the various counties are still so appointed. There has been some difference of opinion as to the meaning of the title Port Reeve. It might at first sight be supposed to refer to the Port of London, but this is not the received opinion. Bishop Stubbs writes, quote, The word port in Port Reeve is the Latin porta, not portus, where the markets were held, and although used for the city generally, seems to refer to it specially in its character of a mart or city of merchants. End quote. The city of London obtained from Henry I the right of appointing their own sheriffs, which was a very great privilege, and there must have been some very strong reason to induce the king to grant this great favour. Bishop Stubbs writes of this charter of Henry I to the citizens of London, quote, the privileges of the citizens of London are not to be regarded as a fair specimen of the liberties of ordinary towns, but as a sort of type and standard of the amount of municipal independence and self-government at which the other towns of the country might be expected to aim. At a period at which the other towns were just struggling out of the condition of domain, the Londoners were put in possession of the firm, or farm, of Middlesex, with the right of appointing the sheriff, they were freed from the immediate jurisdiction of any tribunal except of their own appointment, from several universal imposts, from the obligation to accept trial by battle, from liability to misericordia or entire forfeiture, as well as from tolls and local exactions such as ordinary charters specify. They have also their separate franchises secured and their weekly courts, but they have not yet the character of a perpetual corporation or communa, and thus, although possessing, by virtue of their association in guilds, of their several franchises, of their feudal courts, and of their shire organizations under the sheriff, many elements of strength, consolidation, and independence, they have not a compact organization as a municipal body. The city is an accumulation of distinct and different corporate bodies, but not yet a perfect municipality nor, although it was recognized in the reign of Stephen as a communio, did it gain the legal status before the reign of Richard I. End quote. Mr. Round shows, however, that the city possessed the privilege only for a short time. Quote, we see, then, that in absolute contradiction of the received belief on the subject, the shrievalty was not in the hands of the citizens during the twelfth century, i.e., from 1101 but was held by them for a few years only, about the close of the reign of Henry I. The fact that the sheriffs of London and Middlesex were, under Henry II and Richard I, appointed throughout by the crown, must compel our historians to reconsider the independent position they have assigned to the city at that early period. The crown, however, must have had an object in retaining this appointment in its hands. We may find it, I think, in that jealousy of exceptional privilege or exemption which characterized the regime of Henry II. For, as I have shown, the charters to Geoffrey remind us that the ambition of the urban communities was analogous to that of the great feudatories, in so far as they both strove for exemption from official rule. It was precisely to this ambition that Henry II was opposed, and thus, when he granted his charter to London, he wholly omitted, as we have seen, two of his grandfather's concessions, and narrowed down those that remained, that they might not be operative outside the actual walls of the city. When the shrievalty was restored by John to the citizens, 1199, 
the concession had lost its chief importance through the triumph of the communal principle. End quote. Mr. Round holds that the office of Justicia of London was created by Henry I's charter, and as that officer took precedence of the sheriff, he must have been for a time the chief authority of the city. Mr. Round's explanation of this position is of so much importance that it is necessary to quote it here in his own words. Quote, the transient existence of the local justiciarius is a phenomenon of great importance which has been wholly misunderstood. The Mandeville charters afford the clue to the nature of this office. It represents a middle term, a transitional stage between the essentially local shireve and the central justice of the king's court. The justiciarius for Essex or Hertfordshire, or London or Middlesex, was a purely local officer, and yet exercised within the limits of his bailiwick all the authority of the king's justice. So transient was this stage of things that scarcely a trace of it remains. Now in the case of London, the office was created by the charter of Henry I, as I contend, towards the end of his reign, and it expired with the accession of Henry II. It is, therefore, in Stephen's reign that we should expect to find it in existence, and it is precisely in that reign that we find the office Eo nomine, twice granted to the Earl of Essex, and twice mentioned as held by Gervais, otherwise Gervais of Cornhill. End quote. The question of the date of the Charter of Henry I is discussed in Geoffrey de Mandeville, and reasons are given for dating it after 1130 instead of 1100 or 1101. Bishop Stubbs specially refers to the foreign element in London at this time thus, quote, Richard, the son of Rainer, the son of Berengar, was very probably a Lombard by descent. The influential family of Bukinte, Bukka Uncta, which took the lead on many occasions, can hardly have been other than Italian. Gilbert Beckett was a Norman. End quote. And further, in a note, he adds, quote, Andrew of London, the leader of the Londoners at Lisbon in 1147, is not improbably the Andrew Bukinte, whose son Richard was the leader of the riotous young nobles of the city, who, in 1177, furnished a precedent for the Mohawks of the 18th century. End quote. Andrew, who was present at the transference of the Kniton Guild's land to the Priory of Holy Trinity, 1125 or 1126, was one of the witnesses of the agreement between Ramsey Abbey and Holy Trinity after that date, where his name is written, Bukunte. He was Justicia of London in Stephen's reign. The Buccarelli were another Italian family whose name is said to be preserved in Bucklersbury, and Round also mentions Osbert Octodenarii, otherwise Huit Denier, a kinsman and employer of Becket. The origin of the Commune of London has always been an exceedingly obscure problem, but Mr. Round has succeeded in throwing a flood of light upon the subject. In the twelfth century, there was a great municipal movement over Europe. Londoners were well informed as to what was going on abroad, and thoroughly dissatisfied with the existing organization, they waited and were constantly looking for an opportunity of obtaining the privileges of the commune. Mr. Round points out that, quote, Even so early as 1141, when the fortunes of the crown hung in the balance between rival claimants, we find the citizens forming an effective conjuratio, the very term applied to their commune half a century later by Richard of Devizes. Moreover, earlier in the same year, April, William of Malmesbury applies to their government the term communio. End quote. Miss Mary Bateson has gone to the manuscript from which Mr. Round obtained the oath of commune, and her conclusion after consideration is that, quote, the collection as a whole leaves the impression that Communio quam vocant Londoniarum, 1141, as it is styled by William of Malmesbury, was not merely a unit in the eyes of the exchequer, that the jurisdictional unity of the city organised in Folkmoot and Husting gave something substantial whereon the foundations of mayoralty and commune could be laid. End quote. Mr. Round writes, the assumption that the mayoralty of London dates from the accession of Richard I, 1189, is an absolute perversion of history. End quote. And he adds that, 
Quote, there is record evidence which completely confirms the remarkable words of Richard of Devizes, who declares that, on no terms whatever would King Richard or his father have ever assented to the establishment of the Commune in London. End quote. In October 1191, the conflict between John, the king's brother, and Longchamp, the king's representative, became acute. William of Longchamp, Bishop of Ely, 1189, and Chancellor to Richard I, was once described by Henry II as the, quote, son of two traitors, end quote. When Richard called a council in Normandy in February 1190, Longchamp hurried over to the king in advance of his enemies and returned to England as sole justiciar. The Pope also made him legate. Longchamp bitterly offended the Londoners who, finding that they could turn the scales to either side, named the Commune as the price of their support of John. Bishop Stubbs, in his introduction to the Chronicle of Roger de Hoveden, after referring to the negotiations between Longchamp and John, and describing the hastening of the two parties to London on Monday the 7th of October, when Longchamp met the citizens in Guildhall, writes, quote, The magnates of the city were divided. Richard Fitz Rayner, the head of one party, took the side of John. Henry of Cornhill was faithful to the Chancellor. These two knights had been sheriffs at Richard's coronation, and both represented the burgher aristocracy. End quote. Longchamp betook himself to the tower, and a meeting was held at St. Paul's on Tuesday the 8th, and the barons welcomed the Archbishop of Rouen as Chief Justiciar, and saluted John as Regent. Quote, this done, oaths were largely taken. John the Justiciar and the barons swore to maintain the Commune of London. The oath of fealty to Richard was then sworn, John taking it first, and then the two archbishops, the bishops, the barons, and last the burghers, with the express understanding that should the king die without issue, they would receive John as his successor. End quote. Mr. Round writes, quote, The excited citizens who had poured out overnight with lanterns and torches to welcome John to the capital streamed together on the morning of the eventful 8th of October at the well-known sound of the great bell, swinging out from its campanile in St. Paul's churchyard. There they heard John take the oath to the commune like a French king or lord, and then London for the first time had a municipality of her own. End quote. Footnote. The Beffroi of France was a symbol and pledge of independence. So was the bell tower of St. Paul's, which is styled in documents Bere Freedom or Campanile. End of footnote. After this, the influence of Longchamp at once faded away. He stood a three days blockade in the tower, after which he was forced to surrender and was deposed from all secular offices. As to the results of this revolution, Mr. Round writes, quote, Of the character of the commune so granted, of its ultimate fate, and of the part it played in the municipal development of London, nothing has been really known. The only fact of importance ascertained from other sources has been the appearance of a mayor of London at or about the same time as the grant of a commune. It cannot indeed be proved that, as has been sometimes supposed, the two phenomena were synchronistic, for no mention of the Mayor of London, after long research, is known to me earlier than the spring of the year 1193. But there is, of course, the strongest presumption that the grant of a commune involved a mayor, and already in 1194 we find a citizen accused of boasting that, come what may, the Londoner shall have no king but their mayor. End quote. Mr. Round then states very clearly the divergent views of Bishop Stubbs, Mr. Lofty, and Mr. Coote on the question of the concession of the commune. The bishop held that it was difficult to decide with certainty on the point, as no formal record of the confirmation of the commune is now preserved. Mr. Coote believed that a charter was granted in 1191, which has been lost, and Mr. Lofty dates the mayoralty from 1189 and deemed the commune to have been of gradual growth, and to have been practically recognised by the charter of Henry I. In reply to Mr. Coote's view that in the case of London, which had acquired all other things, 
the commune expressed for its citizens the mayoralty only. Mr. Round writes, quote, We find, however, that on the continent the word commune did not of necessity imply a mayor, for Beauvais and Compagne, though constituted communes, appear to have had no mayors during most of the twelfth century. The chroniclers, therefore, had they only meant to speak of the privilege of electing a mayor, would not have all employed a word which did not connote it, but would have said what they meant. However, this theory rests on the assumption common till now to all historians that the citizens had continuously possessed from the beginning of the twelfth century the privilege granted in the charter of Henry I. But I have shown in my Geoffrey de Mandeville that these privileges were not renewed by Henry II or Richard I, and this fact strikingly confirms the explicit words of Richard of Devises when he states that neither the one nor the other would have allowed the Londoners to form a commune, even for a million of marks. End quote. Of Mr. Lofty's argument that Glanville's words prove that London, if not other towns as well, had already a commune under Henry II, Mr. Round remarks that it had been disposed of by Dr. Gross in his Guild Merchant. We have now to refer specially to Mr. Round's remarkable discovery among the manuscripts of the British Museum of the Oath of the Commune, which proves for the first time that, quote, London, in 1193, possessed a fully developed commune of the continental pattern. End quote. This discovery not only gives us information which was unknown before, but upsets the received opinions as to the early governing position of the aldermen. From this we learn that the government of the city was at that time in the hands of a mayor and certain échevin, Skivini. Of the existence of these Skivins in England, no suspicion has previously been expressed. Mr. Round, indeed, points out that Dr. Gross, in his Guild Merchant, considers these governing officers as a purely continental institution. Twelve years later, 1205, to 1206, we learn from another document, preserved in the same volume, that Alii Probi Homines were associated with the mayor and échevin to form a body of twenty-four, that is, twelve scivini and an equal number of councillors. In these documents there is no mention of aldermen, and further information is required as to when the court of aldermen first came into existence. This point will be discussed later on in this chapter, when the position of the alderman as a governor is considered. Mr. Round holds that the court of Scivini and Alii Probi Homines, of which at present we know nothing further than what is contained in the terms of the oaths, was the germ of the common council. He prints the oaths and compares the oath of the twenty-four with that of the freemen in the present day. The striking point in this municipal revolution is that the new privileges were entirely copied from those of continental cities, and that the names of mayor and échevin were French, thus excluding the aldermen who represented the Saxon element. Still, as time went on, the aldermen obtained their natural position in the government of London, and the foreign name of échevin sank before them. The intimate connection between Normandy and England made it certain that Englishmen would seek inspiration from Normandy. Mr. Round has devoted considerable attention to Monsieur Guéry's valuable work, Les Établissements de Rouen, and shows that there is conclusive proof of the assertion that the Commune of London derived its origin from that of Rouen. The Van Quatre of the latter city formed the administrative body, annually elected to act as the Mayor's Council. Mr. Round further found that the oath of this 24 bears a marked resemblance to the oath of the London Commune discovered by him. Quote, the three salient features in common are 1. The oath to administer justice fairly. 2. The special provisions against bribery. 3. The expulsion of any member of the body convicted of receiving a bribe. End quote. Much attention has been given lately to the important question of continental influence on English municipalities, and Miss Mary Bateson has discovered that a considerable number of boroughs in England, Wales, and Ireland 
drew their customs from the little Norman town of Breteuil. These are Biddeford, Burford, Chipping Sodbury, Hereford, Litchfield, Ludlow, Netherweir, Preston, Royton, Shrewsbury, Llanvillan, Rudlan, Welshport, Drogheda, Dungarvan, Kildare, and Rathmore. Besides these, there are eight suspected cases and a number of derived cases. Footnote. A curious point is that formerly the Leges Britoliae were supposed to relate to Bristol, and the great English port obtained credit which it did not deserve. End of footnote. Although the fact that the Council of Twenty-Four seemed to exclude the already existing alderman from the chief government of the city was opposed to our previous views, Mr. Round has set himself to show that a mayor's council of twenty-four, not alderman, was not unusual, and he draws special attention to the case of Winchester. There, the mayor had a council of twenty-four, who continued to exist down to the year 1835. This council was elected by the city as a whole, and not by the wards, and Mr. Round believes that this was also the case in London. He then quotes from Dean Kitchen's book on Winchester, Historic Towns, where it is said, quote, The aldermen in latter days, the civic aristocracy, were originally officers placed over each of the wards of the city and entrusted with the administration of it. It was not till early in the 16th century that they were interposed between the mayor and the 24 men. End quote. We learn from Mrs. Green, town life in the 15th century, that there was a council of 24 at Colchester, Ipswich, Leicester, Northampton, Norwich, Oxford, Wells, and Yarmouth. When the city obtained the long-coveted privilege of the commune and the power of electing their own mayor, one would naturally expect the electors to choose the most distinguished citizen. We cannot, however, say whether Henry Fitz Aylwin was that. At all events, he seems to have retained the esteem of the city, and he was continued in office until his death in 1212. Mr. Round wrote the life of Fitz Aylwin in the Dictionary of National Biography, but he was unable to discover much of the mayor's history. He presumes that he was the grandson of an unidentified Leafston, but he rejects the view that he was the grandson of Leafston, Port Reeve of London, before the conquest. Leafston was a common name among the Saxons, and two or three of the same name have been confounded by historians. Fitz Aylwin is described as of London stone, because his dwelling, a very fair house, stood on the north side of the church of St. Swithin, and over against the London stone, which was situated on the south side of Cannon, Candlewick, street, but afterwards removed to the north side of the street. The advowson of the church was appropriated to the mansion. London stone itself is one of the most valued relics of London, and its history is lost in antiquity. We know that in the Middle Ages it was esteemed to possess a special value as a representative stone monument. The seal of Fitz Aylwin is attached to a deed preserved among the public records. It represents a man on horseback with a hawk perched on his wrist. There is an inscription round the circumference of the seal, but it is so defaced as to be illegible. The city was given the right of electing the mayor, but we do not know for certain who it was who first exercised this right. Bishop Stubbs says that two years after the death of Fitz Aylwin, King John granted to the barons of the City of London the right of annually electing the mayor. The role of mayors is one of considerable distinction, and those who obtained this position were mostly men of great character and authority. Some of them were on the side of popular freedom, while others were active in the support of the prerogatives of the privileged classes. Sometimes the king degraded the mayor and appointed a custos or warden in his place. As early as 1222, twenty years after the death of Fitz Aylwin, in the reign of Henry III, Hubert de Burr, chief justiciar, superseded the mayor and appointed a custos in his place. Again, in 1266, William Fitzrichard was appointed by the king warden of the city. In November of the same year, 
Fitz Richard was replaced by Alan Souche, and John Adrian and Luc de Batancourt were elected by the citizens' bailiffs of London and Middlesex. Quote, the bailiffs and the whole commune, communa, of the said city, end quote, are mentioned in 1267. In 1268-1269, Hugh Fitz Otho was custos, and then followed some stirring times in London. Sir Walter Harvey, the predecessor of the famous Sir Henry Whaley's in the mayor's chair, was the popular leader against the proceedings of his successor. Sir Henry de Whaley's, Le Wallay's, Le Wallay's, or Le Gailey's, for in all these forms does his name appear, was elected sheriff with his distinguished contemporary, Gregory de Rokesley, in 1270. His first mayoralty was in 1273, and in 1275, he was the mayor of Bordeaux. He was a very active chief magistrate and a good administrator. He was also high in the royal favour. He proceeded against bakers, butchers and fishmongers and ordered them to remove their stalls from West Cheap. He also came into conflict with the barons of the sink ports. The king sent a mandate to the justices in air at the tower commanding them not to molest Whaley for his reforms. End of chapter 8, part 1. End of section 15. Section 16 of the Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 8. The Governors of the City, Part 2. In the year 1285, the city again lost its franchise. Gregory de Rokesley was deposed from the mayoralty by Edward I for refusing to render any account of how the peace of the city was maintained, thus omitting to show proper respect to the king's justices at the tower. For the next thirteen years, London was governed by a warden appointed by the king, in the person of Sir Ralph de Sandwich, or John Le Breton. Sir Ralph de Sandwich is described in Letter Book A as Warden of the City, as well as Warden of Cordwainer Street. In 1297, a few months before the King restored the mayoralty to the citizens, John Le Breton, who had for many years acted as the King's Warden of the City in place of the mayor, is recorded as having summoned the aldermen and six representatives of each ward, and in their presence to have declared, inter alia, that the weighing machines for weighing corn at the mills should be abolished, and that bakers, convicted of fraud, should no longer be drawn on the hurdle, but suffer instead the punishment of the pillory. As soon as the citizens recovered their liberties and Le Breton ceased to be warden, Lewales was again elected to the chair. The Charter of Restitution of the City's Liberties bears date 12th of April, 26 Edward I, 1299, and it is preserved at the Guildhall. The particulars of the various stages of these proceedings are set out fully in the city's records. The writ was sent to the late warden on the 5th of April, and the notification to the citizens took place on the 9th. Lewales was elected and admitted by the king at Fulham on the 16th. The king issued a writ to the barons of the Exchequer from York, notifying the restitution of the city's liberties on the 28th of May, and a proclamation followed. The day after the mayor was sworn, he was compelled by business of his own to proceed at once to Lincoln, and during his absence, his official duties were committed to William de Betoyne and Geoffrey de Norton. It is very important to bear in mind that the mayors of London, besides holding a very onerous office, were men of great distinction. They held rank outside the city, and naturally took their place among the rulers of the country. They were mostly representatives of the landed interest, as well as merchant princes, but sometimes, as already stated, the mayor sided with the populace in opposition to the views of his own compeers. Bishop Stubbs described the struggles between the magnates and the commons, and shows how Thomas Fitz Thomas favoured the latter. Quote, in 1249, when the mayor and aldermen met the judges at the temple for a conference on rights claimed by the abbot of Westminster, the populace interfered, 
declaring that they would not permit them to treat without the participation of the whole commoner. In 1262, Thomas Fitzthomas, the mayor, encouraged the populace to claim the title of commoner civitatis and to deprive the aldermen and magnates of their rightful influence. By these means, he obtained a re-election by the popular vote in 1263, the voices of the aldermen being excluded. In 1264 to 1265, he obtained a reappointment, but his power came to an end after the Battle of Evesham. End quote. To pass on to the 14th century, we learn that in 1326, Queen Isabel sent a letter to the citizens permitting them to elect a mayor, as in the days before the Eta of 1321. They elected Richard de Betoyne, whom the barons had that day appointed warden of the tower conjointly with John de Guizors. Sometimes the sovereign, when he went abroad, endowed the mayor with considerable powers for the preservation of peace. This was the case in 1340 when Andrew Aubrey, the mayor, acted on the authority of Edward III. A conflict had taken place in the streets of the city between the Skinners and the Fishmongers, which the mayor attempted to stop. John de Hansard, a fishmonger, brandishing a drawn sword, seized Aubrey by the throat and offered to strike him, while John Le Brewer wounded one of the city sergeants. The delinquents were at once seized, carried to Guildhall, arraigned, found guilty, condemned to death, and beheaded in cheap. When the king heard of this bold proceeding, he immediately wrote to the mayor, warmly approving of his conduct, congratulating him on his spirit and adopting and ratifying the deed. Quote, si vous en trouvons très bon gré et votre fait acceptons et les ratifions. End quote. Sir William Walworth, the most famous of mayors, died in 1385 after a full and strenuous life. He is said to have suppressed usury in the city, and we have seen how important a figure he was during Wat Tyler's insurrection. He was a prominent member of the Fishmongers' Company and improved the old church of St. Michael's, Crooked Lane, in which parish he lived, adding the Fishmongers' Isle. Footnote. This church was destroyed in the Great Fire and rebuilt after the designs of Sir Christopher Wren. It was cleared away in 1831 to make way for the approaches to the new London Bridge. End of footnote. The end of the 14th century was, perhaps, the most stirring period in the history of the London municipality. There was a deadly feud between the leaders, who were men of strong character, endued with courage to carry out their views to the extreme. These feuds were no matters of merely local interest, but the incidents were followed with the greatest attention by the court and the whole country. The feuds arose from the increased power of the livery companies and the antagonism between the victualling and clothing trades. This division existed in most of the towns of the land, but the battle was fought out with deadly effect in the city of London. Walworth, a fishmonger, was the chief of the victualling party, but the two prominent leaders of the two parties were Nicholas Brember and John of Northampton. Doubtless the victualling companies had obtained a preponderating influence, and it is recorded that at one time sixteen of the aldermen belonged to the grocers' company, of which Brember was a member. When John of Northampton, a draper, was elected mayor in 1381, in succession to Walworth, he set himself to crush the victualling party. The act of Edward II having been evaded, another was passed in 1382, 6 Richard II, by which it was ordained that, quote, no victualler shall execute a judicial place in a city or town corporate, end quote. He forced Sir John Philippot, a public-spirited man and ex-mayor, but a friend of Walworth's and of the King's, to resign his aldermanry. On the 7th of November 1382, John Filiol, a fishmonger, was brought before the mayor and alderman on a charge of having, quote, said that John Northampton, the mayor, had falsely and maliciously deprived the fishmongers of their bread, end quote. For this offence, Filiol was adjudged to be, quote, imprisoned at Newgate in a place then called Bacardo for one year then next ensuing, unless he should deserve more extended favour in the meantime. End quote. 
On the 6th of December, John Filio, quote, was liberated at the instance of his friends on the surety of William Naufreton and others, end quote. When the charge was made against Filio, Richard Fifide was one of those questioned on the subject, and he, quote, said that he and all the other fishmongers of London were bound to put their hands beneath the very feet of Nicholas Eckstone for his good deeds and words in behalf of the trade aforesaid. End quote. John of Northampton was mayor for two years and had held the office of sheriff in 1377, MP for the city, 1378. He was head of John of Gaunt's supporters and a prominent follower of Wycliffe in London. He was leader of the party which sought to gain the favour of the populace and he encouraged the citizens to set at naught the jurisdiction of their bishop. He would probably have been returned again in October 1383 as the champion of cheap food if the king had not carried the election of Bremba by force. Bremba was the chief supporter of Richard II in the city, and he was the king's financial agent in 1381. He was first elected mayor in 1377, and at the Parliament of Gloucester in 1378, Thomas of Woodstock, the king's uncle, demanded his impeachment as mayor. From 1379 to 1386, Bremba was one of the two collectors of customs for the Port of London, with Chaucer for his controller. He was MP for London in 1383. When he succeeded Northampton in 1383, he set himself to undo the evil caused by the action of his predecessor. Northampton was arrested in 1384 when returning from a riotous demonstration at Whitefriars. He was tried at Reading before the council over which the king presided. After a brief imprisonment, the condemned man was brought up for a fresh trial before Chief Justice Tresillian in the Tower of London and was imprisoned in Tintagel Castle, Cornwall. Bremba was also opposed to Nicholas Twyford, who would probably have been elected mayor but for the high-handed proceedings of Bremba. Twyford's party was confident of victory and shouted at the election, Twyford, Twyford. But when the voting commenced, the soldiers placed by Bremba behind the arras in the Guildhall rushed out and drove Twyford's followers from the building. Bremba's party were allowed to remain and they carried the election for their candidate. It is worthy of note that during Bremba's mayoralty in 1378, Nicholas Twyford, one of the sheriffs, was brought up for contumacy towards the mayor and punished for the same. There had been a conflict in Cheapside between the goldsmiths and the pepperers, grocers, and John Wurzel, one of the sheriff's suite, was brought before the mayor as a principal mover in the strife. Twyford refused to do the mayor's behests as to the imprisonment of his follower after arrest. With the fall of the king, Bremba also fell, and there was a revolution in the government of the city as well as that of the country. Northampton was released from Tintagel Castle and restored to his property, and Bremba was tried for his life, condemned to death, and executed in the tower in February 1388. The companies who petitioned for Bremba's punishment were mercers, cordwainers, and eight others, all opposed to the victualling trades. In 1387 a proclamation was made in the city by the king's command, forbidding, on pain of death and forfeiture of goods, all true lieges of London to speak evil of the king and queen. The issuing of this proclamation in the city formed one of the charges of high treason against Bremba and his followers. In the same year, 1387, a book of civic regulations called Jubile, promulgated by John de Northampton and his party, was ordered to be burnt. Mr. Riley refers to the petitions in Parliament for 1386 to 1387, where we learn from the petition of the Cordwainers against Nicholas Bremba and his adherents that in this book of Le Jubile, quote, were comprised all the good articles pertaining to the good governance of the said city, and that Nicholas Eckstone, the mayor, and all the aldermen and good commons of the city had sworn for ever to maintain them, to the honour of God and the profit of the common people but that the said Nicholas Eckstone and his accomplices have burnt it without consent of the good commons of the city, to the annihilation of many good liberties, franchises, and customs of the city. End quote. The feuds of those days continued to agitate the city for some years, but at last 
the differences between the various trades cooled down somewhat. In 1391, however, a proclamation was issued that, quote, no person shall speak or give his opinion as to either Nicholas Bramber or John Northampton, end quote, on pain of imprisonment for a year and a day. The preamble is as follows, quote, whereas many dissensions, quarrels, and false reports have prevailed in the city of London as between trade and trade, person and person because of diverse controversies lately moved between Nicholas Brember, Knight, and John Northampton, of late mayors of the same city, who were men of great power and estate, and had many friendships and friends within the same, to the great peril of the same city, and maybe all of the realm. End quote. The names of many other mayors who have conferred distinction on their office might be mentioned here, but the space at our disposal will not allow of any statement of the claims to honour of these men who have made their mark in the history of London. It is a curious fact that we have no authority whatever for fixing a date for the first use of the title Lord Mayor, and there can be little doubt that it was originally assumed without any positive right. Dr. Sharp thinks that possibly the expression Domino Mayor, strictly Sir Mayor, may account for the origin of the Lord Mayor's title. A claim has been set up for Thomas Legg, Mayor the second time in 1354, that he was the first Lord Mayor, but there is positively no authority whatever for this claim, although it is boldly stated that he was created Lord Mayor by Edward III in this year. One point is worthy of special attention, although it does not throw any actual light on the matter. Bishop Stubbs says that the Mayor of York was known as Lord Mayor in 1389. Richard II had, in that year, presented his own sword to the Mayor, who was thenceforward known as the Lord Mayor, and in 1393 he had given the Lord Mayor a mace. If this were so, we can scarcely believe that Londoners, who had always been very tenacious of their pre-eminent position, would be content to allow their chief magistrate to continue without a title possessed by the Mayor of York. Still, there is not the slightest evidence that the title of Lord Mayor was used in London at this early period, and it is possible that Bishop Stubbs' statement is too definite. There is no doubt that the title Lord Mayor was used at an early date in York, but the prefix Lord was not always applied, and as late as 1565, there is reference in the Chamberlain's account book, quote, to Mr. John Bean, Mayor, end quote. A correspondence of some interest was printed in the Times in November and December 1901 on this point, but although Legg's claim was disproved, few, if any, positive facts were brought forward. The most satisfactory letter was one from Mr. W. H. St. John Hope of the Society of Antiquaries, who, as a result of a search in the city books, gave some definite information as to the use of the title. Quote, Down to about 1540, the chief magistrate was invariably styled mayor. There are, however, instances as early as 1519 where he is referred to as my lord mayor, but seemingly in the same way as we speak of my lord bishop or my lord the king, for the same entry that refers to him as my lord mayor now being, continues, as well as all other mayors, his successors. After 1540, the use of the term Lord Mayor becomes general. E.g., 1542, every Lord Mayor's house. 1545, the Lord Mayors of the same city. 1546, the Lord Mayor, etc. End quote. We have seen how important was the office of mayor in medieval times, and how like a king the holder's dignity was upheld. The mayor has certain very remarkable privileges which prove the high esteem in which he was held by the sovereign. These privileges are of considerable antiquity, and have not yet been traced to their source. The four principal are 1. The closing of Temple Bar to the sovereign. 2. The mayor's position in the city where he is second only to the king. 3. His summons to the Privy Council on the accession of a new sovereign. Four his position of butler at the coronation banquets. 1. The closing of Temple Bar to the Sovereign The gates of Temple Bar were invariably closed by the city authorities whenever the sovereign had occasion to enter the city. 
A herald sounded a trumpet before the gate. Another herald knocked. A parley ensued. The gates were then thrown open and the mayor, for the time being, presented the sword of the city to the sovereign, who graciously returned it to the mayor. The earliest record of this custom is connected with Queen Elizabeth's visit to St. Paul's to return thanks for the defeat of the Spanish Armada. But evidently the custom must be one of great antiquity, and probably in the case of the early kings, it was carried out at one of the city gates long before the bars of the libraries were thought of, although no records have come down to us. Stowe's account of the proceedings in his Annals is as follows. Quote, Over the gate of the Temple Bar were placed the weights of the city, and at the same bar the Lord Mayor and his brethren the Alderman in Scarlet received and welcomed Her Majesty to her city and chamber, delivering to her hands the scepter, which after certain speeches had, Her Highness re-delivered to the Mayor, and he again taking his horse, bare the same before her. The companies of the city in their liveries stood in their rails of timber, covered by blue cloth, all of them saluting Her Highness, as she proceeded along to Paul's church. End quote. 2. The Mayor's Position in the City None of the privileges connected with the Mayor's office has been so jealously guarded as the one upon which is founded the claim to the Mayor's supremacy in the City of London, where the Sovereign only takes precedence of him. In Riley's Memorials, there is an extract from Letter Book 1, 1415, which refers to Henry V's speech on the contemplated invasion of France and the seat of honour accorded to the mayor, in presence of the Archbishop of Canterbury and the King's brothers. When these notables met together, diligent counsel was held as to the order in which they ought to sit, and, quote, the lords agreed together among themselves to the effect that the mayor, in consideration of the reverence and honour due to our most excellent lord the king, of whom he is the representative in the city, should have his place, when sitting, in the middle, and that the said lords of Canterbury and Winchester should be seated on his right hand, and John, Humphrey, and Edward on the left, upon seats arranged for them, these to make declaration on behalf of our said Lord the King. End quote. The actual right to preeminence was seldom challenged in the city, but there were certain places which were supposed to be outside the mayor's jurisdiction, such as the inns of court, where misunderstandings were frequently taking place. A very interesting instance is given in Gregory's Chronicle, and it is well worth quoting here for the striking light it throws upon the dignity of the office. Quote, this year, 1465, about midsummer, at the royal fest of the sergeants of the coif, the mayor of London, Matthew Philip, was desired to be at that fest. And at dinner time he come to the fest with his officers, agreeing and according unto his degree. For within London he is next unto the king in all manner thing. And in time of washing, the Earl of Worcester was taken before the mayor and set down in the middis of the high table. And the mayor, seeing that his place was occupied, hilled him content, and went home again without meat or drink or any thonk. But reward him he did, as his dignity required of the city and took with him the substance of his brethren the alderman to his place, and was set and served also son as any man could devise, both of signet and of other delicacies enow, that all the house marvelled how well all ting was done in so short a time, and prayed all men to be merry and glad it should be amended another time. Then the officers of the fest, full evil ashamed, informed the maesters of the fest of this mishap that is befall. And they, considering the great dignity and costis and change that longed unto the city, and anon send unto the mayor a present of meat, bread, wine, and many diverse subtleties. But when they that come with the presenters saw all the gifters, and the service that was at the board, he was full sore ashamed that should do the message, for the present was not better than the service of meters was before the mayor, and throughout the high table. But his demeaning was so that he had love and thunk for his message, and a great reward withal. And this the worship of the city was kept, and not lost for him. I trust that never hit shall by the grace of God. End quote. 
Another and a later difficulty with the lawyers is recorded by Pepys on March the 3rd, 1668 to 1669. In order to understand the cause of contention, it is necessary to bear in mind that within the city the mayor's sword was held up before him, but outside it was held down. Quote, Meeting Mr. Bellwood, did hear how my Lord Mayor, Sir William Turner, being invited this day to dinner at the readers at the temple, and endeavouring to carry his sword up, the students did pull it down, and forced him to go and stay all the day in a private counsellor's chamber, until the reader himself could get the young gentleman to dinner, and then my Lord Mayor did retreat out of the temple by stealth, with his sword up. This do make great heat among the students, and my Lord Mayor did send to the king. End quote. On Sir William Turner's complaint, the king agreed to have the case argued before him in council, but after hearing the evidence, his majesty thought it best to suspend the declaration of his pleasure until the right and privilege should be determined by law, and apparently the question remains unsettled to this present day. A note may here be made of the mayor's position in the city as the chief of the military forces within his jurisdiction, with the right of forbidding the entry of troops without his sanction. Quote, the third regiment of foot, raised in 1665, known by the ancient title of the Old Buffs, have the privilege of marching through London with drums beating, colours flying, which the city disputes, not only with all other corps, but even with the king's guards going on duty to the tower. End quote. Major R. Donkin, Military Collections. 3. The Mayor's Summons to the Privy Council on the Accession of a New Sovereign. This is intimately connected with the claim of the city to a voice in the election of the king, which found practical expression even before the conquest. There can be no doubt that in medieval times the support of London was eagerly sought for in cases of disputed succession. During the 19th century, it was the custom to belittle the mayor and corporation, and Lord Macaulay in his history ignores the considerable influence of the city in securing the succession of his hero William III to the throne. At the councils held on the accession of Queen Victoria and King Edward VII, the respective Lord's Mayor, although summoned, were not allowed to remain to the meeting of the council. Little has been written upon this very important privilege of the Lord Mayor, but its consideration opens up a very remarkable constitutional question which requires very careful investigation. There ought to be sufficient information available to settle the question. On the accession of his present majesty, the Lord Mayor, the late Mr. Alderman Green, afterwards Sir Frank Green, baronet, was invited to sign the proclamation immediately after the royal family the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Lord Chancellor and his colleagues' signatures following his lordships. It is said that the great Duke of Wellington laid great stress upon the attendance of the Lord Mayor, and it was supposed that as the death of the Sovereign cancelled the appointments of court officials, the Lord Mayor, who continued in office, was an official of considerable importance on the occasion of the accession of a new Sovereign. The continuance of court appointments is now settled by an Act of Parliament. 4. The Mayor's Position at the Coronation Banquets The privilege of assisting the Chief Butler at the coronations of the Kings of England, accorded to the citizens of London, appears to date back before the appointment of a Mayor. Dr. Sharp, referring to the double coronation of Richard I, writes, quote, His first coronation had taken place at Westminster, 3rd of September, 1189, soon after his accession, and the citizens of London had duly performed a service at the coronation banquet, a service which even in those days was recognised as an ancient service, namely that of assisting the chief butler, for which the mayor was customarily presented with a gold cup and ewer. The citizens of the rival city of Winchester performed on this occasion the lesser service of attending to the viands. The second coronation, taking place at Winchester, 17th of April, 1194, and not at Westminster, the burgesses of the former city put in a claim to the more honourable service over the heads of the citizens of London, 
and the latter only succeeded in establishing their superior claim by a judicious bribe of 200 marks. End quote. Andrew Bockerell, mayor in the year 1236, 21 Henry III, claimed to serve as butler at the coronation of Eleanor, daughter of Raymond Berengar IV, Count of Provence, Queen of Henry III, but his claim was set aside on this occasion by the king's command. In the remarkable record of the court of claims held before the coronation of Richard II, over which John of Gaunt presided as high steward, the claim of the mayor and citizens is fully set forth. The king, quote, willed and decreed that the citizens of the said city should serve in the hall of bottlery helping the chief butler, while the king himself sat at table on the day of his coronation. And when the same our lord the king, after dinner, entered his chamber and asked for wine, the said mayor should serve our said lord the king with a bowl of gold, and afterwards should receive that bowl with the ewer appertaining to the same bowl as a gift from the king. End quote. End of chapter 8, part 2. End of section 16. Section 17 of The Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lowley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 8 The Governors of the City, Part 3. At the coronation of Henry VI, 6th sixth, sixth of November 1429, William Estfield, the recently elected mayor, received the customary gold cup and ewer used on the occasion, which he afterwards bequeathed to his grandson. The latest instance of this jealously guarded privilege occurred at the coronation of George IV, July the 19th, 1821. The claim to this honourable service in the cases of the coronations of William IV and Queen Victoria was not made because no banquet took place on these occasions. In the case of the coronation of His Present Majesty, the claim was excluded from the consideration of the Court of Claims under the Royal Proclamation. The terms of the judgment on a further claim is as follows. Quote, the Court considers and adjudges that the Lord Mayor has by usage a right, subject to His Majesty's pleasure, to attend the Abbey during the coronation and bear the crystal mace. End quote. It will be seen that of these four special privileges, two relate to the mayor's position in the city and two to his position outside the city. The pageants connected with the election of the mayor are of great antiquity, but we have little information respecting the earlier ones. It is a tradition that when the mayoralty was granted by the king, a stipulation was made that the mayor should be presented for approval either to the king or his justiciar, and the processions then commenced. In 1415, the mayor proceeded to Westminster on horseback, but in 1453, Sir John Norman, the mayor, was infirm, and he introduced the custom of making the progress from London to Westminster by barge. This continued till the horseback procession was revived in 1657, much to the disgust of the London watermen. Even when the water procession was the regular practice, the procession on horseback to the Guildhall and then to the waterside for embarkation took place. No Lord Mayor in a city procession used a coach before 1712, and then only an ordinary one. The present state coach was built in 1757. Sir John Shah, Mayor in 1482, was the first to give the annual banquet in the Guildhall. Previously, the feast had taken place either at Grocer's Hall or some other convenient place. The practice of dining at the Guildhall did not become general until 1501, when alterations were made in the kitchen, and the requisite offices having been added, the series of annual banquets was commenced there. There was no feeling of contempt of trade in the Middle Ages, and the merchant princes of London were held in high esteem. The custom of ridiculing the city and its rulers did not then exist, but it seems probable that it first came into being in the reign of Elizabeth. Richard Johnson's Nine Worthies of London, 1592, 
contains the praise of the worthies, written by the author in a mock heroic style. Of the nine, four were mayors, namely Sir William Walworth, 1374-1380, Sir Henry Pritchard, Picard, 1356, Sir William Sevenoak, 1418, and Sir William White, 1553. Most of the mayors of the Middle Ages were men of birth and position, and it is difficult to understand how it was that the popular idea of a poor boy coming up to London penniless, making his way here, and eventually rising to be mayor, first came into existence. The elaboration of this idea in the chapbook Life of Sir Richard Whittington is entirely opposed to the facts of the case. Alderman the consideration of the actual position of the alderman in the government of London is one of great difficulty, and Mr. Round's discovery of the oath of the commune in which aldermen are not mentioned has made it difficult to conjecture when it was that they took their natural place as the advisers of the mayor. The title alderman is a survival of the Saxon period, as is also that of sheriff, but the duties of the holders of the office have frequently been changed. The word alderman was a generic term as well as the distinctive title of a special officer. King Alfred appointed an alderman over all London, and the chief officer of the various guilds was originally known as an alderman. The various wards were each presided over by an alderman from an early period, but, as already noted, we cannot fix the date when they were united as a court of aldermen. Bishop Stubbs writes, quote, the governing body of London in the 13th century was composed of the mayor, 25 aldermen of the wards, and two sheriffs. All these were elective officers. End quote. The difficulty is that although aldermen were undoubtedly elected as the heads of wards, they are not referred to as the colleagues of the mayor until the very end of this century. In March 1298 to 1299, letters were sent from, quote, the mayor and commune of the city of London, to the Echevin, Jurat, and commonalty of the town of Bourges, Bruges, to the provost, bailiffs, and commonalty of the town of Caen, and to the provost, Echevin, and commonalty of the city of Comorac, possibly Cambrai. End quote. Although the official form of the mayor and commune was continued until the end of the 13th century, and it was not until early in the 14th century that the form Mayor, Alderman and Common Council came into existence, there is sufficient evidence to show that the Alderman and Common Council before that time were acting with the Mayor as governors of the city. As already quoted from Bishop Stubbs, that authority describes the Alderman as assistance of the Mayor as early as 1249. At all events, in the record of the election of Alderman in 1293, they are specially described as elected for the government of the city. In 1299, 27 Edward I, quote, It was agreed by Henry Legales, mayor, and the alderman that Strago, the sweeper of litter in the ward of Cheap, should be taken and imprisoned until, etc., because he, the said Strago, had scandalised the alderman by saying that they take the money of the commonalty at the Guildhall under pretext of wardship of orphans, and then waste such money for their own profit. End quote. In consequence of these unfounded charges, Strago was committed to the ton. There are, in Riley's memorials about this date, several other references to Alderman acting with the mayor. Thus, on the 14th of September 1301, quote, Walter Swan appeared before Sir Elias Russell, Mayor of London, and other Aldermen then present. End quote and in December 1310, Roger de Ure, having insulted and assaulted Richard de Gloucester, alderman, the two parties, quote, appeared in the Guildhall before Sir Richard de Refham, the mayor, and the alderman, end quote. In 1311, 4th Edward II, the form of description of the governors was, quote, the mayor, alderman, and the common council of the city, end quote. From this time, the general form was either this or, quote, the mayor, alderman, and commonalty, end quote. 
It is necessary, however, to mention that a congregation of mayor and aldermen is referred to in Fitz Aylwin's Assize of 1189. The title of Echevin, as applied to a governor of the city, is at present only known to us as used in the oath of the commune, found by Mr. Round, and it may therefore have had a very short existence. It is possible that aldermen were elected on to the mayor's council under the title of Echevins. This, however, is not the opinion of Mr. Round, who is inclined to believe that the body of Echevins became, in course of time, the court of common council. The whole question is at present one of great difficulty, and I only state the facts here without venturing to express any confident opinion until more evidence is forthcoming. We may be allowed to think that too great an importance has been ascribed to the position of the early aldermen in connection with their wards. It is generally affirmed that the aldermen were hereditary owners of the various wards on account of the fact that the wards were named after them, an instance of which practice remains in Farringdon, Bassishaw and Basingshall. There is no evidence of this proprietorship, and it seems improbable on the face of it. Mr. Raum believes that what an alderman inherited can only have been the aldermanry of his ward, like, he suggests, an hereditary sheriff. Mr. Badley writes that, quote, Early in 1276 we find mention made of the ward of Henry de Froick within the gate, i.e. Cripplegate, and ten years later, circa 1285, he figures in the earliest list of aldermen extant in the city's records as aldermen of the same ward. End quote. At the election of aldermen in 1291, 19 Edward I, 16 of the wards were named after the aldermen and 8 after places, the latter being the wards of Cheap, Castle Baynard, Whalebrook, Dugate, Bridge, Port Soken, Vintry, and Bassishaw. At the election two years afterwards, 1293, all the wards were named with their proper names and not after the aldermen. The ward of Ludgate and Newgate presented Nicholas de Fanden, it being styled in the previous list, quote, the ward of William de Fanden, end quote. Many of the same names are found in the two lists, but they represent different individuals of the same family. The preamble to the list of elections in 1293 is of considerable interest. Quote, be it remembered that on Tuesday before the Feast of St. Botolph, 21 Edward I, in the presence of Sir John Le Breton, Warden of London, the whole commonalty of the city aforesaid was assembled, viz. from each ward the wealthier and wiser men, who each by their several wards elected for themselves aldermen freely of good will and of their full consent, and the aldermen so elected, they presented to the warden aforesaid in this form that all and singular the things which the aforesaid aldermen of their wisdom and discretion shall do and ordain for the government of the city and the maintenance of the king's peace, in conjunction with the warden and their superiors for the time being, shall be straightly observed, and shall be held ratified and confirmed before other provisions touching the commonalty without any challenge or opposition in the future. And each ward elected its alderman, for whom it would answer as to all his acts affecting the city, the commune, Communam, and its estate. End quote. It will be seen from the above that the election of aldermen was only in the hands of a few of the quote, wealthier and wiser men end quote, of the wards, but later on the electors were freemen of the city, quote, paying Scott and bearing lot. End quote. There was much difference of practice in the election of aldermen. Various orders were issued from time to time and some of them fell out of use. In 1377 it was ordered that aldermen should be elected annually, as appears from the following entry in Letter Book H. Quote, 51 Edward III. Precept, Bill, for the men of each ward to meet on Saturday the 7th of March, and elect an alderman other than the sitting alderman, and to have the name of the alderman so elected endorsed on the bill at the Guildhall on the Feast of St. Gregory next, at eight o'clock at the latest, under penalty. End quote. This precept was elaborated in an ordinance made on Friday the 6th of March, 51 Edward III, with the assent of the mayor, aldermen, and diverse representations of the livery companies. It was ordered that, quote, 
aldermen removed for good and reasonable cause shall not be open for re-election, but that those who go out of office on St. Gregory's Day and have not misconducted themselves may be re-elected after the interval of one year. End quote. In 1384, the rule was modified so as to allow an alderman to be re-elected for his ward at the expiration of his year of office without any interval. Letter Book H. In 1394, the ordinance respecting annual elections was repealed by the king, and aldermen were henceforward elected for life. 6th of March, 17 Richard II. Quote, and have also ordained for the honour and greater increase of the good government of our said city, that they who should be chosen aldermen of our same city should not be removed out of their offices during their lives, unless for just, reasonable, and notable cause. End quote. Shortly after this, an order of the mayor, aldermen, and commonalty was issued which took away the right of the wards of directly electing their aldermen. A ward was only allowed to nominate two persons, of whom the mayor and aldermen were to choose one. Five years later, that is in 1402, the number of names to be nominated was raised to four, and in 1420 this order was reaffirmed. Footnote. In 1711, a return was made to the practice of nominating two persons only, followed in 1714 by, quote, an act for reviving the ancient manner of electing aldermen, 13 Anne, which restored to the inhabitants of their ancient rights and privileges of choosing one person only to be their alderman. End, quote. End of footnote. Distinct rank was accorded to aldermen. Thus the common seal of the corporation bears the inscription Sigillum Baronum Londoniarum, and we are told by John Carpenter in Liber Albus, quote, it is a matter of experience that even since the year of our Lord, 1350, at the sepulture of Alderman, the ancient custom of interment with baronial honours was observed. For in the church where the Alderman was about to be buried, a person appeared upon a caparisoned horse, arrayed in the armour of the deceased, bearing a banner in his hand, and carrying upon him his shield, helmet, and the rest of his arms, along with a banner, as is still the usage at the sepulture of lords of baronial rank. But by reason of the sudden and frequent changes of the alderman, and the repeated occurrence of pestilence, this ceremonial in London gradually died out and disappeared. End quote. When the poll tax of 1379 was imposed, the mayor was assessed as an earl, and the alderman as barons. On August the 12th, 1417, a royal mandate, 5 Henry V, was issued to the mayor enjoining that the alderman shall reside within the city. Quote, we do therefore will and do command and charge you that you cause your letters to be addressed unto each one of the said aldermen so absent from our said city, charging them strictly thereby on our behalf that they return unto our said city and do tarry and remain there to support you and to administer counsel and assistance in all that may touch the preservation of the said peace and good governance of our said city. End quote. This was an irksome regulation, and in the charter of Edward IV, the aldermen were released from the obligation. Quote, it is well known and manifest that those of the said city which are elected aldermen have sustained great cost and pains for the time they make their abode and residence in the same city and for that cause oftentimes do leave their possessions and places in the country, that therefore they and every of them may, without fear of unquietness or molestation, peaceably abide and tarry in such their houses and possessions, when they shall return thither for comfort and recreation's sake. End quote. It has sometimes been the fashion of the wits to gird at the aldermen and other city magnates, but although some of the names on the list may be of little account, there are many which are written on the page of history, and a large number of noble families owe their origin to famous aldermen. Sir Geoffrey Boleyn, mayor in 1457, was great-grandfather to Anne Boleyn, and therefore ancestor of Queen Elizabeth. Sir Thomas Canning, mayor in 1456, was ancestor of George Canning, Earl Canning, and Lord Stratford de Redcliffe. Sir William Loke, 
sheriff in 1548, the favourite of Henry VIII, who had a key of the king's private chamber so that he might come whenever he would, was the ancestor of John Locke, Lord Chancellor King, and the Earl of Lovelace. John Cowper, alderman in 1551, was the ancestor of Lord Chancellor Cowper and the poet William Cowper. Sir Edward Osborne was the ancestor of the Duke of Leeds. Among other distinguished men descended from aldermen may be mentioned Bacon, Beckford, Byron, Cromwell, Howe, Marlborough, Newcastle, Melbourne, Nelson, Palmerston, the two William Pitts, Raglan, Salisbury, and the Walpoles. Sheriffs The government of the city by Reeves dates back to a very early period of our history, and these Reeves were appointed by the king. When William the Conqueror demanded entrance to London, the joint governors were the bishop and the port reeve. How long before the conquest a port reeve had been appointed, and how long after his office was continued, we do not know. The sheriff, to some extent, took his place, but Henry I gave the city the right of appointing justiciars and sheriffs, and the justiciar, according to Mr. Round, took precedence of the sheriff. After the establishment of the commune and the appointment of a mayor, the sheriffs naturally lost much of their importance, and they became what they are styled in Liber Albus, quote, the eyes of the mayor, end quote. They often in early times were also called bailiffs. When Middlesex was infirm to London, the two sheriffs were equally sheriffs of London and Middlesex. There is one instance only in the city records of a sheriff of Middlesex being mentioned as distinct from the sheriffs, and this was in 1283 when Anctin de Betteville and Walter Le Blonde are described as sheriffs of London and Gerin as sheriff of Middlesex. Footnote by the Local Government Act of 1888, the citizens of London were deprived of all right of jurisdiction over the county of Middlesex, which had been expressly granted by various charters. End of footnote. This anomaly has not been explained, but Dr. Sharp remarks respecting a writ of 1308, quote, The King to the Sheriff of Middlesex, greeting, end quote, that this was, quote, presumably addressed to, and the return made by the sheriffs of London, acting as a sheriff of Middlesex according to custom. End quote. It was ordained and agreed in 1383, 7 Richard II, quote, that no person shall from henceforth be mayor in the said city if he have not first been sheriff of the said city to the end that he may be tried in governance and bounty before he attains such a state of the mayoralty. End quote. Mr. Badley has very clearly described the changes made at various times in the election of sheriffs, and I therefore quote from his book, quote, Until the commencement of the 14th century, the sheriffs were elected by the mayor, aldermen, and commonalty of the city. In 1301, an attempt was made to restrict the number of electors to twelve representatives of each ward, but this, like other subsequent attempts, proved unsuccessful. In 1387 is met with, for the first time, a new method of procedure. In that year, one of the sheriffs was elected by the mayor and the other by the commonalty, and this prerogative of the mayor for the time being to elect one of the sheriffs continued to be exercised with few, if any, exceptions down to 1638. End quote. This is the mode of election which is described in the Liber Albus. Quote, in the first place, the mayor shall choose, of his own free will, a reputable man, free of the city, to be one of the sheriffs for the ensuing year, for whom he is willing to answer as to one half of the firm of the city due to the king, if he who is so elected by the mayor shall prove not sufficient. But if the mayor elect him by counsel and with the assent of the alderman, they also ought to be answerable with him. And those who are elected for the common council themselves, and the others summoned by the mayor for this purpose, as before declared, shall choose another sheriff for the commonalty, for whom all the commonalty is bound to be answered as to the other half of the firm so due to the king, in case he shall prove not sufficient. And if any controversy arise between the commons as to the election, 
The matter is to proceed and be discussed. End quote. Footnote. Mr. Badley continues the account of the changes in the mode of election up to the present time. Quote, From 1642 to 1651, the mayor's claim to elect a sheriff was always contested. For the year 1652 and for some years afterwards, the mayor neither nominated nor elected a sheriff, but in 1662, when he would have elected one Bloodworth as sheriff, the commonalty claimed their right, although they accepted the mayor's nominee. The prerogative thus claimed by the mayor, although frequently challenged, was exercised for the most part by subsequent mayors down to 1674, when exception was taken to William Roberts, whom the mayor had formally nominated, according to a custom which is said to have arisen in the time of Elizabeth, by drinking to him at a public banquet. In the following year, and for some years later, the mayor exercised his prerogative of electing one of the sheriffs without opposition. In 1703, an act was passed declaring the right of election of sheriffs to be in the liverymen of the several companies of the city in Common Hall assembled. End quote. It was, however, lawful for the Lord Mayor to nominate for the office. Quote, By an act of 1748, the Lord Mayor might continue to nominate to the extent of nine persons in the whole. End quote. By an act of Common Council in 1878, the right of election to the office of sheriff was vested in the liverymen of the several companies of the city in Common Hall assembled. The Lord Mayor nominating one or more freemen, not exceeding three in the whole, for the shrievalty. End of footnote. Common Council We do not know when the Court of Common Council was first formed, but, as already stated, Mr. Round supposes it to have grown out of the body of Echevins brought into being on the granting of a commune. It seems probable that the two courts, that of Alderman and that of the Common Council, were formed about the same time, but it is remarkable that we have at present no definite information on the subject. Now that special attention is drawn to this matter, it is to be hoped that some facts settling the question may be forthcoming. The number of members of the Common Council varied greatly at different times, but the right to determine the number was indirectly granted by the Charter of Edward III, 1341, which enables the city to amend customs and usages which have become hard. The Preamble to an Act of Common Council, 8th of May, 1840, 3 Victoria, passed to reduce the total number of common council and to apportion more equally the members to the different wards, contains the following statement of its antiquity. Quote, Whereas from time whereof the memory of man runneth not to the contrary, there hath existed, and still doth exist within the city of London, a common council consisting of the mayor and aldermen of the said city, and certain citizens, being freemen of the said city, annually elected to be of the same council, and called the commons of the said city. And whereas, under and by virtue of the ancient charters, ordinances, statutes, and customs of the said city, the power of appointing and regulating the number of citizens to be, from time to time elected of the same common council hath, from time whereof the memory of man runneth not to the contrary, belonged, and still of right doth belong, to the mayor, aldermen, and commons of the said city. End quote. The Common Council were chosen by the wards until 1351, 25 Edward III, when certain companies appointed the Common Council. In 1376, 50 Edward III, an ordinance was made by the Mayor and Aldermen with the assent of the whole Commons, to the effect that the companies should select men with whom they were content, and none other should come to the election of mayors and sheriffs that the greater companies should not elect more than six, the lesser four, and the least two. Forty-seven companies nominated 156 members. In 1383 the right of election reverted to the wards, but was obtained again by the companies in 1467. Arms of London The arms of the City of London are simple and of great interest, consisting as they do of the Cross of St. George, with the sword of St. Paul in the Dexter Quarter. But unfortunately, an absurd popular blunder has been prevalent that the sword was really the dagger with which Sir William Walworth killed Wat Tyler. The history of these arms is fully set forth in Dewitt and Hope's 
corporation plate, and there illustrated with figures of the old common seal of London, and the first and second mayoralty seals. The facts as there set forth are shortly stated here. The old common seal is a fine example of the early part of the 13th century. Stowe, in his survey, dates it in 1224, and Gregory, in his chronicle, in 1227-1228. Mr. Hope says that the seal may well be of a date circa 1225, and that it certainly was in use in 1246. The obverse of the seal represents a figure of St. Paul with a sword in his outstretched right hand, and a banner of England in his left hand. Quote, the saint is represented as standing in the middle of the city over which he keeps guard. The spire of the cathedral church rises in front of him, and other steeples on each side. In front of all is the city wall with its ditch, with lofty central gateway and two lesser flanking towers or bastions. End quote. The legend is Sigillum Baronum Londoniarum. The first mayoralty seal bears the figures of St. Thomas of Canterbury and St. Paul with his sword. The legend is Sigillum Mayoratus London, and the date circa 1280. The second mayoralty seal, which was produced a century after the first one, is of very special interest. It bears seated figures of St. Thomas and St. Paul, and in base a shield of the city supported by two lions. The legend is Sigil Mayoratus Civitatus London. The record of the making of this seal in 1381 is found in letterbook K, and Mr. Hope's remarks on the value of this piece of evidence must be quoted entire. Quote, this seal is of special interest, not only from its being a dated example, but because it proves beyond doubt the absurdity of the silly notion that the object in the Dexter Chief of the City Arms is the sword or dagger wherewith Sir William Walworth slew Wat Tyler, instead of being, as it undoubtedly is, the sword of St. Paul. Wat Tyler was killed on June 15th, 1381, whereas the new seal of the mayoralty had been formally adopted on April 17th, two months before. This seal is also one of the earliest authorities for the city arms. Its silver matrix is still preserved at the mansion house, but in so worn a condition that little else than the deepest parts can be traced. It is only now used for mercantile documents going abroad. End quote. To return to the common seal, it may be noticed here that the original reverse had, quote, in base a view of the city somewhat resembling that on the obverse, surmounted by a segmental arch. On top of the arch, seated on a throne or chair of state, is a figure of St. Thomas of Canterbury with a cross and pall. End quote. In accordance with the famous proclamation of Henry VIII, November 16, 1538, which enacted that Thomas Becket should no longer quote, be esteemed, named, reputed, nor called a saint, but Bishop Becket, and that his images and pictures through the whole realm shall be put down, end quote, etc. It was enacted in 1539 that this reverse of the common seal should be destroyed. Quote, the beautiful reverse of the common seal, after doing duty for over three centuries, was therefore broken up, and presumably its silver used to make a new matrix. This is of the same size as its predecessor, but in accordance with the resolution, it bears for device simply the city arms, argent across gule, and in the dexter quarter the sword of St. Paul, with helm, mantling and crest, a dragon's wing expanded argent charged with a cross gule. The legend is, Londini defende tuos deus optime sives. End quote. In connection with the arms, it may be noticed that the supporters which are usually described as griffins are really dragons, in allusion to St. George. End of chapter 8. End of section 17. Section 18 of The Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 9. 
Officials of the City The chief of the officials of the City of London was, for many years after the conquest, the Castellan and Bannerer. When William the Conqueror obtained possession of London, he built a castle on the river at each end of the city to intimidate the Londoners. The tower was at the east end, and at the west end was what, according to Dugdale, was called at first the castle. This was placed under the charge of Baynard, one of the conqueror's followers, after whom it came to be known as Baynard's Castle. The hereditary office of Castellan was held by the family of Fitzwalter, by virtue of their possession of Baynard's Castle, the key of the city. The duties attached to this office are among the most important and interesting in the story of medieval London, and it is to be presumed that Baynard held the various privileges afterwards possessed by the family of Fitzwalter, but no notice of this is recorded. Robert Fitzrichard was the first baron by tenure. He is said to have been the younger son of Richard Fitzgilbert, ancestor of the Earls of Clare. He was steward to Henry I, from whom he obtained the barony of Dunmo, and the honour of the Soak of Baynard's Castle, both which had been forfeited to the crown in 1111 by reason of the felony of William, Baron of Dunmo, son of Ralph Baynard, the Norman associate of William the Conqueror, after whom the castle was named. In connection with this soak, Robert held the hereditary office of standard-bearer of the city, the duties of which will be stated further on. He died in 1134 and was succeeded by his son, Walter Fitzrobert. The latter's son was Robert Fitzwalter, the most famous member of the family, and the one who transmitted to his descendants the permanent surname of Fitzwalter. This Fitzwalter was styled, quote, Marshal of the Army of God and Holy Church, end quote. He was one of the twenty-five barons appointed to enforce the observance of Magna Carta obtained from King John. An, quote, Agreement, dated 15th to the 25th of June, 1215, between King John of the one part and Robert Fitzwalter, Marshal of the Army of God and of Holy Church in England, six earls and six barons named, and other earls, barons and freemen of the other part, end quote, is preserved in the public record office, and the following description of the document is given in the catalogue of manuscripts, etc., in the Museum of the Public Record Office, 1902. Quote, the earls, barons and others shall hold the city of London, saving the royal revenues, and the Archbishop of Canterbury shall hold the Tower of London, saving the liberties of the city, until the Feast of the Assumption in the seventeenth year of the reign. In the meanwhile, oaths shall be taken throughout England to twenty-five barons, as is contained in the Charter for the Liberties and Security of the Realm, and all things shall be done according to the said Charter. Otherwise the city and the tower shall be held as above, until all the said things shall be done. End quote. It is said in a note to this document that, quote, None of the thirteen persons who are thus entered into an agreement with the king are mentioned among those upon whose advice he granted the great charter. End quote. The third baron was himself in trade, and he owned wine ships. He received special privileges from John, and the story of that king's treatment of his daughter Matilda is supposed to be an unfounded tale. In the year 1215, the insurgent barons entered the city at Aldgate, largely owing to the assistance of Robert Fitzwalter, whose position was of a commanding character. He died in 1235. Walter Fitzwalter succeeded his father Robert, and died in 1257. He was succeeded by his son Robert Fitzwalter, the fifth baron. It is of the latter's duties and privileges that we possess an account, written by Robert Glover, Somerset Herald in the reign of Elizabeth, extracts from which are given by Dugdale in his Baronage of England, 1675. Quote, in time of war he should serve the city in manner following, viz. to ride upon a light horse with twenty men-at-arms on horseback, their horses covered with cloth or harness, unto the great door of St. Paul's Church, with the banner of his arms carried before him. And being come in that manner thither, the Mayor of London, together with the sheriffs and aldermen, to issue armed out of the church unto the same door on foot, with a banner in his hand, 
having the figure of St. Paul depicted with gold thereon, but the feet, hands, and head of silver, holding a silver sword in his hand. And as soon as he shall see the mayor, sheriffs, and aldermen come on foot out of the church, carrying such a banner, he is to alight from his horse and salute him as his companion, saying, Sir Mayor, I am obliged to come hither to do my service which I owe to this city. To whom the mayor, sheriffs, and aldermen are to answer, We give to you, as our banner-bearer for this city, this banner by inheritance of the city, to bear and carry to the honour and profit thereof to your power. Whereupon the said Robert and his heirs shall receive it into their hands, and the mayor and sheriffs shall follow him to the door and bring him an horse worth twenty pounds, which horse shall be saddled with a saddle of his arms, and covered with silk depicted likewise with the same arms. And they shall take twenty pounds sterling, and deliver it to the chamberlain of the said Robert for his expenses that day. End quote. Etc. There was a vacant ground opposite the great west door of St. Paul's where this interesting ceremony took place. The folk moots were held in the churchyard at the east end of the cathedral. In 1275, 3 Edward I, Robert Fitzwalter obtained license from the crown to convey Baynard Castle and the Tower of Montfichet to the Archbishop of Canterbury for the purpose of the foundation of the house and church of the Friars Preachers, or Blackfriars. In the following year, Edward I confirmed the grant of two lanes adjacent to, quote, Castle Baynard and the Tower of Montfichet for the purposes of enlarging the aforesaid place on condition that the said archbishop should provide the citizens with a more convenient way as he had now done. End quote. In 1277-1278, an alteration was made in the wall of the friary. When Sir Robert Fitzwalter conveyed Baynard Castle to the archbishop, he specially reserved all his rights and privileges in the following terms. Quote, Provided that by reason of this grant, nothing should be extinguished to him and his heirs which did not belong to his barony, but that whatsoever relating thereto as well in rents, landing of vessels and other liberties and privileges in the city of London or elsewhere without diminution, which to him, the said Robert, or to that barony, had anciently appertained, should be thenceforth reserved. End quote. We know very little of this tower of Montfichet, but it must have been closely connected with Baynard Castle. There is a reference to it and its owner in the Chronique de la Guerre entre les Anglois et les Écossois en 1173 et 1174 par Jordan Fantôme. Howlett's Chronicles of Stephen, Henry II, and Richard I, Rolls series. Quote, Gilbert de Montfichet has fortified his castle and says that the Clares are leagued with him. End quote. As Mr. Round points out to me, this reference to the Clares must relate to the proprietors of Baynard's Castle, who, as previously noted, were of the same family as the Clares. Walter Fitz Robert is also referred to in this metrical chronicle. The Barons Fitz Walter possessed many privileges in time of peace, which are set out by Dugdale, among which was the right of punishing by drowning at Woodwharf persons guilty of treason but it was as a constable of Barnard Castle that they enjoyed these privileges as well as the office of bannerer to the city of London. A beautiful seal inscribed Sigillum Roberti Filii Walteri was found at Stamford, Lincolnshire in the reign of Charles II and is the subject of a paper by John Charles Brooke of the Herald's College in Archaeologia. Quote, in this seal we see Fitzwalter's horse elegantly engraved and covered with trappings of his arms, so exquisitely represented that they evidently appear to be of a much finer texture than those commonly used, the muscles of the animal being seen under them, and as much as engraving can represent drapery appear to be silk, as described by Glover. And what is remarkable, his arms are carved on the rest behind the saddle, which is a rare instance, and evidently allude to that which the mare was to present to him. End quote. On the seal are represented the arms of Fitzwalter's second wife, Eleanor, daughter of Robert de Ferrers, Earl of Ferrers and Derby. She was married in 1298 and died in 1304. Therefore the date of the seal is fixed within six years. Mr. Brooke refers to another seal of Baron Fitzwalter which he used, 
28 Edward I, Anno 1300, and in which the dragon occurring in the former seal beneath the horse is used as a supporter. Robert Fitzwalter died in 1325, and in 1328 the wardship of his son John was granted by the mayor and alderman to his widow Joanna. In 1347, Sir John Fitzwalter still claimed to have franchise in the ward of Castle Baynard, but the city entirely repudiated the claim as, quote, altogether repugnant to the liberties of the city, end quote. He caused stocks to be set up in the ward of Castle Baynard and claimed to make deliverance of men there imprisoned. In consequence of this action, a conference was held by the mayor, aldermen, and commonalty at which, quote, it was agreed that the said Sir John Fitzwalter had no franchise within the liberty of the city aforesaid, nor is he in future to intermeddle with any plea in the Guildhall of London, or with any matters touching the liberties of the city. End quote. The recorder, the chief official of the city, is appointed for life. He was formally appointed by the city, but since the Local Government Act of 1888, he is nominated by the city and approved by the Lord Chancellor. His duties and his oath are recorded in the Liber Albus. In 1329, Gregory de Norton, the then holder of the office, obtained an increase in salary, 100 shillings yearly, as also his robe of the same pattern as the alderman's robes. The common sergeant was formally appointed by the city, but since 1888 by the Lord Chancellor. He is the recorder's principal assistant. The next great official is the town clerk, who is appointed by the common council and re-elected annually. John de Batakel, clerk of the city, is referred to in letter book A, and this is the first recorded mention of the office afterwards known as the common clerk, and later as town clerk. Next to the recorder, the town clerk was the chief officer in the local courts of law called the Hustings and the Mayor's Court. Among the distinguished men who have held the office, Two names stand out, viz. John Carpenter and William Dunthorne. Carpenter, town clerk in the reigns of Henry V and Henry VI, was elected in 1417. He was called also Secretary of the City, a title not applied to any other town clerk. He is best known as the compiler of the Liber Albus and as founder of the City of London School. Dunthorne's name, 1462, is associated with the Liber Dunthorne, which contains transcripts from the Liber Albus, Liber Customarum, letter books, etc. The Chamberlain, or Comptroller of the King's Chamber, is appointed by the livery. He was originally a King's officer, and the office was probably instituted soon after the conquest. It is mentioned in documents of the 12th century. On June 28, 1232, the office of, quote, King's Chamberlain of London, end quote, was granted for life to Peter de Rivalis. His duties and privileges, as stated in the grant, are very extensive and important. Quote, he shall have for life the custody of the king's houses at Southampton and the king's prize of wine there, custody of the king's jury of the Mint of England, end quote, and quote, all other things pertaining to the office of Chamberlain of London. End quote. By another grant of the same year, the said Peter, treasurer of Poitiers for life, was given the custody of the ports and coasts of England, saving the port of Dover. When the office is mentioned in 1275, it was combined with the offices of mayor and coroner. The functions of coroner were often exercised by the chamberlain and sheriffs, and when the chamberlain was called away from the city by the king, he appointed a deputy coroner. The office was sometimes held by the king's butler, to whom appertained the office of coroner. William Trent, a wine merchant of Bergerac, was appointed king's butler on the 25th of November 1301, 30 Edward I. He became also the king's chamberlain of the city and coroner of London. Andrew Horne, a fishmonger by trade who kept a shop in Bridge Street, held the office of chamberlain for several years. He was the compiler of Lieber Horn which contains charters, statutes, grants, etc. To him also has been attributed the authorship of the law treaties of medieval titles entitled The Mirror of Justice. He died in 1328. Many attempts were made by the citizens to get coronership into their own hands, 
and at last Edward IV sold the right to appoint a coroner of their own, independent of the king's butler, for seven thousand pounds. The remembrancer, or state amanuensis, is appointed by the common council. The office was held from 1571 to 1584 by a distinguished man, Thomas Norton, M.P., who was joint author with Thomas Sackville, Earl of Dorset, of the tragedy of Gorboduc. He left a manuscript on the ancient duties of the Lord Mayor and Corporation, an account of which was published by J. Payne Collier in Archaeologia. The Common Hunt was an official mentioned in the Liber Albus, where we learn that John Courtney was appointed to the office in 1417. The office was abolished in the year 1807. Of officers in immediate attendance on the mayor may be mentioned the sword-bearer and the sergeant at mace. The first notice of the office of sword-bearer occurs in the Liber Albus, 1419, and the first record in the minute books of the appointment of a sword-bearer is in 4 Henry the Sixth. 1426. Mr. Hope remarks that, quote, The absence of earlier notices is probably due to the fact that the sword-bearer was appointed, according to the entry in the Liber Alice, as proper costage du maire, and not at the cost of the city. End quote. The sword-bearer is remarkable on account of the distinctive head-covering or cap of maintenance which is appropriated to his office. It is not known when the City of London first possessed a mace or maces, but Mr. Hope refers to the Liber Customarum to prove that as early as 1252 there were sergeants who carried staves of some kind as emblems of authority. Quote, we know this from the claim put forth on the occasion of the Itter of the Pleas of the Crown held at the Tower in 1321, that the Mayor and citizens of London should have their own porter and usher and their own sergeants with their staves. As it was shown that the same claim had been successfully made in 1276 to 1277, and in 1252 it was allowed. End quote. Mr. Hope quotes from Letter Book F a record of the appointment of Robert Flambard as mace bearer in 1338, and from this it is clear that the office was not then a newly created one. For the due carrying on of the business of the corporation, several new offices have at various times been established but the foregoing are the officials who carried on the work of the city during the Middle Ages. Much of interest might have been added of these men, but it is only necessary here to refer to them generally as those to whom so much of the history of London was due. The chief business of the city has been carried on for many centuries in the Guildhall, which is of unknown antiquity. It is almost certain that the building was in existence on the same spot as early as the 12th century. It was rebuilt in 1411, and has been greatly altered at different times since then. The most interesting portion of the old building will be found in the extensive Gothic crypt. The open timber roof of the hall was not added until the alterations of 1866 to 1870 by the late Sir Horace Jones. End of chapter 9 End of section 18this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 10 Commerce and Trade, Part 1. The earliest trade recorded as carried on in the British Isles consisted of the exchange of tin with the Gauls and perhaps also with Phoenician traders. Under Roman rule, the agricultural and mineral resources of Britain were more fully developed. Julius Caesar praised the South Down mutton, and Rome was supplied with oysters, which came from Whitstable and Reculvers, Regulbium, and were carried through the river Stour, forming the western boundary of the island of Thanet, and were exported from Richborough, Rutupie. Corn was exported in large quantities, and Londinium, the principal port for trading with Gaul, was the centre of commerce. There is no notice of commerce during the early Anglo-Saxon period, but Bede, at the beginning of the 8th century, speaks of London as a great market which traders frequented by land or sea. The letter of protection for English pilgrims given to offer of Mercia by Charlemagne, A.D. 796, which refers to trade carried on by them, has been called 
quote, the first English commercial treaty, end quote. One remarkable fact is that this commerce was mainly in the hands of foreigners. London, in the early times, was mainly a city of foreigners. Hence, the jealousy of the natives, which grew in strength as time went on. Commerce greatly increased during the reign of Edgar, so that Ethelred, his son, deemed it time to draw up a code of laws to regulate the customs to be paid by the merchants of France and Flanders, as well as by the emperor's men. But the promulgation of the laws of Athelstan, A.D. 925 to 929, which ordained that a merchant who had made three sea voyages should be of right a thane, is proof of the small number as well as of the importance of such native traders. We learn from the colloquies of the abbot Elfric, 11th century, that most of the commodities imported into England were articles of luxury. The port of Dowgate was granted to the city of Rouen as early as Edward the Confessor's reign, and the right was afterwards confirmed. The confessor also gave a portion of where money acre within London, quote, with the wharf belonging to it, and with its market rights and places for merchandise, its stalls and shops, its rents and dues and rights, its toll and wharfage, end quote, to St. Peter's at Ghent, which grant was confirmed by William I, 1081. After the conquest, communication with Normandy naturally increased greatly. Rouen was particularly favoured, and was granted a monopoly of trade with Ireland and freedom of commerce in London. In the 12th century, silver was imported in exchange for meat, fish, and wool, which were all sent to the manufacturing districts of the Low Countries. Corn was sometimes exported, but not without a licence. The House or Guild of the Merchants of Almain, otherwise called the House of the Teutonics, was formed about the year 1169 though the Germans, under the name of Easterlings, are known to have traded here during the Saxon period. The guild flourished in London as the merchants of the steel yard till the time of Elizabeth, when their special privileges were abolished by royal decree. Hallam tells us that from the middle of the 12th to the 13th century, the traders of England became more and more prosperous. The towns on the southern coast exported tin and other metals in exchange for the wines of France. Those on the eastern coast sent corn to Norway, and the sink ports bartered wool against the stuffs of Flanders. The export of wool and the import of cloth were prohibited in 1261, and the prohibition was repeated in 1271. The cause of this prohibition may be illustrated by reference to a particular import, woad, which seems to show that a native woolen manufacture existed, although all the finer cloth came from Flanders. The restrictions originally imposed upon the woad merchants would not allow them a settlement in the city, nor permit them to store their woad, which they had to sell as best they could on the wharf where it was landed. In 1237, however, the merchants of Amiens, Corby, and Nesle were allowed, by special arrangement, greater freedom in the disposal of their woad and other wares. In the end, the woad merchants settled in Cannon Street, Candlewick Street the very centre of the cloth trade in London, as Lydgate tells us in his London Lickpenny. Quote, then I went forth by London stone, throughout all Canwick Street, draper's much cloth offered me a known. End quote. Footnote. No woollen cloth was allowed to be dyed black except with woad. The whole history of the cultivation and use of woad is one of great interest. It was cultivated in England from the earliest times, and the trade was ruined by the indigo growers, as they in turn have been ruined in our own day by the manufacture in Germany of synthetic indigo. End of footnote. London was the seat of trade in Eastern luxuries, which became known largely through the influence of the Crusades. Silks, fruits, spices, and Greek wines were brought here by the Italian fleet which, after 1317, regularly visited England. In the 13th and 14th centuries, the importance of our commerce is shown by the appearance of regulations for its promotion in the Statute Book. The Statute of Merchants is dated 1283 to 1285, and the Carta Mercatoria, 1303. The trade with Bordeaux was very active, 
and largely carried on by English ships from London, Bristol, Dover, and Hull. Wool, herrings, lead, copper, and tin were taken out in these ships, also pilgrims as passengers. The ships returned to England laden with wine and corn when the home production was short. In 1350, 141 ships carried 13,429 tons of wine from Bordeaux to England. English merchants travelled largely and made their appearance at the great continental fairs. As commerce increased, the enemies of commerce also increased, and we find therefore that the Thames and the open sea were infested by bands of pirates. Soon after pirates had made a successful descent upon Scarborough, John Philippot, a prominent Londoner, set himself to break up the conspiracy. He fitted out a fleet at his own expense and, putting to sea, succeeded in capturing the ringleader, a feat which rendered him so popular as to excite the jealousy of the Duke of Lancaster and other nobles. His fellow citizens showed their appreciation of his character by electing him to succeed Bremba in the mayoralty in October 1387. How serious this danger really was may be seen from the fact that not even the king was safe. When Henry IV, in order to escape the pestilence raging in London, crossed from Queensborough in Sheppey to Lee in Essex, on his way to Plashy, though convoyed by Lord Camoys with certain ships of war, narrowly escaped capture by pirates. A vessel containing part of his baggage and retinue, together with his vice-chamberlain, fell into the hands of the enemy. This scandal naturally created a great stir, and Lord Camoys was tried on a charge of correspondence with the enemy. He was acquitted, but his innocence appears to have been considered doubtful. Pirates lurked in the Thames or blockaded the mouth of the river, and to prevent them from landing within the area of the city, the streets leading to the river were defended by chains. Still further to defend London from privateers, John Philippot offered to build, at his own cost, a stone tower sixty king's feet in height near Ratcliffe, provided the Corporation of London would levy sixpence in the pound on the rental of the city and build a corresponding tower on the opposite side of the river so that an iron chain might be stretched from one tower to the other to protect the shipping of the river from night attack. The danger was so imminent that the Common Council agreed to the proposal, but, as the alarm died away, this scheme of defence was laid aside. In 1370, quote, the mayor, aldermen, and commonalty were given to understand that certain galleys, with a multitude of armed men therein, were lying off the foreland of Tanit, Thanet. End quote. And it was therefore ordered that quote, every night watch shall be kept between the Tower of London and Billingsgate, with forty men at arms and sixty archers. End quote. Which watch the men of the trades underwritten quote, agreed to keep in succession each night in the form as follows: on Tuesday the drapers and the tailors, on Wednesday the mercers and the apothecaries, on Thursday the fishmongers and the butchers, on Friday the pewterers and the vintners, on Saturday the goldsmiths and the saddlers, on Sunday the ironmongers, the armourers and the cutlers, on Monday the tourers, couriers, the spuriers, the bowyers and the girdlers. End quote. These pirates gave a great deal of trouble up to a much later date, and the wardenship of the sink ports, then held by Cecil, was a busy post when, as in May 1616, pirate vessels were captured between Broadstairs and Margate. In connection with the trade and commerce of London, fairs and markets held a very important position, but here it will only be possible to make a passing allusion to them. Bartholomew Fair, Smithfield, granted to the prior of St. Bartholomew's by Henry II, 1133, was for several centuries the great cloth fair of England. Its memory is kept alive by the street which is still known as Cloth Fair. After the dissolution of the monasteries, the fair was annually opened by the mayor, attended by the aldermen. It long outlived its use and reputation, and was not finally abolished until the 19th century had run its course for some years. In the city letter books, there are references to other less important fairs, Thus, a fair then only recently established in Soper Lane, now Queen Street, Cheapside, and known as Nain 
or noon fair was abolished about 1307 owing to its being the resort of thieves and cup purses there was also a fair called la novelle fair which was held in the parish of st nicholas acons many fairs were held at different times in southwark westminster and other places in the neighbourhood of london how important the great fairs of the middle ages were may be seen in one instance among others by the fact that the citizens of london resorted in such numbers to st botolph's fair annually held at boston county lincoln on st botolph's day seventeenth of june that all business in the court of hustings ceased and the court was closed for a week in the fourth book of the liber albus there is a list of letters and other documents relating to markets and fairs several of which relate to st botolph's fair in saxon times buying and selling could only be lawfully carried out before the reeve of folkmoot a practice which necessitated a gathering in towns at fixed times from which custom grew up the practice of each town having a market day as a rule this was on a sunday and the market-place was often situated in the churchyard close beneath the sheltering walls of the parish church by the statute winton thirteen edward the first fairs and markets were forbidden to be held in churchyards and the statute twenty seven henry the sixth was the first enactment intended to enforce a due observance of sunday to avoid the scandal of holding fairs and markets on sundays and upon high feast days it was decreed that quote, fairs and markets shall not be holden on sundays or on festivals end quote, with the exception of four sundays in harvest there is no public right of holding fairs or markets and the privilege emanates from the prerogative of the crown from the earliest times the streets of london were occupied by the various trades who obtained the privilege of using them as market-places the market of west cheap or cheapside was the chief of these public places but almost all the trades had their appointed stations in the different streets and in many cases the trades were not allowed to sell their wares in other places than those assigned to them in the time of edward i it was ordered quote, that all manner of victuals that are sold by persons in cheap upon cornhill and elsewhere in the city such as bread cheese poultry fruit hides and skins onions and garlic and all other small victuals for sale as well by denizens as by strangers shall stand midway between the kennels of the streets as to be a nuisance to no one under pain of forfeiture of the article end quote. Quote, the pavement in cheap end quote, was a recognized market-place for corn probably situated near the church of st michael le Kern, at the west end of cheapside stocks market which stood on the site of the present mansion house was founded in 1283, and the rents were appropriated to the maintenance of London Bridge. In 1324, the wardens of the bridge made complaint that certain fishmongers and butchers had of late abandoned the market house, had erected sheds in the King's Highway and other adjoining places, and sold their flesh and fish there, quote, whereby the rents aforesaid, which formed the greater part of the maintenance of the said bridge, had become immensely reduced to the great peril and damage of the bridge and of the city and of all passing over such bridge End quote. staples were markets where only certain goods called staple goods were allowed to be sold the company of merchants of the staple had a monopoly of exporting the staple commodities of england and certain staple towns which were constantly changed were appointed as centres of the trade the chief export was wool quote, the sovereign treasure end quote, of england wherewith she was said to keep the whole world warm in thirteen twenty eight and again in thirteen thirty four all staples were abolished and trade was free according to the great charter free trade did not last long and the staple was fixed at bruges in thirteen forty four by the ordinance of staple twenty seven edward the third thirteen fifty three ten staple towns were appointed in england wales and ireland westminster and london together being considered as one of the ten the staple of bruges was removed from bruges to westminster by this act in thirteen sixty part of this act was repealed calais remained a staple till it was temporarily suppressed in thirteen sixty nine statute forty three edward the third by this act 
the staple of wool was in future to be confined to the following English ports. Newcastle, Hull, Boston, Yarmouth, Queenborough, Westminster, Chichester, Winchester, Exeter, and Bristol. The staple towns continued to be changed, and there were great complaints made by the English in Tudor times that the staple was fixed abroad. We read that, quote, The carriage out of wool to the staple is a great hurt to the people of England, though it be profitable both to the prince and to the merchant also. End quote. The changes in the wool trade in England during the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries caused an industrial revolution, the effects of which are well marked in our literature. The raw material was no longer exported, but in its place the cloth made here was sent to countries which had formerly supplied us with cloth in exchange for our wool. In consequence, the number of wealthy merchants increased. With this prosperity the country became proud, and the lawgivers did all they could to foster the manufactures of the country. Footnote Mr. W. J. Ashley notes that the earliest instance of the prohibition of the export of wool is found in the action of the Oxford Parliament of 1258. The barons then, quote, decreed that wool of the country should be worked up in England and should not be sold to foreigners, and that everyone should use woolen cloth made within the country, end quote, unless people should be dissatisfied at having to put up with the rough cloth of England, they bade them, quote, not to seek over-precious raiment, end quote. English Economic History and Theory, 1888-1893 End of footnote A statute passed in 1463, 3. Edward IV, prohibited by enumeration the import of almost all wrought goods in order that, quote, the English artificers may have employment, end quote. A similar act was passed in the reign of Henry VIII, by which foreign books could only be introduced in sheets, so that work could be provided for the English bookbinders. The famous poem written by Adam de Molyneux, Molines or Molins, Bishop of Chichester and Keeper of the Privy Seal, died, 1450, which was entitled The Libel of English Policy, 1437, contains a full account of commodities exchanged between the countries of Western Europe. The full title of this important libellum shows its object. Quote, Here beginneth the prologue of the process of the libel of English policy, exhorting all England to keep the sea environ, and namely the narrow sea, showing what profit cometh thereof, and also worship and salvation to England and to all English men. End quote. The leading idea of the little book, as may be seen from the title, is that which agitates the public mind at the present time, and shows how important it is that England should keep the seas and protect the food and clothing coming to this country. In connection with the commerce and trade of the country, the official weighing of goods was a matter of great importance. As far back as the Saxon period, standard weights and measures were preserved in the city of London, and with these the weights and measures throughout the kingdom had to conform. The king's great beam, or tron, was used for weighing coarse goods by the hundredweight, and the small beam, or balance, for silks, spiceries, and goods sold by the pound weight. The king's weighhouse in Fish Street Hill, London, and the tron church in Edinburgh remind us of the old weighing machines of the country. It was formerly the custom to allow a margin to buyers at the tron. According to the Liber de Antiquis, in 1305, the weigher allowed the buyer a draft of four pounds in every hundredweight. At the present day, there is a survival of this custom in the tea trade and some others, for the importer gives a precisely similar draft to the dealer, viz. one pound in every chest of tea of twenty-eight pounds. Foreigners and strangers were not permitted, as a rule, to take up their residence within the walls of London for a longer period than forty days, and were subject to several restrictions as to trade. Exceptions were, however, made from time to time with various foreign towns. Natives of Denmark enjoyed the privilege of sojourning in London all the year through, in addition to which they had a right to all the benefits of, quote, the law of the City of London, end quote that is, 
they were entitled to the right of resorting to fair or to market in any place throughout England. Norwegian had the same right of sojourning in London all the year, but did not enjoy, quote, the law of the city, end quote, as they were prohibited from leaving it for the purposes of traffic. In February 1303, the king, by the Carta Mercatoria, granted exceptional privileges to foreign merchants, and these concessions caused great indignation among his subjects at home. A tax was exacted from these foreigners, and in 1309, the Friscobaldi were appointed by the king to receive the new custom, and two years later he ordered their arrest for failing to render an account of the money received under that head. Their detention, however, was of short duration. The act was repealed in 1311, and again enacted in 1322, but with the accession of Edward III it was again repealed. Foreign commerce is said to have been better governed than inland trade, for the king had an arbitrary authority in the regulation of trading. In dealing with the trade of London, it is necessary to say something about the origin of guilds, but this is a most difficult question, respecting which very different opinions are held by writers on the subject. It will be impossible to discuss these points at all fully in this chapter, and therefore a few dates will be found sufficient for the present purpose. Medieval guilds were voluntary associations established for mutual assistance. It is quite easy to show the likeness between them and the Roman collegia, but to do this is futile, because few now believe in any connection between these two institutions. Similar circumstances often cause similar institutions to arise. In the Middle Ages, few men and women could stand alone, and combination was a positive necessity for existence, and the people soon found that union is strength. The great authority on this subject is Mr. Toulmin Smith's work, entitled English Guilds, which was edited by his daughter, Miss Toulmin Smith, and published by the Early English Text Society in 1880. Prefixed to this great work is Dr. Brentano's valuable essay on the history of guilds, in which he writes, quote, I write to declare here most emphatically that I consider England the birthplace of guilds. End quote. Some writers have fixed upon the second half of the ninth century as the date of the origin of guilds, but Miss Toulmin Smith points out that among the laws of Inner, A.D. 688 to 725, are two touching the liability of the brethren of a guild in the case of slaying a thief. Alfred, A.D. 871 to 879, still further recognized the brotherly guild spirit in his laws as to manslaughter by a kinless man, and again where a man who has no relatives is slain. Dr. Brentano writes, quote, An already far advanced development of the guilds is shown by the Judicia Civitatis Londoniae, the statutes of the London guilds, which were reduced to writing in the time of King Athelstan. From them, the guilds in and about London appear to have united into one guild, and to have framed common regulations for the better maintenance of peace, for the suppression of violence, especially of theft and the aggressions of the powerful families, as well as for carrying out rigidly the ordinances enacted by the king for that purpose. End quote. A large division of the old guilds were purely social, and there is no trace of merchant guilds before the Norman Conquest, while craft guilds did not come into existence until early in the 12th century. Dr. Brentano writes, quote, Though the merchant guilds consisted chiefly of merchants, yet, from the first, craftsmen, as such, were not excluded from them on principle, if only such craftsmen possessed the full citizenship of the town, which citizenship, with its further development, depended on the possession of estates of a certain value situated within the territory of the town. The strict separation which existed between the merchants and the crafts probably arose only by degrees. Originally, the craftsmen, no doubt, traded in the raw materials which they worked with. End quote. Mr. Ashley is of opinion that Dr. Brentano exaggerated both the independence and the economic importance of the trade guilds. He further writes, quote, We do not know whether there had ever been a guild merchant in London. However, in 1191, 
by the recognition of its commune, the citizens obtained complete municipal self-government and, consequently, the recognition of the same right over trade and industry as a guild merchant would have exercised. End quote. Dr. Gross, in his work on the guild merchant, says that he can find no evidence of the existence of a merchant guild in London. Still, there were trade guilds which were aristocratic in origin and governed by the great merchants who were the chief landowners of London. Mr. C. G. Crump, however, has lately found direct mention of the Guild Merchant of London in 1252 in a charter of that date. Charter Roll 37 Henry III. While pointing out that this was apparently unknown to Dr. Gross, as he decides against the existence of any such institution, he adds, quote, This charter, while it suggests a doubt on the point, is not conclusive because it is a very exceptional document. There is no other charter of its kind during the whole reign of Henry III, and a chancery clerk endeavouring to draft a charter to convert a Florentine merchant into a citizen of London might well have thought fit to mention a guild merchant as a matter of common form even if none actually existed. End quote. The year 1180 is an important one in the history of guilds, for then these bodies were required to pay their fines or licenses in token and recognition of their allegiance to the crown. There were eighteen of these, which were immersed as adulterine guilds, the goldsmiths, the pepperers and the butchers being among them. The document containing this list is translated by Herbert in his work on the companies, where it is suggested that the fining of these proves that the guilds must have been numerous, because some of them only could have subjected themselves to the penalty. The Mercers claim an existence at a still earlier date, 1172, and when the Saddlers are mentioned immediately after the conquest, they are said to possess ancient statutes. Gradually the influence of the craftsmen made itself felt, and the craft guilds came into existence, but the aristocratic traders would not recognise them. The craftsmen found an enthusiastic patron in Thomas Fitz Thomas, the popular mayor, 1261 to 1265. His conduct disgusted Arnold Fitz Thedmar, the city alderman and chronicler, who complains that, quote, This mayor, during the time of his mayoralty, had so pampered the city populace that, styling themselves the commons of the city, they had obtained the first voice in the city. For the mayor, in doing all that he had to do, acted and determined through them, and would say to them, Is it your will that so it shall be? And then, if they answered, Ya, yeah, ya, yeah, so it was done. And on the other hand, the aldermen or chief citizens were little or not at all consulted on such matter, but were in fact just as though they had not existed. End quote. After the Battle of Evesham, the city was taken into the king's hands. 1265 to 1270, and a very despotic and wicked action was perpetrated. Fitz Thomas and some other prominent citizens were summoned to Windsor, and there were kept prisoners. Some of these regained their liberty, but nothing more was heard of Fitz Thomas, as Dr. Reginald Sharp writes. Quote, from the time that he entered Windsor Castle, he disappears from public view. That he was alive in May 1266, at least in the belief of his fellow citizens, is shown by their cry for the release of him and his companions who are at Windleshaws. The craftsman lost a valiant friend, but another was raised up in his place. Walter Hervey, who was hated by the aldermen for his democratic opinions, but loved by the commons, was elected mayor in 1272. Fresh ordinances for the regulation of various crafts were drawn up, and to these the mayor, on his own responsibility, attached the city seal. When his year of office expired, these so-called charters were called in question, and in 1274 they were examined in the hustings before all the people and declared void. The craft guilds were supposed to be defeated, but this was not really so, for the merchants found that the struggle between the trade guilds and the craft guilds was an unequal one. They therefore, with much worldly wisdom, joined the latter, and gradually gained an ascendancy in them. Mr. Ashley affirms that from the reign of Edward II, the guild system was no longer merely tolerated, 
but it was fostered and extended. The years which followed the Peace of Bretigny, until war broke out afresh in 1369, witnessed the reorganization of many of the trade and craft guilds. In 1376, the guilds wrested for a time from the wards the right of electing members of the city's council. The guilds continued to elect until 1384, when the right of election was again transferred to the wards. The names of the representatives of the guilds forming the first common council of the kind are placed on record in letterbook H. End of chapter 10, part 1. End of section 19. Section 20 of the Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 10 Commerce and Trade, Part 2. The year 1388 to 1389 was an important one in the history of guilds. The writs of twelve Richard II had important effects, and the returns formed the chief substance of Mr. Toolman Smith's English guilds. There were two distinct writs. A. The writ for returns from the social guilds. B. The writ for returns from craft guilds. Toolman Smith printed the writs with these side notes. A. Quote, the sheriffs of London, and of every shire in England, shall, by authority of the Parliament that lately met at Cambridge, make proclamation calling on the master and wardens of all the social guilds, all guilds and brotherhoods whatsoever, to send up returns before the second day of February, A.D. 1388 to 9. B. The sheriffs of London, and of every shire in England, shall, by authority of the Parliament that lately met at Cambridge, make proclamation calling on the masters, wardens and overlookers of all guilds of crafts holding any charter or letters patent, to send up before the second day of February, 1388-9, to copies of such charters and letters upon penalty of forfeiture. End quote. The original writs were returned by the London sheriffs with this endorsement. Quote, when and by whom proclamation was made in London and the suburbs. Fleet Street in the suburbs. The Standard in Westcheap. The Leadenhall, Cornhill. St. Magnus Church, Bridge Street. St. Martin's Church, Vintry. Southwark. End quote. In Mr. Toolman Smith's book, only three of the returns relate to London, and these are not from craft guilds. They are the Guild of Garlic Hythe, the Guild of St. Catherine, Aldersgate, and the Guild of Saints Fabian and Sebastian, Aldersgate. It is not necessary to give extracts from these returns, but we can obtain a good idea of the objects of these guilds from Mr. Toolman Smith's side notes, which are as follows. Garlic Hythe Quote, The guild was begun in 1375 to nourish good fellowship, all brethren must be of good repute. Each shall pay six shillings and eightpence on entry. There shall be wardens who shall gather in the payments and yield an account thereof yearly. A livery suit shall be worn. The brethren and sisterin shall hold a yearly feast. Two shillings a year shall be paid by each. Four meetings touching the guild's welfare shall be held in each year. Free gifts by the brethren. Ill-behaved brethren shall be put out of the guild. No livery suit shall be sold within a year. On death of any, all the rest shall join in the burial service and make offerings under penalty. In case of quarrel, the matter shall be laid before the wardens. Whoever disobeys their award shall be put out of the guild, and the other shall be helped. Weekly help to all seven-year brethren in old age and in sickness, and to those wrongfully imprisoned. Newcomers shall swear to keep the ordinances. Every brother chosen warden must serve, or pay forty shillings. End quote. St. Catherine. Quote. These are the ordinances of the guild. Oath on entry and a kiss of love, charity and peace. 
weekly help in poverty, old age, sickness, or loss by fire or water, etc. Payments by brethren and sisterin. Members of the guild shall go to church and afterwards choose officers. Burials shall be attended. The guild shall bear charge of burials. Any brother dying within ten miles round London shall have worshipful burial. All costs thereof shall be made good by the guild. Loans to guild brethren out of the guild stock on pledge or surety. Wax lights to be found and used at times named. Further services after death. Newcomers by assent only. Four men shall keep the goods of the guild and render an account yearly. Assent of all the guild to new ordinances. The goods of the guild are a vestment, a chalice, and a mass book. Price of ten marks. End quote. Saints Fabian and Sebastian. Quote. Oath on entry and a kiss of love, charity, and peace. Weekly help in poverty, old age, sickness, or loss by fire or water, etc. The young to be helped to get work. Payments by brethren and sisterin. Four days of meeting in the year when all must attend under penalty. Burials shall be attended. The guild shall bear charge of burials. Those dying within ten miles round London shall be fetched to London for burial. Loans to guild brethren out of the guild stock on pledge or surety. Wax lights to be found and used at times named. Ill-behaved brethren shall be put out of the guild. Entry of new brethren. Four men shall keep the goods of the guild and render an account yearly. Assent of all the guild to new ordinances. Grant of a house in Aldersgate worth four pounds thirteen shillings and fourpence a year, less quit rent of thirteen shillings a year, the profits of which are applied in aid of the guild. End quote. These regulations, with their general likeness and slight divergences, help us to understand the guild life of the Middle Ages, which, it will be seen, was essentially practical and helpful to the growth of good feeling among those who were brought together in constant intercourse. The rules of the guild were often very strict, and men of evil life were put out of the fraternity. Moreover, idlers and ne'er-do-wells were not to expect to be relieved from the funds of the guild. From the ordinances of the Guild of St. Anne in the Church of St. Lawrence Jewry, we learn that, quote, If any man be of good state, and use him to lie long in bed, and at rising of his bed, nay will not work but go to the tavern, and in this manner falleth poor, and trust to be helpen by the fraternity, that man shall never have good, nay help of company, neither in his life nor at his death but he shall be put off for evermore of the company. End quote. Mr. Toulmin Smith's returns are taken from the originals in the public record office, and, has already been noted, by some fatality there are no records of the craft guilds. The next great point in the history of guilds is connected with their abolition by the act of 1st Edward VI, 1547, a most iniquitous measure. Miss Toulmin Smith tells us how her father's indignation was roused by his researches into the story of the fate of the guilds. Quote, In a manuscript note, he remarks that for the abolition of monasteries, there was some colour, and after, professed inquiries as to manners. Moreover, allowances were made to all ranks. But in case of guilds, much wider, no pretense of inquiry or of mischief, and no allowance whatsoever a case of pure wholesale robbery and plunder, done by an unscrupulous faction to satisfy their personal greed, under cover of law. No more gross case of wanton plunder is to be found in the history of all Europe, no page so black in English history. End quote. Of course there is another side to the question, and Mr. Ashley, who discusses very fully the consequence of the act of Edward VI, thinks that it has been unfairly condemned. He says that, so far as the companies were concerned, 
The bill did not propose to take from them anything more than the revenues actually used for religious purposes, and further that the statute neither abolished nor dissolved nor suppressed nor destroyed the companies, but left all their corporate powers and rights intact, except so far as religious usages were concerned. We must remember, however, that Mr. Toolman Smith's indignation was roused not so much by the forfeiture of certain trusts in the hands of the livery companies as by the robbery of the small guilds all over the country. The early history of most of the city companies is rather disconnected, and, owing to the loss and destruction of documents, the mode by which the craft guilds were amalgamated with the livery companies is not very easy to follow. Still, the likeness between the two institutions is so marked, and their duties so similar, that there is no difficulty in acknowledging the fusion. To take a single instance, it may be mentioned that the original Guild of Goldsmiths had exactly similar public duties to perform that are now performed by the present Goldsmiths' company. This connection has usually been taken for granted, but it is necessary to allude to the question here, because Mr. Lofty, a high authority on the history of London, has strongly disputed this connection. In 1883, Mr. Lofty wrote, quote, The identification of the adulterine guilds with the later companies is scarcely possible. End quote. And again in 1887, quote, The Weavers' Company is not the only one which claims to represent directly an ancient guild but it is the only one whose claim has anything so like a reasonable foundation. End quote. These are, however, only casual remarks, but in his latest work he has elaborated his attack in the following terms. Quote, Popular errors are very difficult to deal with effectually. One of the most persistent is that which confounds the city guilds with the city companies. Here, two widely different things are inextricably confused and that, too, not in mere catchpenny popular books, but in books pretending to be more or less authority. In the common run of London histories, guild means company and company means guild. To begin with, there are now no guilds in London. By an act passed in 1557, all religious guilds were abolished and all guildable property was confiscated. But as there were no guilds not religious, and as the property of guilds was held in trust to provide burials, masses, and sometimes chantries for deceased members, the guilds and their land, and their money, and their priestly vestments, and their illuminated manuscripts, all ceased to exist absolutely, and not only so, but it became penal to revive them. A city company which calls itself a guild renders itself liable to forfeiture, a penalty which would, of course, be rather difficult to enforce. End quote. There are two statements here which may be challenged. One, that all guilds were religious, and the other, that all guilds were abolished by Act of Parliament. Certainly the guilds which were not instituted for purposes of trade protection have often been styled religious. But Mr. Toolman Smith preferred to class them as social guilds, and I think wisely. As already stated, their objects were entirely practical and social. Mr. Toolman Smith writes, quote, The guilds were lay bodies, and existed for lay purposes, and the better to enable those who belonged to them rightly and understandingly to fulfil their neighbourly duties as freemen in a free state. End quote. Religious duties were performed, but these were only incidental to the life of the time, and consisted mostly of services connected with the serious occasions in the life of laymen, which were general in the periods that have been styled. Quote, ages of faith. End quote. As to the second point, a reference to the statute of 1 Edward VI will show us that the craft guilds are exempted from its operation. In the Statute of the Realm, one of the side notes to the quote, Act whereby certain chantries, colleges, free chapels, and the possessions of the same be given to the King's Majesty end quote, runs as follows. Quote, All brotherhoods or guilds and their possessions, except companies of trade vested in the king. End quote. The text is quote, Other than such corporations, guilds, fraternities, companies, and fellowships of mysteries or crafts. End quote. 
I think we must allow that the terms of this act strongly corroborate the general belief that the old craft guilds and the later companies were so closely connected as to be practically the same. Having dealt with the general question of guilds, we can now pass on to consider the influence of the different trades upon London life. The origin of the companies seems to have been largely connected with the result of a combination of the numerous sections of a particular trade. Some trades were so important that they could stand alone. Thus, the Goldsmiths' Guild became the Goldsmiths' Company. But most of the other companies were formed by the union of more than one guild. A marked feature of the old trades of London was the minute subdivisions which took place among them. Thus, there were hatters, cappers, chapelers, makers of caps, and hewers. The latter were makers of hewers, or rough, hairy caps. The hewers and cappers were united to the hatters by charter of Henry the Seventh in the sixteen year of his reign, and again united in the following year to the haberdashers by the king's license under his great seal. The company subsequently known and chartered as the cloth workers was first incorporated by letters patent of Edward the Fourth in 1482 as the quote, fraternity of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary of the Shearmen of London. End quote. The Fullers were taken into union in 1528, thereby constituting the Cloth Workers' Company. A convincing proof of the connection of the guilds with companies and the natural succession of the latter from the former is seen in this case of the Cloth Workers' Company. It appears from a deed dated the 15th of July, 1456, that John Badby did remise, etc., unto John Hungerford and others, citizens and shearmen of London, quote, a tenement and mansion house, shops, cellars, and other the appurtenances, lying in Minchin Lane, and their heirs for ever. This is the site of the Cloth Workers' Hall, the Cloth Workers' Company being the natural heirs of the Guild of Shearmen. There is much interest connected with the occupation of the Shearmen, who sheared the nap of wool. Woolen clothes in the Middle Ages were expected to last a lifetime. When the new nap was very long, and as the clothes became shabby, it was customary to have them shorn, a process which was repeated as long as the stuff would bear it. In the delightful old ballad reprinted in Percy's Reliquies, quote, Take thy old cloak about thee, end quote. The old cloak that had been in wear for forty-four years was likely to be a sorry clout at the end of that time, which would hold out neither wind nor rain. Well might the husband resolve, quote, For once I'll new apparelled be, tomorrow I'll to town and spend, for I'll have a new cloak about me. End quote. But the wife's plea for thrift and her statement, quote, It's pride that puts this country down, end quote, succeeds in the end, and the ballad ends, quote, As we began, we now will leave and I'll take mine old cloak about me. End quote. The aid of the shearman was not merely called in by the poor, for we learn that the Countess of Leicester, Eleanor, third daughter of King John and wife of Simon de Montfort, in 1265 sent Heek the tailor to London to get her robes reshorn. The date of the ballad was probably early, although the king alluded to in the printed text is King Stephen, in that of the Scotch version Robert, and in the Percy manuscript, a vague King Henry. The ballad must have had a wide popularity, for Shakespeare alludes to it twice. Iago quotes a whole stanza in Act Two of Othello, and Trinculo in Act Four of The Tempest evidently alludes to it when he says, quote, O King Stefano, O peer, O worthy Stefano, look what a wardrobe here is for thee. End quote. The number of trades connected with clothing was singularly numerous. Besides the shearman, or tondor, there were the felipa, felipa or frippera, who dealt in second-hand clothes, and the ferber, or furbisher, of old clothes. Dr. Brentano points out that in all manufacturing countries, in England, Flanders, and Brabant, as well as in the Rhenish towns, the most ancient guilds were those of the weavers and Mr. Ashley writes that the first craft guilds to come into notice were the weavers and fullers of woolen cloth. 
no weaver or fuller might go outside the town to sell his own cloth, and so interfere with the monopoly of the merchants, nor was he allowed to sell his cloth to any save a merchant of the town. The suppression did not continue for long, and in the reign of Henry III we find the feud between the citizens and the guild again in full force. When the authorities of the guild feared that the citizens would overpower them, they delivered their, quote, charter into the exchequer to be kept in the treasury there, and to be delivered to them again when they should want it, and afterwards to be laid up in the treasury, end quote. Mr. Green says that in 1300 the mayor had gained the right to preside in the weaver's court if he chose, and to nominate the wardens of the guild. In the fourteenth year of Edward II, A.D. 1320-1321, to 1321, the privileges of the weavers came before a court of law. In spite of the distinguished position that the guild of weavers held in its early days, the present weavers' company only stands 42nd in the order of the livery companies. Many of the old trades of London have been entirely lost sight of, and their names only exist among the patronymics of the people. The great feud between the victualling and clothing trades of London was one of the most remarkable features of the 14th century. Some allusion has been made to this in Chapter 8 on the governors of the city, but a reference must also be made here in connection with the history of the London companies. After the Peasants' Revolt, London was the battlefield of rival factions. The friends of the king, Richard II, were found among the great merchants of the victualling trades. In one year, sixteen of the twenty-five aldermen were grocers, and Nicholas Brember was chief of them. The fishmongers, of whom Sir William Walworth was the leader, were scarcely less powerful. The victuallers were very unpopular, and the public have always specially resented any advance in the price of food. Complaints were rife in the chief cities of the country of the abuses of the victuallers, and an act, 12 Edward II, was passed to the effect that, quote, no officer of a city or borough shall sell wine or victuals during his office, end quote. This act was frequently evaded, and another act was passed in 1382. In the end, the act of Edward II was repealed. 3 Henry VIII, 1511 to 1512. Footnote. The reason given for the repeal of the Act of Edward II excluding victuallers from the office of mayor is that, quote, since the making of the statute, many and the most part of all cities, boroughs, and towns corporate be fallen in ruin and decay, and not inhabited with merchants and men of such substance as they were at the time of making the statute. For at this day the dwellers and inhabitants of the same cities and boroughs be most commonly bakers, brewers, vintners, fishmongers, and other victuallers, and few or none other persons of substance. End quote. Mr. W. J. Ashley, in his Introduction to English Economic History and Theory, observes that, quote, Without further proof, it were hardly safe to build on the wide language of the preamble of a statute a conclusion which seems in obvious conflict with what we know of the generic course of events. End quote. In London, evidently, Little or no attention was paid to the original Act of Edward II, but in other places this was not the case. The statute of Henry VIII provided that when the mayor was a victualler, two honest and discreet persons, not being victuallers, should be chosen to assist him in settling prices of victuals. End of footnote. John of Northampton, when he became mayor, took advantage of this act, and began a policy of aggression directed against the victualling interest. He turned all his enemies off the governing body, and victuallers were forbidden to hold office in the city. These feuds were very serious, and the two leaders were unfortunate in their ends. Bremba was executed in 1388, and John of Northampton was sent to the tower and imprisoned in Tintagel Castle. A few words may be said here about the classes of trades represented by the guilds and companies, commencing with the bakers. The price of bread was regulated by law, according to the price of wheat, and the mayor had the right to levy a halfpence for every quarter of corn sent to the mill. This tax was called pesage, from Pisa, a corruption of medieval Latin pensa, a weight. The right was called in question at the eater, 
held in the tower in 1321, but the matter was adjourned for the consideration of the king and his council. The fraudulent baker had a bad time, for he was sometimes carried about in a tumbrel, and at other times he was put in the pillory. For his first offence, the culprit was drawn upon a hurdle from Guildhall through the most populous and most dirty streets, with a defective loaf hanging from his neck. On a second occasion he was drawn from the Guildhall, quote, through the great streets of Cheap, end quote, to the pillory, which was usually erected in Cheap or Cheapside, and there he was exposed for one hour. For the third offence he was again drawn on the hurdle, his oven was pulled down, and he was compelled to forswear the trade in London forever. The use of the hurdle was discontinued in favour of the pillory in the reign of Edward II. Another offence punished by exposure in the pillory, besides short weight and bad quality, was the putting of iron in a loaf of bread to increase its weight. In the famine of 1258, when the Earl of Cornwall's sixty cargoes of grain arrived, the first thing the king had to do was to issue an ordinance against the greed of the middlemen, known as forestallers and regrators. No words appeared to have been found too strong to hurl at these unfortunate middlemen, but the regratresses, or female retailers who bought bread at the markets and delivered it from house to house, were contented with a small profit. These dealers were privileged by law to receive thirteen batches for twelve, hence the expression, a baker's dozen. This seems to have been the extent of their profits. It was once the practice of a baker to give each regratress who dealt with him sixpence on Monday morning by way of estrine, or present, and threepence on Friday as courtesy money. But this was forbidden by public ordinance, and the bakers were ordered to let all such payments in future go towards increasing the size of the loaf, quote, to the profit of the people, end quote. Corn used to be stored by the city and the companies against times of scarcity, but the origin of the practice is obscure, and no obligation to provide corn appears to have been imposed upon any of the companies by the terms of their charters. Sir Simon Eyre, mayor in 1435, formed a public granary in Leadenor. Stowe and Fuller eulogised Sir Stephen Brown, who, in 1438, was energetic in his endeavours to get corn stored in the city granaries. In 1578, the farmers of the bridge house divided the store into twelve equal parts, and the same by lots were appropriated to the twelve companies, to each of them an equal part for the bestowing and keeping of the said corn. Pannier, or Pannier, Alley, leading from Newgate Street to Paternoster Row, was once the standing place for bakers with their bread panniers. The bakers of London were divided into white bakers and brown or taut bakers, tertiarii, who made a coarse bread of unbolted meal. No maker of white bread was allowed to make tort, nor a tort baker to make white bread. House bread was prepared by the bakers of household bread, while hostelers, by whom it was exclusively used, were forbidden to make it. Similar trades were the pastelers, who made pies and other kinds of pastry, pie bakers, and cooks. Butchers the sale of butcher's meat seems to have been somewhat limited during the Middle Ages in comparison with the population, although the number of butchers within the city walls were quite sufficient to create a considerable nuisance. Smithfield was then the great cattle market, as it remained until our own time. Lean swine were sold there, probably with the purpose of fattening them in the town. The chief meat markets within the city walls were Stocks Market and the flesh shambles of St Nicholas in Newgate Street and its vicinity. A lease of the latter place to the butchers in 1343 is recorded in Riley's Memorials. The shocking condition of Newgate Street is indicated by such names as Stinking Lane, St. Nicholas's Shambles and Blowbladder Street. There was a butcher's bridge on the Thames side near Baynard's Castle to which the offal was brought from Newgate Street through the streets and lanes of the city by which, quote, grievous corruption and filth have been generated. End quote. The evil, in fact, was so great that a royal order was issued in 1369 for the removal of Butcher's Bridge. The foreign butchers, or those who did not possess the freedom of the city, 
brought their meat to shambles just outside the civic boundary. On the west, near St. Clement's Church in the Strand, there was a butcher row, and in the east, immediately beyond Aldgate, was another butcher row. This last still exists as Aldgate Market, and consists of a row of butcher shops on the south side of the high street. Formerly imported animals were killed behind the shops. The unfortunate tradesmen had to submit to public enactment, by which the exact price of the commodities they sold was fixed. In the reign of Edward I, the carcass of the best ox was sold for thirteen shillings and fourpence, of the best pig for four shillings, of the best sheep for two shillings. The ill-treated butcher had no redress, for a provision was added to the order that if any person should withdraw himself from the trade by reason of the said ordinance, he should lose the freedom of the city, and be compelled to forswear the trade for ever. These instances of interference with trade continued for centuries, and we learn that in 1533 it was enacted that butchers should sell their beef and mutton by weight, beef for half a pence a pound, and mutton for three quarters of a pence. Stowe, in relating this, adds that at this time and not before, foreign butchers were allowed to sell their flesh in leaden or market. Fishmongers The information relating to the sale of fish in the city records proves how largely the population of London in the Middle Ages depended upon its ample supply. There was great variety, and a large number of enactments were made as to the sale. The fish mentioned in the Liber Albus as being sold in the London market are sturgeon, cod, ray, herring, bass, conger, sole, mackerel, surmullet, turbot, porpoise, haddock, sealing, sprats, salmon, shad, eels, pike, barbel, roach, dace, dabs, flounders, lampreys, smelts, sticklings, oysters, mussels, cockles, whelks, scallops, and stockfish imported from Prussia. Of these, sprats, herrings, mussels, whelks, and oysters are most often mentioned, but lobsters, crabs, and shrimps are not alluded to. Fish was not allowed to be sold retail upon the quays. The stalls in Stocks Market were occupied by the fishmongers on fish days and by the butchers on flesh days. Other retail markets for fish were held by the wall of St. Margaret's Church, New Fish Street, by the wall of St. Mary Magdalene's in Old Fish Street, and in Westcheap. Stowe writes of the first of these places, quote, In this Old Fish Street is one row of small houses, placed along in the midst of Knight Rider Street, which row is also off Bread Street Ward. These houses now possessed by fishmongers, were at the first but movable boards or stalls set out on market days to show their fish there to be sold. But procuring license to set up sheds, they grew to shops, and by little and little to tall houses of three or four stories in height. End quote. Salmon, cod, and herrings are mentioned in the Liber Albus as being sold in the shops in the neighbourhood of Queenhive. Old Fish Street and Old Fish Street Hill, which run from it to the Thames, with Queenhithe as their landing key, formed the chief fish market of London before Billingsgate supplanted Queenhithe. A curious regulation is found in a royal ordinance in existence as early as the reign of Henry III, by which the first boat in the season with fresh herrings from Yarmouth was forced to pay double custom at the quay. Fishmongers selling fish in large quantities to their customers were to sell by the basket, such basket to be capable of containing one bushel of oats and, if found deficient, to be burnt in open market. Each basket was also to contain one kind of sea fish, and the fishmongers were warned not to colour their baskets, or, in other words, not to put good fish on the top and inferior beneath. Very stringent regulations were also made with respect to the size of nets used for fishing in the Thames, and any such which were contrary to these regulations were ruthlessly destroyed. The trade of the stock fishmonger was quite distinct from that of the ordinary fishmonger, and these belonged respectively to two separate companies. They were united in 1537. Thames Street was formerly known as Stock Fishmonger Row, 
for the abbot of St. Albans enjoyed the privilege of buying fish directly of the fishermen, for which he paid the bailiff of the market a fee of one mark per annum. The monks, however, appeared to have taken an undue advantage of their privilege, and an order was issued by the hall moat of the fishmongers, quote, that good care be taken that the buyers of the abbey take out of the city fish for the use of the abbot and convent only. End quote. Polterers. Many of the streets of London must have been almost impassable from the stalls of the traders and the chaffering of the buyers and sellers. This evil grew, and the complaints of obstruction were great. Endeavours were made to provide covered markets, but so many of the trades had special stands appropriated to them, as we see on all sides by the names of the streets, that it was impossible to dislodge them. Free poulterers had several special localities appropriated to their use. One was Cornhill. They were ordered to stand at the west side of St. Michael's Church, and were strictly forbidden to sell to the east of the tun, the site of which and the conduit are now marked by an unused pump, nearly facing number 30 Cornhill. Another standing was close by, and still retains the name of the poultry. Stowe tells that it was once known as Scalding Alley, because the poultry which the poulterers sold was scalded there. Still another standing was in Newgate Street, close by the butcher's shambles. Foreign poulterers were ordered to sell their wares at the corner of Leadenall, known as the Carfux, or Carfax. The articles dealt in by poulterers were rabbits, game, eggs, and poultry. Eggs were brought to market in baskets on men's backs, and poultry upon horses. The prices of poultry, like those of other food, were assessed by the mayor from time to time, and duly proclaimed. In the reign of Edward I, the best hen was sold for threepence, the best rabbit with the skin for fivepence, and without for fourpence. One hundred eggs, one hundred and twenty to the hundred, for eightpence. A partridge for threepence, a plover for twopence, and eight larks for one pence. Footnote. These prices, obtained from the Liber Albus, are of great interest. Of course, it is necessary to bear in mind the great difference in the value of money. It is impossible to fix a uniform standard of comparison, but we may put the present value broadly at between twelve and twenty times that of the reign of Edward I, the latter being more likely to be a true one. It will thus be seen that much food was dearer in the Middle Ages than at present. A rabbit and its skin are considerably less valuable now, as also a partridge. End of footnote. The body of London citizens suffered from one great evil in marketing, and that was that lords and great people were allowed the pick of the market. It was a common practice for the purveyors and servants of these great people to visit the various markets between midnight and prime, 6 a.m., after which hour the poorer classes were allowed to market. It is thus ordered by a proclamation of Edward I that no poulterer, fishmonger, or regrater shall buy any kind of victuals for resale until prime has been run out at St. Paul's, quote, so that the buyers for the king and the great lords of the land and the good people of the city may make good their purchases so far as they shall need. End, quote. End of chapter 10, part 2. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 10 Commerce and Trade, Part 3. Grocers. The grocers, properly grocers or wholesale sellers in gross, were for some time the chief of the victualling companies. They were originally known as the pepperers of Sopa Lane, and the apothecaries were associated with the grocers until they were incorporated as a distinct company in 1617. By various charters and ordinances, the company of grocers was entrusted with the examining, sorting, and passing of spices and drugs. They were empowered to enter the shops of grocers, druggists, confectioners, tobacconists, and tobacco cutters within the city and three miles around it, 
to seize and confiscate adulterated and unwholesome goods, and to fine and, in default of payment, imprison delinquent dealers. Brewers and Vintners A passing allusion must be made to the sale of drink in London, which has always been very considerable. Mr. Riley tells us that there is no mention of milk as an article of sale or otherwise in the Liber Albus, and butter must have been of very inferior quality, for it was sold by liquid measure. The ale tavern or ale house was a distinct establishment from the wine tavern. In 1309 the number of taverns in London was 354, whilst the number of brewers amounted to no less than 1,334. The ale brewed was a very different product from what we understand by the term now, as malt liquor was not hopped in those days. Hops were not used in the making of beer until the early years of the 16th century. Mr. Riley says that the best ale was no better than sweet wort, and so thin that it might be drunk in potations, pottle deep, without danger to the head. The smallest measure mentioned in the Liber Albus is the quart, so that it was evidently drunk in large quantities. It was used immediately after being made, as may be inferred from the fact that according to the Doomsday of St. Paul's, the brewings at the Cathedral Brewery took place twice a week throughout the year. Immediately after a brewing was finished, it was the duty of the brewer, or rather brewster, for the business was almost entirely in the hands of women until the beginning of the 16th century, to send for the ale conner of the ward in order to taste the ale. If this officer was not satisfied with its quality, he, with the assent of his alderman, set a lower price upon it, which, upon sale thereof, was not to be exceeded. Fine, imprisonment, and even punishment by pillory was the result of reiterated breaches of the assize. The assize price of ale varied at different periods. At one time it was three quarters of a penny per gallon and no more, but later the price was one and a half pence for the best, and three quarters of a penny to one penny for the second quality. The vintners were an important body, and were mostly located in the vintry, a district which has kept its name to the present time. The Vintners' Company consisted of Vinatarii, or wine importers and merchants, and Tabernarii, tavern keepers, or retailers of wine. The public taste in wine was not a very refined one in the Middle Ages, or possibly the liquor did not keep very well, as new wine was preferred to old. It was enacted that after the arrival of new wine at a tavern, none of it should be sold before the old was disposed of, there is no allusion in the Liber Albus to bottles or flasks, and all the wine seems to have been drawn from the wood. Taverners who sold sweet wines were forbidden to deal in other kinds. The sweet wines enumerated are Malvasy, a modern-day Malmsey, a Greek wine sold in the reign of Richard II at sixteen pence per gallon, Vernage, Vernaccia, a red Tuscan wine sold at two shillings, Crete, sold at one shilling, and wine of Provence, sold at the same price, probably a kind of Roussillon. By royal writ of 39 Edward III, only three taverns for the sale of sweet wines were in future to be permitted within the city, in Cheap, Walbrook, and Lombard Street. In the class of non-sweet wines were Rhenish, sold in the reign of Richard II, at eight pence per gallon, and Red, Vermeil, at sixpence. Other wines came from Gascony, Burgundy, Rochelle, and Spain. No wine was permitted to be sold till it had been submitted to a scrutiny and been duly gauged. In the reign of Edward III, four vintners were chosen yearly to assess the prices of wine. King's pricage, or custom, was taken according to a certain scale on all imported wines. The wine taverns were furnished with a pole projecting from the gable of the house and supporting a sign, or a bunch of leaves at the end, the bush of the proverb, good wine needs no bush. In one ordinance it is stated that the poles of the taverns of Cheapside and elsewhere were of such a length as to be in the way of persons on horseback, and so heavy as to cause the risk of greatly damaging the houses. In consequence of this it was enacted that from thenceforth no sign pole should be more than seven feet in length. No ale or wine tavern was allowed to remain open after curfew. 
The clothing trades are well represented among the city companies. The Mercers had the list of the twelve, and the freemen were originally, quote, chapmen in small or mixed wares, end quote. That is, those articles which were sold retail by the little balance or small scale, in contradistinction to those things sold by the beam, or in gross, as they did business in the mercery, Cheapside. Wadmull, a coarse woollen stuff, lake or fine linen, fustian, felt, etc., were among these small wares. Gradually the mercers of Cheap extended their dealings, became vendors of silks and velvets in the reign of Henry VI, and formed a mixed body of merchants and shopkeepers, leaving the small wares, or mercery proper, to the haberdashers. Sir William Stone held the position of mercer to Queen Elizabeth and supplied her with her wardrobe. The haberdashers imported a cloth at first styled halberject, and in the 14th century, hapatas, from which, as Mr. Riley suggests, the term haberdasher probably originated. Subsequently, the hurers and the hatters joined them. The merchant tailors and linen armourers are, in some documents, styled Mercatores Scissores, Scissors of London, Scissors and Fraternity of St. John Baptist, titles alike pointing to their being anciently both tailors and cutters, and also making the padding and interior lining of armour, as well as manufacturing garments. Tailors made dresses for both sexes, their prices, as usual, being regulated by public enactment. By ordinance of the reign of Edward III, it is declared that, quote, Tailors shall henceforth take for a robe, garnished with silk, eighteen pence, for a man's robe, garnished with thread and buckram, fourteen pence, also a coat and hood, ten pence, also for a lady's long dress, garnished with silk and sendale, two shillings and sixpence, also for a pair of sleeves for changing, fourpence. End quote. The Draper's Company is the third on the list of the twelve great companies, and the second of the clothing companies, the Mercers being the first. Henry Fitz Aylwin, the first mayor of London, was a freeman of the Draper's Guild, to which he left by will an inn called the Chequer in the parish of St Mary Bothor. The Skinners represented the trade that dealt with furs. The furs mentioned in the Liber Albus as imported are Martin skins, rabbit skins, dressed wolfells, Spanish squirrel skins, and grey severe, or grey work. In the reign of Edward I, an enactment was made that, quote, No woman, except a lady who is in the habit of using furs, shall have a hood furred with dressed wolfell, pellure, end quote. Women of ill fame were forbidden at one period to wear miniver or other furs, though at a later date they were permitted to use lamb's wool and rabbit skin. No mixed work, formed of different kinds of skins, was allowed to be made, and no new fur was to be worked up with the old. Quote, the skinner unto the field moot also, his house in London is to straight and scars, to doon his craft, some time it was not so. O lords, ye've unto your men here pars, that so doon, and acquent him bet with Mars. God of battle, he lueth non array, that hurteth manhood at prief or essay. The Raiment of Princes by Thomas Hockleave. End quote. The Cloth Workers' Company, formed by a junction of the guilds of Shearmen and Fullers, has already been alluded to. The minor companies connected with the clothing trades require some notice here. The Cordwainers held a prominent position, but in the reign of Edward I, 1303, there were public complaints of frauds and irregularities brought against them, and charges were made that they mixed inferior with the superior leathers. They were continually at feud with the cobblers, and every endeavour was made to keep the two trades distinct. The cordwainers were forbidden to mend shoes, and the cobblers to make them. Moreover, throughout the 13th and 14th and 15th centuries, there were fixed regulations not only that cordwainers should use new leather in making shoes, but that cobblers should be restricted wholly to the use of old leather in mending them. The latter were even punished for having new leather in their possession. In the reign of Edward III, the prices fixed for boots and shoes were 
a pair of shoes made of cordwain, sixpence, made of cow leather, fivepence, a pair of boots made of cordwain, three shillings and sixpence, made of cow leather, three shillings. This shows that boots were then very dear. In Edward IV's reign, the cordwainers stood up for the defence of their trade against the decree of the Pope. They were decidedly in the wrong, but one cannot but admire their pluckiness. The story is told in William Gregory's Chronicle of London, which is thus paraphrased by Dr. James Gardiner, the editor. Quote, the Pope issued a bull that no cordwainer should make any pikes, at the toes of the shoes, more than two inches long, or sell shoes on Sunday, or even fit a shoe upon a man's foot on Sunday, on pain of excommunication. Neither was the cordwainer to attend fairs on a Sunday under the same penalty. For not only were fairs held on that day, but the cordwainer's services, it must be supposed, were required at the fairs to adjust the dandy's chaussure, just as much as, in a later age, the barber's aid was necessary to dress his wig. The papal bull was approved by the king's council and confirmed by act of parliament, and proclamation was consequently made at Paul's cross that it should be put in execution. Yet, with all this weight of authority against a silly fashion, the dandy world had its own ideas upon the subject, and some men ventured to say they would wear long pikes in spite of the Pope, for the Pope's curse would not kill a fly. The cordwainers, too, had a vested interest in the extravagance, though some of their own body had been instrumental in getting the Pope's interference. They obtained privy seals and protections from the king to exempt them from the operation of the law, which soon became a dead letter, and those who had applied to the Pope to restrain their practices were subjected to much trouble and persecution. End quote. The leather sellers had still more to do with leather than the cordwainers, and the same complaints were made against them for passing off inferior for superior leather, in the 14th and 15th centuries, several ordinances were issued regulating the trade of the leather sellers in the city of London, and for the prevention of deceit in the manufacture and sale of their wares. Purses or glovers were incorporated with the leather sellers in 1502, but in 1638 a new company of glovers was formed. The girdlers made belts or girdles for men and women. They were also called Centurias and Zonars. In 1217, 1 Henry III, Benedict Centura was one of the sheriffs of London. The company still exists, although it cannot be said that the calling survived the reign of Charles II. The Goldsmiths' Company stands almost alone, on account of the great services to the state which it performs in connection with the important trade it represents and also in connection with the trial of the gold and silver coins in the picks of His Majesty's Mint, a service which has been performed without intermission at any rate since the year 1281. This history also contains a strong argument in favour of the received opinion that the companies are the lineal descendants of the guilds, for the craft of goldsmiths performed by statute the same duties of assaying vessels of gold and silver that the present company does. The Act, 28 Edward I, recites that, quote, The wardens of the craft shall go from shop to shop among the goldsmiths to essay if their gold be of the same touch that is spoken of before. End quote. According to Stowe's Chronicle, a variance fell between the fellowships of goldsmiths and tailors in 1268, quote, causing great ruffling in the city and many men to be slain, for which riot thirteen of the captains were hanged. End quote. By the first charter, 1 Edward III, 1327, quote, The company were allowed to elect honest, lawful, and sufficient men, but skilled in the trade, to inquire of any matters of complaint, and who might, in consideration of the craft, reform what defects they should find therein, and punish offenders. It states that it had been theretofore ordained that all those who were of the goldsmith's trade should sit in their shops in the high street of Cheap, and that no silver or plate ought to be sold in the city of London except at the King's Exchange, or in the said street of Cheap amongst the goldsmiths, and that publicly, to the end that the persons of the said trade might inform themselves whether the sellers 
came lawfully by such vessels or not. Whereas of late, not only the merchants and strangers bought counterfeit sterling in the realm, and also many of the trade of goldsmiths kept shops in obscure turnings and by-lanes and streets, but did buy vessels of gold and silver secretly, without inquiring whether such vessels were stolen or lawfully come by, and melting it down, did make it into plate, and sell it to merchants travelling beyond seas, that it might be exported. And so they made false work of gold and silver, which they sold to those who had no skill in such things. These abuses and deceptions this charter provides against by ordaining that no gold or silver shall be manufactured to be sent abroad, but what shall be sold at the king's exchange, or openly amongst the goldsmiths, and that none, pretending to be goldsmiths, shall keep any shops but in cheap. End quote. The king's exchange for the receipt of bullion was situated in the street leading from Cheapside to Knight Riders Street, known from the early part of the 17th century as Old Change. The London goldsmiths chiefly inhabited Cheapside, Old Change, Lombard Street, Foster Lane, St. Martin's Le Grand, Silver Street, Goldsmith Street, Wood Street, and the lanes about Goldsmith's Hall. That part of the south side of Cheapside from Bread Street to the Cross was called Goldsmith's Row. It was described in enthusiastic terms by Stowe as, quote, the most beautiful frame of fair houses and shops that be within the walls of London or elsewhere in England. The same was rebuilt by Thomas Wood, Goldsmith, one of the sheriffs of London, in the year 1491. It containeth in number ten fair dwelling houses and fourteen shops, all in one frame, uniformly built four stories high, beautified towards the street with the goldsmith's arms and the likeness of woodmen, in memory of his name, riding on monstrous beasts, all which is cast in lead, richly painted over and gilt. These he gave to the goldsmiths with stocks of money to be lent to young men having those shops. This said front was again new painted and gilt over in the year 1594. Sir Richard Martin, being then mayor, and keeping his mayoralty in one of them. End quote. Sir Walter Prideaux, in his valuable Memorials of the Goldsmiths Company, says that the native and the foreign goldsmiths appear to have been divided into classes, and to have enjoyed different privileges. First, there were the members of the company who were chiefly, but not exclusively, Englishmen. Their shops were subject to the control of the company, they had the advantages conferred by the company on its members, and they made certain payments for the support of the fellowship. The second division comprised the non-freemen, who were called allows, that is to say, allowed or licensed. There were allows English, allows alicant, alicant strangers, Dutchmen, men of the fraternity of St. Louis, etc. All these paid tribute to the company and were also subject to their control. All the livery companies possessed a class of young unmarried members called the Bachelors, and in the Goldsmiths' Company a special place was reserved for their lodging. This was known as Bachelors' Alley or Court, and was situated between Foster Lane and Gutter Lane. The lodgings were supplied at, quote, very small and easy rents, end quote, the greatest not to exceed eight shillings per annum. The tenants could continue as long as they were unmarried, but difficulties arose by reason of attempts at underletting without authority, and disorderly persons gave much trouble. In 1595, an order was promulgated, quote, that from henceforth no goldsmith shall have his dwelling in any of the tenements in Bachelor's Alley before he be admitted by the wardens for the time being, and that every one so admitted shall forthwith enter into a bond to deliver to the wardens, at his departure, the key of his tenement, and quietly to quit possession of the same. End quote. Sir Walter Prideaux states that at the early period of the First Charter, the goldsmiths acted as bankers and pawnbrokers. They received pledges not only of plate, but of other articles, such as cloth of gold and pieces of napery. St. Dunstan was the patron saint of the company, and feasts were held on his day, when also bells were set ringing. This saint's likeness in wood, gilt, formed the figurehead of the company's barge. 
There was also a chapel of St. Dunstan in St. Paul's Cathedral which was attached to the company. In the foregoing remarks there are some references to the livery companies, but these are introduced more particularly on account of the light thrown by them upon the trade of London. The work of the guilds was devoted to the trades which they represented, but in course of time many of the companies lost touch with the trades whose names they bore. This largely came about in a quite natural way, and the privilege of introduction to a company by patrimony caused the addition to the list of freemen of a large number of those who were engaged in other occupations. The relative position in precedence of the various companies have continually altered, and there is no information to show how the twelve chief companies have attained that commanding position. The feuds between the trades continued to comparatively late times. Pepys relates, in 1664, how there was a fray in Moorfields between the butchers and the weavers, between whom there had ever been a competition for mastery. At first, the butchers knocked down all the weavers that had green or blue aprons, but at last the butchers were fain to pull off their sleeves that they might not be known, and were soundly beaten out of the field. Some note must be made here of the Jews and of the Italian moneylenders who for so long carried on the financial business of the country. One of the many hardships which the Jews suffered in this country was that wherever they might dwell, they were compelled to bury their dead in London. This regulation was abolished by Henry II in 1177. The cruel calumny that the Jews at Lincoln crucified a Christian child brought them into great trouble, and in 1256, 102 Jews were brought from Lincoln to Westminster charged with this crime. Eighteen of them were hanged, and the remainder lay in prison for a long time. Clipping of money became very general about 1278, and the Jews were supposed to be the chief culprits. Those who were suspected, with their Christian accomplices, were arrested, and at the end of the trial 300 Jews were condemned to be hanged, as well as three Christians. Nearly all the goldsmiths and moneyers escaped the death penalty. In 1290 came the final blow when every Jew was expelled from England. It is difficult to understand Edward I's motive in banishing a class of men who were so useful to him. In Stowe's Chronicle, it is said that as their houses were sold, quote, the king made a mighty mass of money, end quote. But the action certainly added to his difficulties and drove him to resort to the Italian financiers, who were no more popular with the citizens than the Jews. The expulsion was ascribed to the instigation of the king's mother, Eleanor, widow of Henry III, but it certainly expressed the will of the nation. Stowe gives the number of Jews banished as 15,060, but this is probably an exaggeration. The number of London Jews is estimated at 2,000. The Old Jewry was originally the ghetto of London, and the burial place of the Jews was on the site of Jewin Street. Mr. Joseph Jacobs, who compiled a valuable account of the Old Jewry, is of the opinion that the Jews no longer lived in this place at the time of the expulsion. There was a Jewry within the liberty of the Tower in the 13th century, and there is still a Jewry Street, Aldgate. The republics of Italy during the Middle Ages were the home of finance, and had advanced far before the other states of Europe in wealth and civilization. The necessities of the great countries of Europe, caused by the Crusades of the 11th and 12th centuries, were the opportunity of companies of moneylenders who acted as the Pope's collectors. Before the close of the reign of Henry III, the Italians had gained a firm footing in England as merchants and moneylenders. Citizens of Siena, Luca and Florence came here and fought with the Jews for the financial control of the country. Matthew Paris relates that Roger, Bishop of London, anathematized the Coercy and banished them from his diocese in 1235 in spite of the support of quote, judges that were servants familiaribus to the Coercy, whom they had elected for their will. End quote. In the early years of Edward I's reign, there were four companies of merchants of Siena acting under the title of Campsores Pape. In his ninth year, the keepers of the exchange delivered £10,000 to Lombard merchants, as they are styled in the record, in part payment of sums they had lent to the king. 
it is recorded that between the twenty-third and twenty-seventh years of his reign, Edward I contracted a debt to the Friscobaldi alone of not less than fifteen thousand eight hundred pounds. The king wanted much money for his wars, and, as he could no longer look to the Jews, he was forced to apply for aid to the Italians. These loans grew so formidable that they caused considerable financial embarrassments in the reign of Edward II. There were a large number of companies, such as the Ricciardi, the Bardi, the Peruzzi, and the Spini, but the Friscobaldi, of which family there were several companies, occur most frequently in London history. Amerigo de Friscobaldi was constable of Bordeaux in the first year of Edward II's reign. Here are two entries from the city records. Quote, 14th of February, 1299 to 1300. Thursday after the feast of St. Valentine came John de Pontes, goldsmith, and acknowledged himself bound to Faldo Yamiano, of the Society of Frescobaldi, in the sum of eight pounds and forty-five pence sterling, to be paid at Easter next. 2nd of February, 1305-6. to Andrew le Marechal acknowledged himself indebted to Bettinus Frescobaldi and his partners, merchants of the company of Frescobaldi, in the sum of one hundred and two pounds, thirteen shillings and fourpence. End quote. The loans in the reign of Edward III were very considerable, and the unpopularity of the Italians was great. In 1376, a petition was presented to the king by the mayor, aldermen, and commons of the city of London against usurious foreign moneylenders dwelling in London, asking that the Lombards might be forbidden from dwelling in the city, or acting as brokers and buying and selling by retail, which they alleged to be against their ancient franchises. The king answered the petition to the effect that if the citizens would put the city under good government for the future, no foreigner should be allowed to dwell, act as broker, or sell by retail in London or the suburbs, save and accept the merchants of the Hans towns. On the whole, we must extend our sympathy to the Italians, for the king was not very prompt in paying his debts, and he considered it immoral to have promised any interest. The effect was that he ruined many of these unfortunate foreigners. The name of Lombard Street occurs in the city books in 1382, and was in common use at the beginning of the 14th century. It is a remarkable fact that the locality in which the Italian financiers first settled in London should obtain a name which has continued to the present day as a synonym of finance, and was used by the late Mr. Badgett as the title of his great work. Matthew Paris tells us that the houses which the Italian moneylenders built for themselves were so costly that, although at one period the Italians were anxious to leave the kingdom to escape the persecutions they suffered from, they were constrained to remain by the loss they feared to incur by deserting their houses. In 1456, a serious attack was made upon the houses of the Lombards by the Mercers and other crafts, led by William Cantelo, alderman and mercer, who was summoned before the king's council and imprisoned. We learn also from the Paston letters that two of the men who joined in the attack were hanged. In Gregory's Chronicle, it is said that the Lombards were compelled to quit London and take up their residence in Southampton and Winchester. Dr. James Gardiner writes of this outbreak, quote, The withdrawal of the Lombard merchants in all probability produced a sensible effect upon the commerce of the city, for they made a bylaw among themselves that no individual merchant of northern Italy should henceforth go to London and trade there. End quote. This ordinance, the Signory of Venice ratified by a decree of the Senate and prohibited under a heavy fine, all Venetian vessels from visiting the port of London. In spite of all this turmoil, affairs settled down again, and the foreigners appeared to have returned to their London houses. In connection with the introduction of Italian bankers into London, the popular derivation of bankrupt from a broken bench is naturally called to mind, and I have tried to find some allusion in the city records to a broken bench in Lombard Street, but without success. In Florio's A New World of Words, or Dictionary in Italian and English, 1598, we find the following entries. Quote, Banca, a bench or a form. Bancarotta, a bankrupt. End quote. In Torriano's edition of Florio, 1650, we come upon these amplified entries. Quote, 
Bankarota, a bankrupt merchant, one that hath broken his credit. Banca Falito, a bank broken, a merchant's credit cracked. This is the explanation that commends itself to Dr. Murray, New English Dictionary, who writes that he cannot trace the reference to a broken bench earlier than that of Dr. Johnson, who introduced the suggestion with the formula, quote, it is said, end quote. There is, however, an early note bearing on this derivation in Sir John Skeen's remarkable little book, De Verborum Significatione, 1641, where we read, under the words Dior, Divor, this explanation, quote, In Latin, sedere bonis, wilk is most commonly used amongst merchants to make bankrupt, bankrupt, or bankrumpe, because the door thereof, as it were, breaks his bank, stall, or seat, where he used his traffic of before. End quote. No earlier date for the use of the word than the reign of Henry VIII has been found by Professor Skeet or Dr. Murray, but surely an earlier reference must be lurking somewhere. In the first folio of Shakespeare, the word is printed bankeraute, pronounced as four syllables, but this was altered in later editions to bankrupt. There can be no doubt that the word is directly derived from bankerota, and that the form bankrupt is an afterthought of the learned to connect it with the Latin language. The point that has to be accounted for is the strange appropriation of an expression meaning broken bench or broken bank to the individual whose credit is broken. This one would naturally expect to be a secondary meaning. In concluding this chapter, it is necessary to make an allusion to the statute merchant, 11 Edward I, for the recovery of debts. The first two letter books of the City of London are chiefly concerned with recognizances of debts, and they are of great value as illustrating the commercial intercourse of the citizens of London in the 13th and 14th centuries with Gascony and Spain, more especially in connection with wine and leather. By the statute of Acton Burnell, 11 Edward I, it was enacted that recognizances of debts should be taken before the mayor and a clerk appointed by the king. Nevertheless, within a very short while after the passing of this statute, and notwithstanding its expressed provision to the contrary, we find the mayor, sheriffs and aldermen declaring that such recognizances should be made before the city chamberlain, who might, if he liked, receive, as he frequently did, the recognizances at his own house instead of at the guildhall. It was ordered that the recognizances should bear, quote, the debtor's seal and also the king's seal, End quote, to be provided for the purpose. This latter seal appears to be no longer in existence. From impressions of it preserved at King's College, Cambridge, and elsewhere, it is found to have been circular and nearly three quarters of an inch in diameter, with the King's bust between two castles with a Lion of England in base. The following entry from Letterbook A forms an interesting illustration of the contents of these books. Quote, Lawrence de Guizot's acknowledged before Henry La Galais, the mayor, that he owed Sir Philip Le Taylor a cask of wine to be delivered on a certain love day, diem amoris, because the said Lawrence killed a dog belonging to him. End, quote. End of chapter 10. End of section 21. Section 22 of the Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 11 The Church and Education, Part 1. The influence of the Church during the medieval period was great. In London, the Dean, and chapter of St. Paul's, secular canons, held the first place after the bishop. Then came other bodies of secular and regular canons, followed by the monks and friars and officers of the hospitals, etc. Last in rank, but most esteemed by the people, came the rectors and vicars of the various parishes. Here was a large army of persons forming the officials of the church, and the buildings of the church occupied a very large portion of the city and of the land beyond its walls. 
Between the secular and the regular clergy, a great feud always existed. During the Saxon period, the number of religious houses was few, but a great increase occurred almost immediately after the conquest. Monasteries grew in number rapidly during the Norman period, but in time, the monks having grown rich and lazy, the need of a revival became evident. The great movement of evangelization which took place during the early Plantagenet period, when the friars came from Italy to England, caused a religious revolution. Poverty and humility were the great principles of the friars, but these were soon forgotten, and in the 14th and 15th centuries, all the regulars became equally obnoxious to the reformers. Wycliffe and his followers preached against them, and writers with such different views as Langland and Chaucer had little but evil to say of them. Chaucer condemns monks and friars alike, and reserves his praise for the poor parish priest. We must first deal with the bishop and the secular clergy, and then consider the conditions relative to the establishment of the regulars, ending with a note on education in London during the Middle Ages. The Cathedral Church of St. Paul's is of great antiquity, and was established in the first period of Saxon Christianity. There have been three buildings on the same site, and the first was erected in the earliest years of the seventh century by Melitus, the missionary bishop, and Ethelbert, king of Kent. Although this church existed for nearly five centuries, no record whatever remains of it. Sir Gilbert Scott wrote, quote, I am not aware that we have any information as to the cathedral built by the companions of Augustine, Melitus and Justus, at London and Rochester. Curiously enough, there continues to this day at Rochester, and continued to the seventeenth century in our own St. Paul's, equally as at Canterbury, a crypt beneath the elevated sanctuary, no doubt the lineal successor and representative of those erected by the missionary bishops, in imitation of the great basilica at Rome, whence they had been sent to evangelize this distant region. End quote. Erkenwald, whose shrine stood at the back of the high altar in the oldest church, was the fourth bishop, A.D. 675 to 693, and it was at his house in London that Archbishop Theodore, the organizer of the Church of England, was reconciled to Bishop Wilfrid after their long estrangement. Elphun, or Alhunus, was Bishop of London in 1012, and performed the burial service over Elpha, or Alphage, Archbishop of Canterbury, who was murdered by the Danes and buried in St. Paul's. William, the chaplain of Edward the Confessor, was consecrated in 1051. He was driven from England with the other foreign prelates in the following year, but returned to his see and died in 1075. It was he who was addressed as William Bishop in William the Conqueror's charter to the citizens of London. The first church of St. Paul's was destroyed by fire at the end of the 11th century, but the exact time is not certain, as Matthew of Westminster and Roger of Wendover give conflicting dates for the rebuilding. There seems to be no doubt that the second cathedral was commenced by Bishop Morris, and as he was not consecrated until 1085, the date given by Dugdale, 1083, must be wrong. Probably the received date of 1087, the last year of William the Conqueror's reign, is more correct. Fire again did great damage in the year 1136, but the work of rebuilding proceeded slowly, and in 1221 the steeple was finished. The choir was rebuilt, and the whole building was nearly completed by 1283. Old St. Paul's was a very grand building which took a prominent position amongst the cathedrals of the country. It was longer than Winchester, and the height of the choir was the same as Westminster. That of the nave was rather less. The crowning glory of Old St. Paul's was its elegant spire, but the building itself had many beauties, the magnificent rose window at the east end of the Lady Chapel, with a beautiful seven-light window beneath, being among these. This grand building, therefore, standing on a hill in the most prominent position of the city, was, for several centuries, the great ornament of London, bringing, in harmony, all the picturesque elements of the medieval town. In the year 1314 the cross fell, and the steeple of wood, being ruinous, was taken down and rebuilt with a new gilt ball. Many relics were found in the cross, which
which were replaced in the new cross, and the new pommel or ball was made of sufficient size to contain ten bushels of corn. A chronicle in Lambeth Palace Library contains an account of the solemn dedication of those relics, which is quoted by Canon Benham. Quote, On the 10th of the calends of June 1314, Gilbert, Bishop of London, dedicated altars, namely those of the Blessed Virgin Mary, of St. Thomas the Martyr, and of the Blessed Dunstan, in the new buildings of the Church of St. Paul, London. In the same year, the cross and the ball, with great part of the campanile of the Church of St. Paul, were taken down because they were decayed and dangerous, and a new cross, with a ball well gilt, was erected, and many relics of diverse saints were, for the protection of the aforesaid campanile, and of the whole structure beneath, placed within the cross, with a great procession, and with due solemnity, by Gilbert the bishop, on the fourth of the nones of October, in order that the omnipotent God, and the glorious merits of his saints, whose relics are contained within the cross, might deign to protect from all danger of storms. End quote. In 1444 the spire was nearly destroyed by lightning and was not repaired until 1462. In the severe fire of 1561, the spire was destroyed and never rebuilt, although the rest of the cathedral was restored in 1566. The great height of the steeple gave point to many a proverb, and in Lodge's Wounds of Civil War, 1594, a clown talks of the, quote, Paul's steeple of honour, end quote, meaning by that phrase the highest point that could be attained. The choristers ascended the spire to a great height on certain saints' days, and chanted prayers and anthems, a custom still observed in the tower of Magdalen College, Oxford, on May Day. The last observance of the custom at St. Paul's is said to have taken place in the reign of Mary I. The western front was originally a plain Norman façade of great size, which was flanked by two strong stone towers. The one on the north was connected with the bishop's palace, while that on the south was called the Lollard's Tower, and was used as the bishop's prison, quote, for such as were detected for opinions in religion contrary to the faith of the church, end quote. Stowe's Survey. Footnote. In 1633, Inigo Jones designed, at the expense of Charles I, a classic portico of some beauty in itself, but quite incongruous to the Gothic design of the rest of the building. The king, however, is said to have intended to rebuild the church, and of this scheme the portico was an instalment, but political events effectually prevented this from being carried out. After the restoration, but before the fire of London, it was proposed to rebuild the cathedral in the style of the Renaissance, under the direction of Wren, who had no more liking for Gothic than Inigo Jones had. End of footnote. St. Paul's churchyard was formerly an enclosure, and not a thoroughfare. The public route to Cheapside from Ludgate Hill passed up the Old Bailey and along Newgate Street. The cathedral close is thus described by the late Dr. Sparrow Simpson. Quote, the wall erected about 1109, and, by letters patent of Edward I, greatly strengthened in 1285, extends from the northeast corner of Ave Maria Lane, runs eastward along Paternoster Row to the north end of Old Change in Cheapside, thence southward to Carter Lane, and on the north of Carter Lane to Creed Lane, back to the Great Western Gate. There are six entrances to the enclosure. The first is the Great Western Gate, by which we have just entered. The second, in Paul's Alley in Paternoster Row, leading to the postern gate of the cathedral. The third at Cannon Alley. The fourth, or Little Gate, where St. Paul's Churchyard and Cheapside now unite. The fifth, St. Augustine's Gate, at the west end of Watling Street. The sixth, at Paul's Chain. End quote. The Great Western Gate spanned the street towards the ends of Creed Lane and Ave Maria Lane. On entering the gate, the west front of the cathedral came in view. The old church of St. Gregory adjoined the main building at the southwest corner. It stood in the same position to the first cathedral, and within its walls the body of St. Edmund, king and martyr, was preserved for a time before it was carried to bury St. Edmund's for honourable burial. 
the early history of this church is lost, and it is not known whether it was destroyed with the first cathedral and rose again from its ashes like the second cathedral, or whether it continued for a time in its original state. It was pulled down before 1645 and not rebuilt. On the northern side of the nave of the cathedral stood the bishop's palace, a large and gloomy building. Still further to the north, past the palace and its grounds, was the cemetery called Pardon Church Hall. Here was a cloister painted with the subjects of the Danse Macabre, or Dance of Death, commonly known as the Dance of St. Paul's. John Lydgate translated out of French the old verses that explained these paintings. Over the east quadrant of the cloister was the Cathedral Library, built by Walter Sherrington, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster in Henry VI's time, and Canon Residentiary. At one time the library was, quote, well furnished with fair written books in vellum, end quote. In the midst of the churchyard was a chapel, first founded by Gilbert, the father of Thomas a Becket, and rebuilt by Dean Moore in the reign of Henry V. Nearby was Minor Canons Hall, and the College of Minor Canons, or Peter's College. The charnel house, with a chapel over it, stood at the northeast, not far from Paul's Cross. Footnote. Paul's Cross was pulled down in 1642, but its site was long marked by a tall elm tree. This mark passed away and the exact position was forgotten. In 1879, however, Mr. F. C. Penrose found the remains of the octagonal base, which are now to be seen at the northeast angle of the choir of the present cathedral. End of footnote. This building existed in the reign of Edward I, and the chapel contained some monuments and alabaster figures. Among the historians of St. Paul's, there is some little confusion respecting these various chapels. Paul's cross holds a very prominent position in the history of the religious life of the Middle Ages, and for many years after. In ages when the voice of the people was largely inarticulate, the preacher has often been the man to make it heard. Stowe describes the cross as having, quote, been for many ages the most solemn place in this nation, for the greatest divines and most eminent scholars to preach at, end quote. And Carlyle calls it a kind of Times newspaper. It is worthy of remark that the position of Paul's cross was near the place where the ancient folk moots were held, and the former continued the traditions of the latter. At the east end of the cathedral was St. Paul's School, founded by Dean Collett, and the famous bell tower, formed of wood covered with lead, and containing the common bell, which called the people to their folk moots, and afterwards four bells, known as the Jesus Bells, because they specially belonged to Jesus Chapel in the crypt of the cathedral. As the open space at the east end was claimed by the citizens as a place for their assemblies in folk moots, so the space at the west end was reserved for the military displays in connection with the appearance of Fitzwalter as bannerer of the city. On the south side of the close, and to the west of the transept, was the old octagonal chapter house, with its own two-storied cloister built in 1332. This was a small but beautiful building. Footnote. During the Commonwealth it was proposed to turn the so-called Convocation House into a meeting place for Mr. John Simpson's congregation. A plan, dated 1657, in the Public Records Office, shows the remains of the pillars of the cloisters as they were then. End of footnote. Close by stood the house of the Chancellor. On the southwest is the deanery, first built by Ralph de Dicito, and more westward various houses for the use of the canons. On the south side of the cathedral also stood the dormitory, refectory, kitchen, bakehouse, and brewery of the college. The brew house became subsequently the Paul's Head Tavern. This brief list of the buildings in the old cathedral close will give some idea of the arrangement of the College of Secular Canons and the houses which they occupied. Having walked round the close, we may now enter the cathedral church at the western end, where were three gates or entries. The middle gate had a massive pillar of brass, to which the leaves of the great door were fastened. In the nave were twelve noble Norman bays with Norman triforium and pointed clerestory windows. 
It is probable that originally the roof of the nave was a flat painted ceiling, but Mr. Ferry supposes that a vaulted roof was added in 1255. Apparently, this was originally of wood, but that stone vaulting was intended may be inferred from the flying buttresses in some of the pictures of the cathedral. The view along the nave, as represented in Hollar's engraving, is very fine, and reminds one of the noble nave at Eli. Both the nave and the choir had twelve bays counting from the west door. The second bay of the north side contained the court of convocation, and close by was the font near which Sir John Montacute desired in his will, 1388, to be buried. Quote, if I die in London, then I desire that my body may be buried in St. Paul's, near to the font wherein I was baptised. In the tenth bay was the Chantry Chapel of Thomas Kemp, Bishop of the Diocese, 1448-1489, and rebuilder of Paul's Cross. In the eleventh bay, on the south side, was the tomb of Sir John Beauchamp, Knight of the Garter, died 1358, Constable of Dover Castle, and son to Guy Beauchamp, Earl of Warwick. This tomb was commonly called after Duke Humphrey, and the nave of the church from this misnomer went by the name of Duke Humphrey's Walk. On May Day, watermen and tankard bearers came to the tomb early in the morning, strewed herbs upon it, and sprinkled it with water. At the foot of this tomb was the image of the Virgin, before which a lamp was kept perpetually burning, and every morning after matins a short office was said before it. A taper was also kept burning before the great crucifix, near to the north door, fabulously said to have been discovered by King Lucius, A.D. 140. Richard Martin, Bishop of St. David's in the reign of Edward IV, had a special veneration for this crucifix, and left an annual gift to the choristers that they might sing before it, Sancte Deus Fortis. Footnote. The amount of the offerings in St. Paul's during the Middle Ages must have been enormous. For instance, the receipts at the Great Crucifix in May 1344 amounted to no less than fifty pounds in the money of that day. End of footnote. In the north aisle was the famous Sequis door, on which notices were fixed. Originally, these were probably purely ecclesiastical, but in course of time all classes made their wants known there. Decker writes, quote, The first time that you venture into St. Paul's, pass through the body of the church like a porter, yet presume not to fetch so much as one whole turn in the middle aisle, no, nor to cast an eye to Sequis door, pasted and plastered up with serving men's supplications, before you have paid tribute to the top of Paul's steeple with a single penny. End quote. Bishop Hall, in his satires, shows that churchmen could be hired there too. Quote, Sawst thou ever sequis patched on Paul's church door, to seek some vacant vicarage before? End quote. This practice is alluded to by Chaucer. Quote, he set not his benefice to hire, and leet his sheep encumbered in the mire, and ran to London unto St. Paul's, to seek in him a chauntry for souls. Prologue to Canterbury Tales. End quote. Passing from the nave to the transept, we notice that the central tower was treated as a lantern internally, and was open to the base of the spire. The choir was cut off by a screen with a central archway. On each side of the entrance were four canopies with figures beneath them. An ascent of twelve steps took the worshipper to the level of the choir pavement. The choir was naturally the most gorgeous portion of the cathedral. The architecture was pure and noble, and the carved woodwork of the canon stalls was famous for its beauty. The rear doss and high altar, dedicated in honour of St. Paul, formed the chief attraction of the choir. There was also an altar to the north, dedicated in honour of St. Ethelbert, king and confessor, and one to the south, dedicated to St. Miletus. Six more steps led to the sanctuary, from which the worshipper could pass behind the altar screen. Eastward of the screen was the famous shrine of St. Erkenwald. Mention has already been made of the original tomb in the first cathedral. Legend reports that in the fire of the 11th century, the saint's resting place alone remained unharmed. 
On the 14th of November, 1148, his bones were transferred to a more noble tomb. Gilbert de Seagrave laid the first stone of a still more magnificent shrine in 1314, in which the body of the saint was placed on the 1st of February, 1326. This was, for a long period, the most famous of the tombs of old St. Paul's, to which pilgrims flocked from distant parts, and riches of all kinds were lavished upon it. A canon of the church, Walter de Thorpe, gave to it all his gold rings and jewels. The dean and chapter in 18 Edward II presented a rich store of gold and silver and precious stones. In the 31st of Edward III, three goldsmiths were engaged upon it for a whole year, at wages of eight shillings a week for one, and five shillings a week for each of the others. King John of France, when he was a prisoner in England, made an offering of twelve nobles, and Richard de Preston, citizen and grocer, presented a remarkable sapphire in the reign of Richard II. This stone was supposed to cure infirmities of the eyes, and the donor directed proclamation to be made of its great virtues. Dean Evere, in 1407, provided an endowment for the lights which burned before the shrine. The choir was full of tombs and brasses, many of them of great importance. On the north side stood the stately tomb of John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, died 1399, with recumbent figures of the Duke and his second wife, Constance of Castile. Special offices were performed at several of the shrines, especially those of St. Erkenwald and St. Thomas of Lancaster, as the grandson of Henry III was popularly styled, although he was never canonized. On the 28th of June, 1323, Edward II sent a letter to Stephen Gravesend, Bishop of London, commanding him to prohibit the reverence paid to Thomas of Lancaster in the cathedral. The high altar was the scene twice a year of a strange custom, which was kept up for several centuries. Sir William Le Band, in 1275, commenced to give yearly a doe in winter and a fat buck in summer to be offered at the altar and then distributed to the resident canons. These were given in lieu of twenty-two acres of land lying within the Lordship of Wesley in Essex, to be enclosed within his park of Torringham, so that the knight appears to have made a very good bargain. The reception of the buck and doe was, quote, till Queen Elizabeth's days, solemnly performed at the steps of the choir by the canons of this cathedral, attired in sacred vestments, and wearing garlands of flowers on their heads, and the horns of the buck carried on the top of a spear in procession round about within the body of the church, with a great noise of hornblowers. End quote. As already stated, the choir was rebuilt early in the 13th century, and in 1255 it was considerably extended. Previously a street ran close to the east end, from Watling Street to Cheapside, and here stood the old church of St. Faith. The exact site of the houses was marked by nine wells in a row which were found by Wren. When this street was built over and the church pulled down, the parishioners were provided with a church in the crypt. About the middle of the north side of the choir was a low arched door, and from this six and twenty steps led down to St. Faith's, at the eastern end of which was the Jesus Chapel. We have now traced the principal features of the exterior and interior of old St. Paul's, and a few words may be said of the body who governed the cathedral. Bishop Stubbs, in the remarkable preface which he added to the Master of the Rolls edition of the historical works of Ralph de Diceto, Dean of London, at the end of the twelfth century, has given a vivid picture of the ecclesiastical greatness of London during the reigns of Henry II and Richard I. Ralph was the friend of Fitzstephen, the biographer of Becket, and before he became dean, he had held the office of archdeacon. Stubbs writes, quote, The fact that the Cathedral of Canterbury was in the hands of a monastic chapter left St. Paul's at the head of the secular clergy of southern England. It was an educational centre, too, where young statesmen spent their leisure in something like self-culture. London, with its 40,000 inhabitants, had 120 churches all looking to the cathedral as their mother. The resident canons had to exercise a magnificent hospitality, carefully prescribed in ancient statutes. Twice a year, each of them had to entertain the whole staff of the cathedral and to invite the bishop, the mayor, the sheriffs, aldermen, justices, and great men of the court. End quote. 
The dean was a capable head, and his government stands out in history as one of the most successful during a very difficult period. Quote, Early in 1187, Ralph lost his old friend and patron, Bishop Folio, and the See of London was not filled up for nearly three years. Within a few weeks after Folio's death, he had to receive the Archbishop of Canterbury, Baldwin, who visited the church on Mid-Lent Sunday, and he took advantage of the opportunity to obtain from him an injunction forbidding the persons who were in charge of the temporalities of the see to interfere with the spiritual officers in the discharge of their duties. End quote. How important a body the chapter of St. Paul's really was may be inferred from the remarkable fact stated by Sergeant Pulling in his work on The Order of the Coif, that among the canons in the reign of Henry III were as many as ten of the judges at Westminster Hall. The early history of the parishes of London is one of great difficulty and complexity. Although some of the parishes must be of great antiquity, we have little authentic information respecting them before the conquest. The dedications of many of the churches indicate their great age, but the constant fires in London not only destroyed the buildings, but also the records within the buildings. The original churches appear to have been very small, as may be judged from their number. It is not easy, however, to understand how it was that when the parishes were first formed, so small an area was attached to each. Mr. Lofty is of opinion that there is no proof that London was divided into more than three or four parishes until the time of Alfred, or indeed, till much later. He has written a very instructive chapter on the Church in London in his London Historic Towns, 1887, but he is not able to give any very definite information. Moreover, he doubts whether it is wise to take for granted the early dedications of, for instance, such churches as are named in honour of Saints Alphage, Magnus and Olev, or of Saints Ethelberga and Ossith. The parish church of which we have the most authentic notice before the conquest is St. Helen's Bishopsgate, in existence many years before the Priory of the Nuns of St. Helen's was founded. In 1010 the remains of St. Edmund, King and Martyr were removed from Edmundsbury in order that they might not fall into the hands of the Danes, and deposited in the Church of St. Helen where they remained for three years. Many of the London churches were small, but some were of considerable size. When the religious houses were dissolved, the churches of some of these became the most important of the parish churches. The Church of St. Mary Le Beau in Cheapside, better known as Bow Church, is named from having been the first in London built on arches of stone, and the Norman crypt is of great interest. When Wren built his church, he used these arches of the old churches to support his own superstructure. This crypt also gives its name to the court of arches which was held here. In the Liber Albus, there is a chapter on the periodical visits of the mayor to various churches on certain saints' days, such as to St. Thomas's at the Feast of All Saints, November the 1st, to St. Peter's on Cornhill on the Monday in the Feast of Pentecost, and to St. Bartholomew's and St. Michael Le Kern on other occasions. The position of the parish priest was a good one in the eyes of the parishioners, who looked up to him as a friend and resented the interference with his duties by monks and chantry priests. Among the parish priests, the highest rank was conceded to the rector of St. Peter's, Cornhill. The medieval writers who are mostly vituperative when speaking of monks and friars have little but good to say of the parson. The great evil of lay rectorship, which has done so much to injure the church, was largely introduced by the monasteries. Bishop Stubbs, in his introduction to the historical works of Ralph de Dicito, writes, quote, St. Paul stood at the head of the religious life of London, and by its side, at some considerable interval, however, St. Martin's Le Grand, St. Bartholomew's Smithfield, and the great and ancient foundation of Trinity, Aldgate. End quote. Besides the chapter of St. Paul's, there were several other bodies of secular canons. One of these was at the Collegiate Church of St. Martin Le Grand within Aldersgate, which church was founded about A.D. 1056, and its privileges confirmed by William the Conqueror. It had special rights as a royal free chapel, and its privileges of sanctuary were given by Henry VIII to the abbot and convent of Westminster. 
Others were the College of St. Michael, Crooked Lane, founded by William Walworth in 1380, Barking College, Holmes College, and several other colleges in London, besides the Collegiate Chapel of St. Stephen, Westminster. The canons regular of the Order of St. Austin occupied the Priory of Christ Church or Holy Trinity, the Priory of St. Bartholomew in Smithfield, the Priory of St. Mary Overy and Southwark, and many hospitals. These canons were less strict than monks, but lived under one roof and had a common dormitory and refectory. They were well shod, well clothed, and well fed. Monks always shaved, but canons wore beards and caps on their heads. The chief rule of the canons regular was that of St. Augustine, or Austin, Bishop of Hippo, A.D. 395. The order was little known until the 10th or 11th centuries, and was not brought to England until after the Norman Conquest, and the designation of Austin canons was not adopted until some years afterwards. The Priory of Christ Church, or the Holy Trinity within Aldgate, was a house of the first importance in London, and the Pope absolved it from all jurisdiction. Norman, the first prior, was the first canon regular of his order in England. The Priory was founded in 1108 by Queen Maud, and in 1125 the land and soak of Knicknengild, now Port Soak and Ward, were assigned to it. The prior became an alderman of London by reason of possessing the soak without the port or gate called Aldgate, an honour continued to his successors till the dissolution of the religious houses, when the church was surrendered and the site of the priory granted by Henry VIII to Sir Thomas Audley, Lord Chancellor. End of chapter 11, part 1. End of section 22. Section 23 of The Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley. Chapter 11 The Church and Education. Part 2. The great Benedictine monastery of black monks was situated at Westminster away from the city, as was usual. This was the only monastic house subject to the rule of St. Benedict in the neighbourhood of London, but the houses of nuns, of which there were many dotted over the suburbs of London, were governed by the rule of St. Benedict. Among these may be mentioned the nunneries of Barking, Clerkenwell, Halliwell at the eastern extremity of Finsbury Fields, St. Helens, Bishopsgate, Kilburn, and Stratford at Bow. As time proceeded, there was a widespread desire for a stricter rule among the monks, and reforms of the Benedictine rule were instituted at Cluny, A.D. 910, Chartreux, about 1080, and Cito, 1098. All these reforms were represented in London. Cluniac Order This reform was begun by Bernan, abbot of Guigny in Burgundy, and perfected by Odo, Abbot of Cluny. The first charter of the order was dated A.D. 910. The order was first brought to England by William, Earl of Warren, son-in-law to William the Conqueror, who built the first house at Lewis in Sussex about 1077. The Priory of Bermondsey in Surrey was founded by Aylwin Child, citizen of London, about 1082. The manor of Bermondsey and other revenues were granted by William Rufus. The original priories were subject to the heads of the parent foreign houses, but John Attleburgh, prior of Bermondsey, having procured the erection of his priory into an abbacy, himself became the first of the abbots in 1399. If we are to believe the word of the satirists, we may judge that the rule of the Cluniac order was hard, for we are told that, quote, when you wish to sleep, they awake you, end quote, and, Quote, when you wish to eat, they make you fast. End quote. There were cells attached to the Cluniac House of Bermondsey at Aldersgate, Cripplegate, and Holborn. Carthusians. Bruno first instituted the order at Chartreux in the Diocese of Grenoble in France about 1080. The rule was confirmed by Pope Alexander III about 1174. 
This was the most strict of any of the religious orders. The monks never ate flesh, and were obliged to fast on bread, water and salt one day in every week. No one was permitted to go out of the bounds of the monastery except the priors and procurators or proctors, and they only upon the necessary affairs of their houses. When the order was brought to England in 1178, the first house was started at Whitham in Somersetshire. In all there were nine houses of the order in England. One of these was the Charter House of London, which was not founded until 1371 by Sir Walter Manny, Knight of the Garter. Until Henry II founded the Carthusian house at Whitham, it is said that there was no such thing known in England as a monk's cell, as we understand the term. It was a peculiarity of the Carthusian order, and when it was first introduced it was regarded as a startling novelty for any privacy or anything approaching solitude to be tolerated in a monastery. The Carthusian system never found much favour in England. Cistercians the Cistercian order was named after Cistertium, or Citeaux, in the bishopric of Chalon in Burgundy, where it was founded in 1098 by Robert, abbot of Molem, in that province. St. Bernard was a great promoter of the order, and founded an abbey at Clairvaux about 1116, and after him the members of the order were sometimes named Bernardines. It was usual to plant these monasteries in solitary and uncultivated places, and no other house, even of their own order, was allowed to be built within a certain distance of the original establishment. This makes it surprising to learn that there were two separate houses of this order in the near neighbourhood of London. A branch of the order came to England about 1128, and their first house was founded at Waverley in Surrey. Very shortly after, about 1134, the Abbey of Stratford Langthorne in Essex was founded by William de Montfichet, who endowed it with all his lordship in West Ham. It was not until two centuries afterwards that the second Cistercian house in the immediate neighbourhood of London was founded. This was the Abbey of St Mary Graces, Eastminster or New Abbey, without the walls of London, which Edward III instituted in 1350 after a severe scourge of plague, the so-called Black Death. The two great military orders, the Knights Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem and the Templars, followed the Augustinian rule, and both were settled in London. The Knights Hospitallers were founded about 1092 by the merchants of Amalfi in Italy for the purpose of affording hospitality to pilgrims in the Holy Land. The hospital or priory of St. John was founded in 1100 by Jordan Brizet and his wife Muriel outside the northern wall of London and the original village of Clerkenwell grew up around the buildings of the knights. A few years after this, the Brethren of the Temple of Solomon at Jerusalem, or Knights of the Temple, came into being at the Holy City, and they settled first on the south side of Holborn, near Southampton Buildings. They removed to Fleet Street, or the New Temple, in 1184, where, as Spencer terms it, quote, they decayed through pride, end quote and the order, after much persecution, was suppressed in England, as it had been in other countries, by command of the Pope. The house in Fleet Street was given in 1313 by Edward II to Aymer de Valence, Earl of Pembroke, at whose death in 1323 the property passed to the Knights of St. John, who leased the new temple to the lawyers, still the occupants of the district. The Templars wore a long flowing white mantle with a red cross on the left breast. The Knights Hospitallers originally wore a black robe with a cross, but subsequently when the order was reconstructed on the model of the Templars, they wore a red mantle with a white cross on the shoulder. After Palestine was lost, the original body passed, one, to Acre, two, to Cyprus, three, to Rhodes, and four, to Malta. The Templars left their beautiful church, to continue for centuries one of the most interesting architectural relics of a past age. The buildings of the Knights Hospitallers at Clerkenwell passed through more vicissitudes, and when the religious houses were suppressed by Henry VIII, these were mostly destroyed. The gateway which was completed in 1504 by Prior Docra still stands, 
but no portion of the church or other building remains above ground. Friars The enthusiasm which brought the great religious movement after the conquest and produced the numerous monastic institutions of the country had cooled by the beginning of the 13th century when the remarkable evangelical revival instituted almost simultaneously by St. Dominic and St. Francis swept over Europe. The distinctive characteristics which at first marked them off from the monks were poverty and care for others. The monks lived apart from the world in order to attend first to their own souls, while the friars placed care for others first of all duties. They preached to and visited the masses. Hence, instead of living in retired spots, they settled in the heart of the cities. In their humility they called themselves brothers rather than fathers, but in course of time they fell far short of the ideals of their founders. Their property increased, and their houses grew to be as rich as those of the monks, and in consequence they became singularly unpopular. Mr. Trevelyan writes in his Age of Wycliffe that while the monks were despised by the reformer, the friars were hated. Black Friars The Spaniard, St. Dominic, founded the order of preaching friars at the beginning of the 13th century. Their rule, which was chiefly that of St. Augustine, was approved of by Pope Innocent III in the Lateran Council, A.D. 1215, by word of mouth and by the bull of Pope Honorius, A.D. 1216. They were called Dominicans from their founder, preaching friars from their office to preach and convert heretics, and black friars from their garments. In France, they were known as Jacobins from having their first house in the Rue Saint-Jacques in Paris. This name gained a portentous meaning in the 18th century from the French revolutionists who met in the disused friary. At first the friars used the same habit as the Austin canons, but about the year 1219 they took another, viz. a white cassock with a white hood over it, and when they went abroad, a black cloak with a black hood over their white vestments. They came to England in 1221, and their first house was at Oxford. Shortly after this they came to London, settled in Holborn near Lincoln's Inn, where they remained for more than fifty years. In 1276 they removed to the neighbourhood of Baynard Castle, where they erected a magnificent house with the help of royal, clerical and other noble benefactors, which has given a name to a London district that it still retains. The place is thus described by Stevens, the monastic historian. Quote, the monastery enjoyed all the privileges and immunities that any religious house had, and having a very large extent of ground within its liberty, the same was shut up with four gates, and all the inhabitants within it were subject to none but the king, the superior of the monasteries, and justices of that precinct, so that neither the mayor nor the sheriffs, nor any other officers of the City of London, had the least jurisdiction or authority therein all which liberties the inhabitants preserved some time after the suppression of the monastery. End quote. Thomas Lord Wake is said to have intended to bring Dominican nuns into England, and he had the king's license for this purpose, but he does not appear to have carried out his intention. The nuns of Dartford in Kent are supposed to have been of this order at one time. Greyfriars The Italian St. Francis was the founder of this order, whose rule he drew up in 1209. It was approved of by Pope Innocent III in 1210, and by the Lateran Council in 1215. His followers were called Franciscans from their founder, Grey Friars from their clothing, and Minor Friars from their humility. Nine Grey Friars landed at Dover in the eighth year of Henry III, 1223 to 1224. Five of them settled at Canterbury, and there founded the first house of the order in England. The remaining four established themselves in London, lodging for fifteen days with the Dominicans in Holborn. These four, we learn from a Cottonian manuscript, were 1. Richard Pugworth, an Englishman, priest, and preacher. 2. Richard Seneneff, English, Clark Acolyte, a youth. 3. Henry Detrus, by nation a Lombard, lay brother. 4. Monachetus, also a lay brother. These four men founded the great London house of Greyfriars, 
they removed to Cornhill, where they erected cells, made converts, and acquired the goodwill of the mayor and citizens. John Ewan, Mercer, appropriated to the use of the friars a piece of ground within Newgate. Here a noble building was erected by the help of numerous distinguished persons, which contained a church, a chapter house, a dormitory, a refectory, an infirmary, etc. The district was long known as Greyfriars, and afterwards as Christ Church or Christ's Hospital. The habit of the friars was a loose garment of a grey colour reaching down to their ankles, with a cowl of the same, and a cloak over it when they went abroad. They girded themselves with cords and went barefoot. In connection with the Franciscans were the nuns of the Order of St. Clair, founded at Assisi by St. Clair about 1212. The nuns observed St. Francis's rule and wore the same coloured habit as the Franciscan friars. They were called poor clairs and also minoresses. About the year 1293, Blanche, Queen of Navarre, wife to Edward, Earl of Lancaster, Leicester and Derby, founded a house for the minoresses on the east side of the street leading from the tower to Aldgate without the walls of the city. This street is still known as the Minories. There were only three other houses of this order in England, viz. at Waterbeach and Denny in Cambridgeshire and Brissyard in Suffolk. Austin Friars The history of the foundation of the Friars Eremites of the Order of St. Augustine has not been given with any fullness, and its origin is somewhat uncertain. They came to England from Italy about 1250, and a house in Broad Street Ward was founded by Humphrey Bohun, Earl of Hereford and Essex, in the year 1253. The habit of the Austin Friars was a white garment and scapulary when they were in the house, but in the choir and when they went abroad, they had over the former a sort of cowl and a large hood, both black. Round their waist they had a black leather girdle fastened with an ivory bone. Footnote. In connection with the history of the Austin Friars, the fact that the Church of the Friary still exists is one of great interest. At the dissolution, a large portion of the Friary was given to Lord St. John, afterwards Marquis of Winchester and Lord Treasurer. The church was reserved by the king, and the nave still remains. End of footnote. White Friars The origin of the Friars of the Blessed Virgin of Mount Carmel is not very clear. Their rule, which was chiefly that of St. Basil, is said to have been given to them by Albert, Patriarch of Jerusalem about 1205, and to have been confirmed by Pope Honorius in 1224. They were driven out of Palestine by the Saracens about 1238, and they then sought refuge in Europe. They were brought into England by John Vassy and Richard Gray, and had their first houses at Huln in Northumberland and Aylesford in Kent. At the latter place they held their first European charter, A.D. 1245. The London House of the Carmelites, or White Friars, was founded in 1241 by Sir Richard Gray on land situated between Fleet Street and the Thames, which was given by Edward I. The garments of the friars at first were white, but having been obliged by the infidels to change them to party-coloured ones, they continued these for fifty years after their coming to England. But about the year 1290 they returned to the use of white again. Footnote Dugdale says that the Patriarch Albert prescribed for the Carmelite friars a party-coloured mantle of white and red, and that Pope Honorius III, disliking this, appointed in 1285 that it should be all white. End of footnote. Of the four chief orders of mendicant friars, the Carmelites ranked last, and in official processions had to give place to the Dominicans, Franciscans and Austin friars. The district which originally contained the House of the White Friars continues still to be known by the old name. After the dissolution of the religious houses, the privileges of sanctuary were still allowed to the inhabitants, and in consequence the place, generally known as Alsatia, gained a most unenviable notoriety. Other places in London obtained an evil repute from the same cause, but White Friars was far beyond all others in disgraceful associations. It is known from old records that the bad repute of the district dates back to a period long before the suppression of the friary. 
from a close roll of the twentieth Edward III, it appears that persons of ill repute had, for a considerable time, made their abode so close to the friary that the friars could not celebrate divine service in their church in consequence of the continual clamours and outcries by which the district was disturbed, and the mayor and aldermen of London were ordered, in the king's name, for the tranquillity of the prior and brethren, to remove the nuisance. Mr. Trevelyan writes, quote, Twenty years before Wycliffe's attack was made, Fitz Ralph, Bishop of Armagh, had laid a famous indictment against the four orders before the Pope at Avignon. It made a great stir at the time, but came to nothing, for the friars were under the Pope's special protection. The bishop chiefly complained of their competition with his secular clergy in the matter of confession and absolution. End quote. Besides the four chief orders, several other orders of friars were settled in London. First in importance of these were the crutched friars, from the cross forming part of the staff carried by them, which was styled a crutch. This was afterwards given up, and a cross of red cloth was placed upon the breast of the gown. The order is said to have been instituted by Gerard, prior of St. Mary of Morella at Bologna, and confirmed in 1169 by Pope Alexander III, who brought them under St. Austin's rule. They came to England in 1244, and had their first house at Colchester. It was not until about 1298 that these friars came to London, and the house in the parish of St. Olave, Hart Street, was founded by Ralph Hosier and William Saburns. The memory of the friary is kept alive in the name of the street that marks its site. Other orders in London were the Friars of the Penance of Jesus Christ, or Di Sacco, and the Friars di Areno. The Friars of the Sack, according to Stowe, first settled in a house near Aldersgate, outside the gate. This was about the year 1257. When the Jews were banished from England by Edward I, these friars were given the synagogue on the south side of Lothbury, at the north corner of the old Jewry. The tenements which the prior and friars held in the street, quote, called Culture District, end quote, were in the parishes of St. Olav in the Jewry, and of St. Margaret de Lothbury. The friars of the Order of St. Mary de Areno were settled at Westminster at a house near Charing Cross, given to them by Sir William de Arno, or Amon. 51 Henry III, and here the small house remained until the death of Huda Ebor, the last friar, 10 Edward II. Bishop Stubbs refers to a cemetery near St. Clement Danes, which once belonged to the Pied Friars, a small order of mendicants which had been suppressed in 1278. In the revised edition of Dugdale's Monasticon by Cayley, Ellis, and Bandinal, there is a notice of the house of the Fratres de Pica or Pied Friars at Norwich, from Bloomfield's History of Norfolk, but no mention is made of any house in London. Tanner says that there is no mention of these friars in any public record, and Taylor, in his Index Monasticus, gives no new information concerning them. Bloomfield says that the friars were called from their outward garment, which was black and white like a magpie. At Hounslow there was a house of Trinitarian or Maturine friars for the redemption of captives. The earliest record known of this priory is a charter dated 1296. Besides the religious houses, there were, during the Middle Ages, many hermitages over the country, and several of these were to be found in London. One was in Monkwell Street, Cripplegate, which was founded by the widow of Sir Aymer de Valence, Earl of Pembroke, who was killed in a tournament in 1324. This was Mary de Castillon, daughter of Guy, Count of St. Paul, third wife of the Earl and the foundress of Pembroke Hall, Cambridge, who established the hermitage for the good of the soul of her husband. London was so full of religious houses, both within and without the walls, that when the great dissolution took place in Henry VIII's reign, large portions of the town were left desolate. Doubtless the time had come for this great revolution, or otherwise, even that king could never have carried it through. The popular feeling which held these great establishments in disfavour had gradually grown. Still, the number of those who were dependent upon the religious houses was very considerable, and great evils followed the dissolution. Multitudes were thrown out of their regular employment, and the poor who were dependent upon the alms bestowed upon them at the gates of the monasteries had to be considered and provided for in some other way. 
The difficulties of this position certainly formed one of the causes of the institution of the poor law in the reign of Henry's daughter Elizabeth. Most of the relics of the various religious houses which occupied so large a portion of London and its environs have been entirely swept away. In the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries, many remains existed. There were then vestiges of St. Helen's Priory, and the old hall of the nunnery was not pulled down until 1799. Relics of Bermondsey Abbey were standing in 1807. The Grand Crypt, built soon after the foundation of the house of the Priory of St. John at Clerkenwell, which was added to and afterwards made to form an undercroft to the choir, is now one of the most interesting of the remains of medieval buildings in London. It is below the church of St. John, Clerkenwell, and has been restored with loving care to much of its original beauty. Other portions of the old buildings of the Priory are to be seen in the cellars of some of the houses round about. The position of the old charter house buildings can still be traced, although little of the old monastery exists, but the east and south walls of the chapel and wash house court can be seen. The latter was built by the monks to accommodate the lay brothers who acted as servants to the convent. The walls of the monastic refectories surround the present brothers' library. Beneath this is the monks' cellar. The friaries situated within the walls of old London have left little but their names to tell the Londoner of today of their existence. Still, even here, something of the past remains. The Church of Austin Friars is left to us, and the position of the choir of the great Franciscan house of Greyfriars is marked by the present Christ Church, Newgate Street. Some traces of the buildings of the White Friars have also been found underground. Sanctuary One of the privileges of the Middle Ages which continued on into comparatively modern times was that of sanctuary, and in its belated form this caused many gross scandals. There are numerous stories connected with the College of St. Martin's Le Grand which was under the jurisdiction of the abbot of Westminster. One of these relates to Richard III and Lady Anne. When the Duke of Gloucester desired to marry Anne, the betrothed of the late Edward Prince of Wales, son of Henry VI, her brother-in-law Clarence objected and hid her away. Richard discovered her in London, disguised as a kitchen maid, and placed her in sanctuary at St. Martin's Le Grand. In 1416 a man was sentenced to the pillory for slandering an alderman but he escaped and found sanctuary at the Monastery of St. Peter's, Westminster. Mr. G. M. Trevelyan, in his work on the Age of Wycliffe, gives a full account of the great scandal which occurred in 1378, when two prisoners escaped from the tower and sought sanctuary in Westminster Abbey. The governor of the tower, with his soldiers, entered the nave and attempted to drag one of the prisoners, who was attending Mass, out of sanctuary. He fled for his life, and his pursuers chased him twice round the choir. He was stabbed to death, and one of the attendants of the church, interfering to save him, was killed in the scuffle. Archbishop Sudbury excommunicated the governor of the tower, Sir Alan Bushell, and all his aiders and abettors. Richard II ordered the reading of the excommunication to be stopped and the church to be reconsecrated. The abbot refused to allow the place to be hallowed, and the services ceased for a while. There was now an open quarrel between church and state, which continued till the Parliament met at Gloucester in October, quote, when the whole question of sanctuary was brought up in all its issues. End quote. Mr. Trevelyan sums up the case in these words quote, In vain Wycliffe argued, in vain the commons petitioned and the lords hectored. From all the mountains of talk in the discussion at Gloucester, there came forth the most absurd legislative mouse in the shape of a statute passed at Westminster by the next Parliament in the spring of 1379. By this act, the fraudulent debtor taking sanctuary was to be summoned at the door of the church once a week for thirty-one days. If at the end of that time he refused to appear, judgment was to go against him by default, and his goods, even if they had been given away by collusion, might be seized by his creditors. This mild measure, which was scarcely an interference with the right of sanctuary itself, was accepted even by the staunchest adherents of the church. End quote. If a felon succeeded in taking sanctuary in a church or other privileged place before capture, he was free from the clutches of the law for the space of forty days. He was allowed to be supplied with food, 
but he was sufficiently guarded to prevent his escape. If he elected to abjure the realm, an oath was administered to him. There seem to have been special privileges of sanctuary in the city, for we learn that at the end of the thirteenth century it was ordered by the alderman that no robber, homicide, nor other fugitive in the churches should be watched. This ordinance was for the purpose of giving a fugitive a chance of escape out of sanctuary. In 1321 a royal pardon was granted to the city for neglecting to keep watch on those who had fled for sanctuary to the city churches. This was granted, however, on the distinct understanding that in future a watch was to be kept on such fugitives in the same manner as in other parts of the realm. In 1334 the mayor was roundly taken to task, and made to do penance by the archbishop for allowing a felon to escape from the church of All Hallows, Grace Church. The sanctuary men were marked by a badge representing cross keys. Education Medieval London was well supplied with facilities for education. We know that there were many schools in various parts of the city, although we still require more definite information. The church supplied the public well with schools, although for a time these fell into decay, and then it was that lay schools came into existence. Bishop Stubbs writes, quote, Over against the many grievances which modern thought has alleged against the unlearned ages which passed before the invention of printing, it ought to be set to the credit of medieval society that clerkship was never despised or made unnecessarily difficult of acquisition. The sneer of Walter Mapp, who declared that in his days the villains were attempting to educate their ignoble and degenerate offspring in the liberal arts, proves that even in the twelfth century the way was open. Richard II rejected the proposition that the villains should be forbidden to send their children to the schools to learn clergy, and even at a time when the supply of labour ran so low that no man who was not worth twenty shillings a year in land or rent was allowed to apprentice his child to a craft, a full and liberal exception was made in favour of learning. Every man or woman, the words occur in the petition and the statute of artificers passed in 1406, of what state or condition that he be, shall be free to set their son or daughter to take learning at any school that pleaseth them within the realm. End quote. Again, quote, schools were by no means uncommon things. There were schools in all cathedrals, monasteries and colleges were everywhere, and wherever there was a monastery or a college, there was a school. Towards the close of the Middle Ages, notwithstanding many causes for depression, there was much vitality in the schools. End quote. The larger English abbeys about the country not only had schools within their own precincts, but others dependent upon them in the neighbouring towns. Fitzstephen, in his description of London as preserved in the city's Liber Customarum, particularises the Church of St. Martin le Grand as one of the principal churches of London which had ancient and prerogative schools, the others being St. Paul's and Holy Trinity, Aldgate. In other texts of Fitzstephen's work, the names of the churches are not mentioned, and Stowe, overlooking the text in the city archives, gives the three schools as attached to St. Paul's, St. Peter's Westminster, and St. Saviour's. Fitzstephen's patron, St. Thomas of Canterbury, received his early education at one of the London schools after leaving the school of the canons regular at Merton, and before proceeding to the university. In 1447, four parish priests, in a petition to Parliament, begged the commons to consider the great number of grammar schools, quote, that some time were in diverse parts of the realm, beside those that were in London, and how few there be in these days. End quote. They asked leave to appoint schoolmasters in their parishes to be removed at their discretion. King Henry VI granted the petition, but subjected the priest's discretion to the advice of the ordinary. During this king's reign, nine grammar schools were opened in London alone. End of chapter 11. End of section 23. Section 24 of The Story of London. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones.
The Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley Chapter 12 London from Medieval to Modern Times Medieval London was almost entirely within the walls, but outside the walls to the west there was a connecting line of mansions on the riverfront leading to the village of Charing and on to Westminster, which is almost of equal antiquity with London itself. When the body of Queen Eleanor arrived at its last stage, the funeral procession stopped a fair way from Westminster Abbey. One might have expected that the body would have remained under the shadow of its last resting place, and we are, therefore, led to inquire why the village of Charing was chosen. The only answer to this question that can be given is that here, on the site of Northumberland House, now occupied by Northumberland Avenue, there then stood a hospital and chapel of St. Mary belonging to the Priory of Ronceval, Roncevals, or de Rousy de Val, in the Diocese of Pampelon in Navarre. At the death of Eleanor, this house was a comparatively recent establishment, having been founded by William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, in the reign of Henry III, but it probably afforded sufficient accommodation for the funeral procession for one night. The house was suppressed as an alien priory in the reign of Henry V, but restored in that of Edward IV for a fraternity. In the yearbooks of Henry VII, the master, wardens, brethren, and sisters of Ronceval are mentioned, and these continued until the general suppression. The cross, which gives its name to the place, was erected in the years 1291 to 1294, and is supposed to have been the handsomest of the series. As good a copy of the original as our imperfect information allows is to be seen within the railings of the southeastern railway terminus. Westminster is of unknown antiquity, and was long known, from its wild growth of underwood, as Thorny, before the abbey and the palace arose to give the place a name which marked its position in relation to London and St. Paul's. There is but little authoritative history before Edward the Confessor and the consecration of the abbey church in 1065, but the history since that time is so considerable, and of so important a character, that it is impossible to do more than refer in these few words to what is universally acknowledged by all Englishmen to be the most hallowed building in the country. On the opposite shore of the Thames is Lambeth, where is situated the manor house of the Archbishops of Canterbury, now called Lambeth Palace. The site was originally given to the See of Rochester by the Countess Gouda, sister of Edward the Confessor, and wife of Eustace, Count of Boulogne. But in the year 1197 the Bishop of Rochester made an exchange with the Archbishop of Canterbury for this place for other property, and Lambeth has ever since been the London residence of the Archbishops. From here we pass over Lambeth Marsh to Southwark, a place whose history has been intimately associated with that of the City of London, and is now an integral part of the county. The chief glory of the borough is the grand church of the Augustinian Priory of St. Mary Overy, dating from the beginning of the twelfth century, and now known as St. Saviour's. Southwark has been, from the earliest times, the chief thoroughfare to and from London and the southern counties and towns, and the cities of the continent. From this cause it was for centuries the quarter for famous old inns, beginning in order of importance with the bear at the bridge foot, the tabard of Chaucer, and following on with the King's Head, the White Hart, and the George, a portion of the latter hostelry only remaining to the present day. Southwark was also notorious for its prisons, the King's Bench, the Marshalsea, the White Lion, the Borough Compter, and the Clink. The last named was on the Bankside, so intimately associated from the earliest times with the rough sports of the Londoners, and in Elizabeth's reign, the chief home of the dramatic displays of that great period. The bank was then a long, straggling street, extending from the manor of Paris Garden on the west to the liberty of the clink on the east. Near Paris Garden was the Falcon Inn, which was once supposed to have been the resort of Shakespeare. This apparently is an error, for at the time of the great dramatist's death there appears to have been no inns on the bankside. Little or nothing actually exists now that was there in the sixteenth century, but the contour of the street and nearly every name have lasted in their integrity, and probably will last for many a long year more. Although during the reigns of the Tudor sovereigns the Renaissance became triumphant, the men and women of London still continued to live in a town which retained its medieval characteristics. 
Two striking scenes in the history of London during the reign of Mary I may be alluded to here. When the Queen made known her intention of marrying Philip of Spain, the discontent of the nation found vent in the rising of Sir Thomas Wyatt, and the city had to prepare itself against attack. Wyatt took possession of Southwark, and expected to have been admitted into London, but finding the gate of the bridge closed against him and the drawbridge cut down, he marched to Kingston. Having restored the bridge there, which had been destroyed, he proceeded towards London. In consequence of the breakdown of some of his guns, he imprudently halted at Turnham Green. Had he not done this, he might have obtained possession of the city. He planted his ordnance on Hay Hill, and then marched by St. James's Palace and Charing Cross. Here he was attacked by Sir John Gage with a thousand men, but he repulsed them, and reached Ludgate without further opposition. He was disappointed at the resistance which was made, and after musing a while, quote, upon a stall over against the Bell Savage Gate, end quote, he turned back. His retreat was cut off, and he surrendered to Sir Maurice Barclay. To picture another striking scene, we must move from the west side of London to the north. Outside Cripplegate was built a barbican or watchtower as an outwork for observance, and the little village, with its fore street, which grew up outside the walls, was sheltered behind it. The care of this important position was naturally given to trustworthy persons. Edward III appointed Robert Ufford, Earl of Suffolk, keeper of the Barbican, and from him it descended, in course of time, to Catherine, daughter of William Lord Willoughby de Aresby, who married, firstly, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, and secondly, Richard Bertie. Bertie and his wife were Protestants, and in Queen Mary's reign their lives were in such danger that they were forced to arrange in secrecy for their flight. Between four and five o'clock in the morning of the 1st of January 1554 to 1555, the Duchess began her adventurous journey in a thick fog. She could place no confidence in the bulk of her dependents, and there was great difficulty in arranging for company and baggage. As she was leaving, one Atkinson, a herald, issued from the house bearing a torch in his hand, and evidently bent on discovering the cause of the unusual bustle at this early hour. Fearing to be discovered, as she stood up under a gateway, she moved on quietly and left her baggage at the gatehouse. Finding that the herald still followed, she bade her servants to hasten onwards to Lion Quay, where she proposed to embark. Taking with her only two servants and her child, quote, she stepped into Garter House hard by, End quote. She dared not pass into the city through Cripplegate, but walked on to Moorgate. Thence she proceeded across town to the port of embarkation. Eventually she joined her husband, who had preceded her in Flanders. Soon after her escape, she gave birth to a son at Vesel. He was named Peregrine, from the circumstance of his being born in a foreign land and during the wandering of his parents. This name was long continued in the family. The child grew up to be one of Queen Elizabeth's greatest generals, popularly known as Brave Lord Willoughby. Quote, but the bravest man in battle was Brave Lord Willoughby. End quote. There is a special fascination to us now in a picture of Elizabethan London, for with its history are bound up some of the most interesting incidents in the lives of the statesmen and other great men of the spacious days of the great Queen. And have we not Shakespeare? and Ben Jonson among those who have portrayed the various places for us. London has always appealed to the imagination of the adventurous country youth to be the home of golden promise. If he can only get there, he believes that his successful career has commenced. But it appears that in Elizabeth's reign there was pretty much the same difficulty in obtaining employment as there is now. This is illustrated by a curious account of the early life of John Sadler, a native of Stratford-on-Avon, and one of Shakespeare's contemporaries which has come down to us. Quote, he joined himself to the carrier and came to London, where he had never been before, and sold his horse in Smithfield, and having no acquaintance in London to recommend him or assist him, he went from street to street and house to house, asking if they wanted an apprentice, and though he met with many discouraging scorns and a thousand denials, he went on till he lighted on one Mr. Brokesbank, a grocer in Bucklersbury who, though he long denied him for want of sureties of his fidelity, and because the money he had, but ten pounds, 
was so disproportionate to what he used to receive with apprentices, yet upon his discreet account he gave of himself and the motives which put him upon that course, and promised to compensate with diligent and faithful service whatever else was short of his expectation, he ventured to receive him upon trial, in which he so well approved himself that he accepted him into his service, to which he bound him for eight years. End quote. The outdoor life of this time, with the men and women who frequented the streets, is brought vividly before our eyes in Ben Jonson's plays. The useful and useless members of society pass across the stage. The water carriers who congregate around the conduits are represented by Cobb in Every Man in His Humour. Before Sir Hugh Middleton made the new river and brought to men's houses, all water that was wanted had to be fetched from the conduits. The men who supplied the town drew off the water into large wooden tankards, broad at the bottom but narrow at the top, which held about three gallons. This vessel was borne upon the shoulder, and to keep the carrier dry, two towels were fastened over him, one to fall in front and the other to cover his back. The narrowness of the old London streets is strikingly shown in The Devil is an Ass where the lady and her lover speak gentle nothings to each other from the windows of two contiguous buildings. All the fashions of this time, the rapier fighting of the gallants, the smoking madness of all classes at a time when tobacco was supposed to be the panacea for all the ills of human nature, the custom of garnishing conversation with oaths, are introduced in the books of Ben Jonson. The poet's love of good liquor and social intercourse made him a frequenter of inns, his acquaintance with the two rival taverns of Cheapside, the Mermaid and the Mitre, must have commenced early, because the names of both occur in the first quarto of Every Man in His Humour, 1601. In the later folio edition, the Mitre is changed to the Star and the Mermaid to the Windmill. The ever-memorable Mermaid was situated on the south side of Cheapside, between Bread Street and Friday Street. From the mention of this tavern in the first draft of every man in his humour, it may be inferred that Johnson was a frequenter before the famous club, consisting of Shakespeare, Johnson, Beaumont, Fletcher, Carew, Don, Selden and others, was established by Sir Walter Raleigh in 1603. The Mitre was a rival house, and some writers tried to write it up at the expense of the mermaid. Thus Middleton has the following dialogue in his comedy, Your Five Gallants, 1608. Quote, Goldston. Where sup we, gallants? Personae. At Mermaid. Goldston. Sup there who list, I have forsworn the house. Personae. Faith, I'm indifferent. Bungler. So are we, gentlemen. Personae. Name the place, Master Goldston. Goldston. Why, the mitre, in my mind, for neat attendance, diligent boys, and, push, excels it far. All. Agreed, the mitre then. End quote. The windmill in the old jury, which occupies so prominent a position in the revised edition of Every Man in His Humour, was a house with a long history. It was first of all a synagogue for the Jews of the neighbourhood. Then it was granted by Henry III to the prior and brethren of the order of friars called the Fratres de Sacca, and in 1439 it was occupied by Lord Mayor Robert Large. In 1492, Sir Hugh Clopton, the worthy who built Clopton Bridge at Stratford-on-Avon, kept his mayoralty in the mansion which, a hundred years afterwards, was turned into a tavern. The Devil in Fleet Street was one of the most famous of the places of entertainment of the time. It is not known when Ben Jonson started the Apollo Club here, but it was probably not long before 1616 when The Devil is an Ass was acted. Herrick, in his well-known ode, mentions several other taverns to which Ben and his sons resorted. Quote, ah, Ben, say how or when. Shall we thy guests meet at those lyric feasts, made at the sun, the dog, the triple tun, where we such clusters had, as made us nobly wild, not mad, and yet each verse of thine outdid the meal, outdid the frolic wine. End quote. It was in Johnson's day that the suburbs, which, as previously referred to, had long been treated with disfavour, were gradually asserting themselves, and the poet was particularly at home in the understanding of their peculiarities. 
of the northern suburbs, the fullest mention is to be found in A Tale of a Tub, where we read of Totten Court, Kentish Town, Maribone, Kilbourne, Islington, and Belsize, and the fields near Pancras. If we look for Hoxton in a modern map of London, we shall find it near Old Street, St. Luke's, not far from the centre of the present London, but in Johnson's time it was a country place, cut off from the city by moorfields. Noel's house, every man in his humour, was at Hogsden, which was then, according to Stowe, quote, a large street with houses on both sides, end quote. Master Stephen describes his uncle's property as, quote, Middlesex land, end quote, and he himself is called a country gull, in opposition to Master Matthew, the town gull. Ben had reason to remember Hoxton, for it was in the fields close by that he fought and nearly killed Gabriel Spencer. Moorfields remained for several years in an almost impassable condition, but in 1511 regular dikes and bridges of communication over them were made in order partially to drain the rotten ground. In the play so frequently referred to we find Turnbull mentioned by Bobadil, among other disreputable places, as one of the, quote, skirts of the town, end quote. Turnbull, or more properly, Turnmill Street, was situated near Clerkenwell Green, and was known as the haunt of ruffians, thieves, and disorderly persons. Justice Shallow boasted to Falstaff of the wildness of his youth and the feats he had done in Turnbull Street. On the west, the Oxford Road, commencing at the village of St Giles, was in the country, and where Stratford Place now stands was a cottage among trees and hedges called the Lord Mayor's Banqueting House, which was used by the city magnates when they hunted at Bayswater and Hyde Park. This is alluded to in The Devil is an Ass. Quote, but we got the gentleman to go with me and carry her bedding to a conduit head, hard by the place towards Tyburn which they call my Lord Mayor's Banqueting House. End quote. Eastward for Ratcliffe is a cry in The Alchemist. Ratcliffe, which Stowe remembered as a highway, with fair elm trees on each side, in later times became the synonym of all that is dangerous and disreputable in London streets. The actor William Kemp, in describing his remarkable Morris dance from London to Norwich, 1600, writes, quote, Being past Whitechapel and having left fair London, multitudes of Londoners left not me, either to keep a custom which many hold, that Mile End is no walk without a recreation at Stratford Bow with cream and cakes, or else for love they bear towards me, or perhaps to make themselves merry if I should chance, as many thought, to give over my Morris within a mile of Mile End. End quote. Shakespeare lived outside the city walls, and although we cannot exactly tell the position of his houses, it is pretty certain that he lived both in the parish of St. Helen, Bishopsgate, and in the Clink on the Bankside. Stuart London followed Tudor London, but with the death of James I in 1625, the older history may be said to close, for there was a considerable change during the reign of Charles I. The upper classes moved westward to Lincoln's Inn and Great Queen Street and Covent Garden. The great architect Inigo Jones built houses for them in both these districts. There was a certain stagnation in the movements of the population during the period of the Commonwealth, but at the restoration of Charles II, a new life came into existence. The exiled cavaliers returned to their country and found their fathers' houses in the city of London either occupied by others or unfitted for their reception. In consequence, they migrated to a district far from the city. The builders were busy in covering fields with houses, and Pall Mall, where the game of that name had been played, was planned out as a fine street, which remains to the present day. Lords Clarendon, Burlington and Berkeley erected mansions in Piccadilly, and Lord St Albans created St James's Square. Many others followed the example of these leaders of society, and the upper classes were completely cut off from the city. The contemptuous references to the traders of London which are first noticed in Elizabeth's reign became common. The sits were laughed at, and the courtiers poured out a torrent of abuse upon all those who lived in the East. The Great Fire of London of 1666 made an enormous change in the topography of London, and caused great misery, 
but it is supposed to have been a blessing in disguise as it cleared out many a centre of plague and disease. When we read of the heroism of the homeless Londoner, we must feel proud of our ancestors. They had lost everything, but they did not sit down and wring their hands. When the streets were destroyed by fire, the river became more than ever a highway, and boats filled with the goods of the sufferers covered the waters. Moorfields formed a handy open space, and soon streets of huts were raised to shelter the homeless families. Wren, England's greatest architect, John Evelyn, the most accomplished man of his time and the model of a royalist gentleman, and Robert Hooke, the great philosopher, were all three ready within a few hours of the fire with plans for the rebuilding of the city. But none of the plans were adopted, although all had their good points, and Wren's especially would certainly have given us fine avenues and convenient thoroughfares. The difficulties in carrying out these schemes would no doubt have been very great, and it is useless now to regret that a great opportunity was lost. Wren and Hook were appointed to superintend the progress of the work of making London arise anew out of its ashes. The Act of Parliament passed to regulate the work of rebuilding was a very practical and altogether excellent statute. In fact, the way in which all concerned in the complicated business of raising a new city worked in unison is worthy of every praise. At the same time that they proceeded with their labours, they did not allow the trade and business of a country centre to fall out of gear and this does the greatest credit to all concerned, both governors and governed. While the burnt town remained a waste, there must have been overwhelming inconveniences, but no time was allowed to be lost, and in the end a new city arose infinitely superior in comfort and convenience to that which had gone before, although certainly it was not so picturesque. Before passing on to take a rapid view of the later periods of London life, some mention may be made of a few of the interesting buildings that escaped the fire and have not previously been alluded to in these pages. Outside the confines of the city to the west grew up from early times a district with many various associations. Curious traditions and odd customs gather round the history of the parish of St Clement Danes, where Westminster and London met, which still suggest many points of special interest well worthy of fuller investigation than they have as yet received. The accompanying view shows Temple Bar and the Old World Houses of Butcher Row. The first mention of Temple Bar is in a grant of land, quote, Extra Baram Novi Temple, end quote, in 1301. At that time there was no building but merely posts, rails and chain to mark the extent of the liberties of London. In course of time a gate was erected, and the one which existed at the time of the Great Fire was pulled down, and a new gate was erected in 1670 to 1672 from the designs of Sir Christopher Wren. This, after existing for two centuries as one of the best-known objects in London, was removed in the winter of 1878 to 1879. The stones remained exposed to the weather for ten years before Temple Bar was re-erected at the entrance to the late Sir Henry Moe's private grounds at Fearbold's, Waltham Cross. The erection was completed on the 3rd of December, 1888, and the gate in its new position and restored condition presents a very handsome appearance, showing it to be worthy of its great architect. The history of Butcher Row is crowded with incidents in the lives of authors and the unfortunate hangers-on to literature. The timber-framed house with projecting upper stories and barge-boarded gables, the front decorated with fleur-de-lis and coronets, was known as Beaumont House, and it is said that Sully, then Marquis of Rosny, supped and slept there on his arrival in London, 1603, as ambassador to James I. Butcher Row was pulled down in 1813, and Pickett Street was erected in its place. This street was pulled down to make way for the new law courts, and now nearly the whole northern portion of St Clement's Parish has been cleared away. A great improvement has been made, but in order to obtain this, many picturesque houses of interest have had to be destroyed. Returning within the bar to the city, and walking up Chancery Lane, we come to Lincoln's Inn Gateway, one of the three historical gateways of importance in London, the other two being St John's Gate Clerkenwell, and the entrance to St James's Palace. This gatehouse of brick was built by Sir Thomas Lovell, Knight of the Garter, son of the executor of Henry the Seventh, and bears the date upon it of 1518. This interesting building, although perfectly sound and in good condition, 
was shored up a few years ago when old chambers by the side of it were pulled down and rebuilt, and it then narrowly escaped destruction. Efforts were successfully made to save the gate, and it is to be hoped that it may remain to give distinction to Chancery Lane for many years. Returning to Chancery Lane and crossing Holborn, we come to Gray's Inn. The fine hall, which is full of associations of the deepest interest, was built between the year 1555 and 1560. Of the hall which it replaced there is no record, save that in 5 Edward VI, 1551, it, quote, was sealed with fifty-four yards of wainscot at two shillings a yard. End quote. The present hall has the great distinction, according to Mr. Halliwell Phillips, of being quote, one of the only two buildings now remaining in London in which, so far as we know, any of the plays of Shakespeare were performed in his own time. End quote. The other, of course, being the Middle Temple Hall where Twelfth Night was acted on February the second. 1601-2. to two. The Comedy of Errors was played on the evening of Innocence Day, December the 28th, 1594, in the hall before a crowded audience. Some of the guests from the Inner Temple created a disturbance because they were not properly accommodated, and this led to an official inquiry. Mr. Sidney Lee thinks it probable that Shakespeare himself was not present, as he was acting on the same day before the Queen at Greenwich. Another performance of the play was given in the hall by the Elizabethan Stage Society on December the 6th, 1895. George Gascoigne's Jocasta, adapted from the Phoenice of Euripides, was acted in the refectory in 1566. Gray's Inn was famous for its masks and revels, and on July the 7th, 1887, in honour of Queen Victoria's Jubilee, the benches of Gray's Inn presented in the hall to a distinguished audience the Mask of Flowers, which had been performed before James I on Twelfth Night, 264 years before. Gray's Inn had a brilliant role of members in the 16th and 17th centuries, but it is Bacon's spirit that seems to haunt the whole place. He helped the students in preparing their revels, probably wrote a mask or masks, and planted trees in the gardens, the arrangement of which he is believed to have superintended. His name remains in Verulam buildings. Returning to Holborn, and walking a little to the west, we come to the impressive front of Staple Inn, the most remarkable street front of old houses still in existence in London. The origin of the place is unknown, and nothing satisfactory has been discovered respecting the meaning of the name, or as to what it was before it came into the occupation of the Inn of Chancery. There is a tradition that it originally belonged to the merchants of the Staple, it was purchased by the benches of Gray's Inn in 1529, and in Elizabeth's reign there were 154 students in term and 69 out of term. It was bought in 1884 by the Prudential Assurance Company for £68,000, and the Holborn front was restored and cleared from plaster covering the timber beams. There are now very few old street fronts of interest in London, one or two in the Strand, and some in the great roads out of London, but a few years ago there were many still remaining in the Whitechapel and Mile End roads, and in Bishopsgate Street without. In the latter street, number 169, there was, until lately, the remains of the mansion of Sir Paul Pindar, an eminent English merchant, who died in 1650, distinguished for his love of architecture and the magnificent sums he gave towards the restoration of old St Paul's Cathedral. In 1617 to 1618, the house was occupied by the Venetian embassy. In its last days, it was used as a public house, with the sign of Sir Paul Pindar's Head. When it was pulled down, the front was obtained for the South Kensington Museum, where it was re-erected. The London of Johnson and Hogarth was not a handsome city, but it was a social one, and we owe to these two men many vivid pictures of the life lived in it. They were both true Londoners, but they were not alone in their love for their city, for a marked feature in the character of the 18th century Londoner was his intense feeling that here only was life to be lived with true enjoyment. Much of the life was frivolous, and some of it worse than that. But among the respectable classes, the opportunities for social intercourse were greater than now, when large numbers of the workers live out of London, some in the north and some in the south, 
and it takes as long to get from Hampstead to Croydon as to travel a hundred miles into the country. During the 18th century, London continued to grow, but it became uglier every day. The original growth was along the course of the river, but near the middle of the century a little building was commenced to the north of Oxford Street, when Cavendish Square and the surrounding streets were laid out. Soon afterwards, the new road from the Angel at Islington to the Edgware Road, now renamed Pentonville, Euston and Marylebone Roads, was planned. The opening of this road greatly facilitated the locomotion of the town, but it was disliked by the dwellers in what was then thought to be the north of London, who had their view of the country cut off. When Queen Square was built in the reign of Queen Anne, it was left open to the north, as it has remained to this day, in order to enable the inhabitants to have a view of Hampstead and Highgate. The gardens of Bedford House, which stood on the north side of Bloomsbury Square, had an uninterrupted view of the country, and the Duke of Bedford strongly opposed in the House of Lords the bill for making the new road. On this opposition, Horace Walpole cynically remarked to Conway, March the 25th, 1756, quote, a new road through Paddington has been proposed to avoid the stones. The Duke of Bedford, who is never in town in summer, objects to the dust it will make behind Bedford House, and to some buildings proposed, though, if he was in town, he is too short-sighted to see the prospect. End quote. The gardens of Bedford House were famous for their beauty and for the trees which flourished there, the ancient stems of the light and graceful acacia being specially mentioned by Walpole. Behind Montague House, now the British Museum, was Capper's Farm, which extended to Tottenham Court Road. The old farmhouse still exists behind Messrs. Heel and Sons' shop, number 195 Tottenham Court Road. Near where University College in Gower Street now stands was a wild district known as the Field of Forty Footsteps, which had a bad repute as the scene of a sanguinary duel about the time of the Monmouth Rebellion between two brothers who were both killed. No grass would grow over the footsteps trodden by the duelists, which were said to be recognisable until the year 1800 when the ground was built over. A little further east, where Cromer Street now stands, was a wayside inn named The Boot, which is made by Dickens in his Barnaby Rudge, the meeting place of the Gordon Rioters of 1780. The site of this inn is still occupied by a public house with the same sign. Even after these fields were built upon, the air continued so good that the gardens round about produced excellent fruit. When Lord Eldon lived at number 42 Gower Street at the beginning of the 19th century, his peaches and vegetables were famous. Nectarines were grown at 6 Upper Gower Street in 1800, and grapes were also successfully cultivated there. The district north of the new road is of a clayey soil and without a sufficient water supply, so that the ground remained unbuilt upon until... At the beginning of the 19th century, several new water companies came into existence and the building operations were commenced. Since that time the suburbs have continued to increase, and a great start was given to the increased growth of the town after the holding of the Great Exhibition of 1841. Before the middle of the 19th century, the growth of London had been continually increasing, but it was not until after 1851 that the abnormal growth set in. The commissioners of the exhibition of 1851 bought a large property at Brompton and the district of South Kensington sprang into existence. The glass and iron forming the exhibition buildings were transferred to Sydenham and the Crystal Palace was erected there. Soon this rural district, where gypsies once told fortunes, was covered with houses. This was the beginning of the onward march of bricks and mortar which is going on still so rapidly that on all sides we have to travel by rail for miles before we get out of the labyrinth of buildings. When we see on all sides of us modern buildings where interesting old buildings once stood, we are apt to jump to the conclusion that all signs and relics of medieval London have passed away. But this is not so, for there is still much to see in out-of-the-way places if we go about the search with intelligence. From what we see, we may reconstruct much of the old topography in our mind's eye. The first thing to do is to follow the course of the wall, and mark out the position of the gates. This can easily be done by studying an old map. Some remains of the wall are still to be seen. 
Many most interesting remains of Roman London will be found in the Guildhall Museum. There are few remains left of the Saxon period, but some bits are to be seen at Westminster. Of Norman buildings we have portions of the Tower, of Great St. Bartholomew's Church, the Round of the Temple Church, and the Crypt of Bow Church, Cheapside. Of later ages there are a few relics of the religious houses which have already been referred to. All the churches which escaped the ravages of the Great Fire have their points of interest. Lambeth Palace, although much of it comparatively modern, has a most venerable appearance and is certainly one of the most important relics of past ages that the present London has to boast. Westminster Hall, Abbey, Church and School are of transcendent interest, and some relics of the old Abbey buildings still exist in connection with the school. Of secular buildings there are Crosby Hall, Middle Temple, Gray's Inn Hall, and some others. It is impossible to print a detailed list of all the places that should be visited, but these few notes will give some slight indication of what little is left of medieval London. End of chapter 12. End of section 24. End of the Story of London by Henry B. Wheatley.